The Wattle Blossom Bride by Steel Rudd. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Son of the Exiles. The Wattle Blossom Bride. There was to be a wedding at Sandy's place at Sleepy Creek, and the neighbours got excited over it. Wild Dick Saunders from Saddletop, who had selected on Sleepy and lived by himself in a disorderly humpy, nearly large enough to hold several dray loads of corn, and did his own cooking and washing, decided to get married. Dick would have got married two or three times when he was at Saddletop, but for the girls that were there. Not that they wouldn't have him, but they were all sentiment and formality. There was no business about any of them. Their idea of matrimony was seven or eight years hugging and mugging and riding about on Sunday, then a ring and a ceremony and a big dance, and off up the country. Dick wasn't a cove to shilly-shally about things and waste time. He was imperative and impatient, and couldn't fool and poke around anyone's place to find out if he was liked by the old man, and the brothers, and the little sister, and the dog, and the pet kangaroo, and approved by the old woman, before telling the girl what he was after. On two or three occasions, Dick got disgusted with himself and single life, and knocked off work in the middle of the day, and rode straight to a place where there was a marriageable daughter, and hung his horse to the fence and walked right in, and regardless of the presence of the parents and two strangers, asked the girl in a loud voice if she would have him, and, with an ugly frown on his face, stood waiting her answer. And when the girl opened her eyes and stared and blushed and giggled and shook her head, and referred him to Mary Malloy or someone of the Gap, he drew nasty comparisons between himself and other young chaps in the district, and warned her that she might do a damn sight worse, and went home and remained single. But Minnie Simpson, a one-eyed girl with two front teeth missing, and a large head of faded straggled hair and a round fat face, employed in the hotel at Sleepy Creek Township, saw something in Dick one day and risked him. Dick risked her too. Kate took great interest in Dick's wedding. Mad on weddings, Kate was. Most women are. That's why so many of them get married. Kate placed all her house at Dick's disposal and spent days cleaning and cooking, making sandwiches and pumpkin pies and prickly pear tarts, and, because there was no wood chopped, grumbled and growled all the time at Sandy and Uncle. Sandy got tired of Kate's nagging at last, and the day before the wedding he chopped a whole dray load of wood, and everything Kate cooked that day got burnt and was no good. She perspired too, every time she took a batch of stuff from the oven, and walked in and out slashing her apron about, and whined and asked Sandy if he'd tried to bring the very worst wood there was in the paddock. It's always the way with a woman. Leave her no wood, and she'll cook anything. Give her plenty of it, and she'll burn the inside out of the oven. Kate papered the walls of the house, too, and put a new cover on the sofa. In fact, made the place look new. You'd think Kate was to be the bride herself. Everyone on Sleepy Creek was invited to Dick Saunders' wedding, and all of them turned up and brought their families and their dogs. They came early, too, and hung round looking at things, at intervals engaging Sandy in fragments of conversation, and wondering how much longer the old clergyman would be turning up. Dick himself was the only person who seemed unconcerned about the clergyman or about the arrangements, or the wedding itself for that matter. He remained on the sofa all the while with Minnie sitting on his knee, mauling her neck with his big hands and listening to her tearing the inside out of a concertina that he was getting along with her. They promised to be a devoted couple, did Dick and Minnie. About noon the clergyman showed in sight, crawling along on a poor downhearted-looking animal that might once have been a horse. Sandy, in a clean shirt and a tweed coat, stepped forward and welcomed him and introduced him to his friends. The friends seemed more taken up with the steed and stared it all over. But it didn't seem to mind. It wasn't a sensitive animal. It seemed glad it had arrived, though. It was a rare piece of horse flesh. It looked like the last of its tribe. There it stood, without leaning against anything, its head down and its eyes closed, until you felt solemn and reverent and inclined to take your hat off. 
Uncle, who had not had time to clean himself, hobbled up like a disreputable hotel groom, saluted the clergyman, and taking hold of the bridle reins with both hands, pulled the animal across to the shed, and quarrelled with it because it showed signs of life when it saw hay there, and shoved him about with its shapeless head when he started to take the bridle off. But when one of Sandy's old mares approached to see what it was, and the skeleton put its ears back skittishly and assumed a rakish attitude, Uncle took kindly to it. He chuckled and threw it a bundle of hay. It did eat, too. Looked as if it would have tackled a feed of bark or bottles with gratitude. When Uncle saw the appetite it had, he gathered up the cart saddle and winkers and some bags that were lying about and put them in the shed. Then, with an old rag of a coat of his own hanging on his arm, he returned to the company. Dick Saunders, with his long hair and whiskers combed, came out. This is the chap, Sandy said, and the clergyman smiled and extended his soft white hand to Dick and asked how he was. Dick claimed to be tip-top, but didn't know how he would feel directly. Uncle guffawed and made several suggestive remarks about weddings. Dick frowned on Uncle and called him a turnip. Fire and water came into Uncle's little red eyes, and if Dick had been a small man, and less like a bush ranger, there might easily have been an inquest in place of a wedding. The clergyman spoke to Sandy, and they both went inside. Dick and the others strolled over to the shed, smoking. When Dick set eyes on the clergyman's horse, he stood spellbound. Holy, he said. Then he walked up to it and said, Show, and threw up his arms. But it wasn't a nervous beast. It didn't lift its head from the hay. Should have been kept for a sire, Dick remarked. The others laughed. Then Dick stole the hay and ran round the yard with it. The brute wearily pursued him, whinnying imploringly for the fodder. It was a grand entertainment. Dick kept it going until Sandy called out from the back door that they were waiting. Then he threw the hay to the brute and walked off, hitching his trousers and girthing himself up as he approached the door. Inside was a great crowd. Dick could scarcely get in. At the table sat the clergyman, calm, composed. A leather bag, some papers, and a bottle of ink rested innocently before him. The guests, expectant and reverent looking, stared at him nervously. Only their breathing was audible. Where's she? Dick said, glaring all round the room. Raleigh, who could never keep his tongue quiet, ejaculated, Eloped! and made Mrs. Riley and Daly's wife shriek, and destroyed the solemnity. The clergyman motioned Dick into position. Dick, who had been coached for several weeks in the ceremony by Sandy, dropped on his knees. But Daly, who had been married three times, and knew more of the business than Sandy did, poked him up again. Dick stared and looked awkward, and stumbled about like a horse being shunted into a truck. At last, Mrs. Harris and Kate, in charge of the bride, processioned from the bedroom. Everyone got a surprise, even Dick. You wouldn't have known Minnie in the rig out she had accumulated round herself. Her hair was curled, and she wore a white dress, all tucks, and bespattered with ribbon and bows of different colours. Her head was a mass of wattle blossom, and she carried a huge bunch of it in her hand. She smelt of wattle blossom. You could scarcely see her dress for it. She was all wattle blossom, in fact. It was a distinct triumph of nature over art. A more interesting bride couldn't be presented to anyone's imagination. She would have looked well in a garden. The bride took her place beside her dick and dropped her head modestly and giggled. Dick fumbled about with his big hairy paw till he found her hand and clung to it. And there they stood, the embodiment of love and courage. Our opinions differed as to which of the two was the more courageous. Riley, in a loud whisper, reminded the guests of the first kiss, but none shifted or made any preparations to rob Dick of his rights. Perhaps it was because they knew Dick. Perhaps because they knew Minnie. The clergyman took the floor and the marriage proceeded. Save the cleric's resonant voice, not a sound was heard inside. But outside beneath the window and under the veranda roof there were no floorboards connected with sandy's veranda uncle commenced rattling a tin dish about a short prayer was concluded while uncle splashed and bubbled in a dish of water 
you take this woman to uncle stripped to the waist and holding his hands wide and his head low to the ground while water ran off him appeared at the front door and made efforts to catch kate's eye to be your wedded wife the old bloke wants a towel dick jerked out across his shoulder to kate who was behind him the guests grinned and strained their necks to see where uncle was but kate paid no attention she had eyes only for the bride uncle withdrew growling and splashed more water over himself the clergyman repeated his question i do dick responded with decision then said things after the cleric uncle showed himself at the door again with soap in his eyes and on his whiskers and more water dripping off him for better for worse uncle beckoned kate with his wet finger kate had no respect for uncle richer for poorer just as she stands dick said uncle broke into a loud interested chuckle just as she stands he echoed noisily then turned away and laughed with himself under the window the clergyman's horse sauntered round to see what was going on it stood with its head under the veranda looking in casually the clergyman asked for the ring dick stared about him then released the bride's hand and felt himself all over finally he said he hadn't one it looked as if something would go wrong but kate always good in emergency slipped her wedding ring off and handed it to dick where'll i put it dick asked on her thumb the guests laughed the bride tittered and held out the proper finger to receive the ring uncle with a glow on his face like fresh meat came to the door again smiling and wiping himself on a bag the clergyman began to bless the alliance uncle lowered his head devotionally the horse reached out behind uncle dipped its nose into the dish of water and made a noise like a pump uncle turned round and kicked it in the ribs the brute backed and threw up its head and struck it hard against the veranda roof and the whole structure fell down on top of uncle and the dogs there was great excitement then some of the guests rushed to congratulate the happy couple and some of them ran out to extricate uncle uncle was unconscious for a few minutes and when he came to he coughed violently he coughed up cobwebs and dust and scraps of bark the horse walked a few yards away and took a fit of coughing too it coughed up the soap when the breakfast was over dick and his bride left the guests chased them out the slip rails with old boots and bags and things after that i don't know how they got on we left too End of the Wattle Blossom Bride by Steel Rudd The Smudge by Fanny Hurst This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Smudge by Fanny Hurst From the Vertical City in the bleak little graveyard of Hattie Birch's dead hopes, dead loves, and dead ecstasies, more than one headstone had long since begun to sag, and the rays of bleeding heart to shrivel. That was good, because the grave that is kept bubbly with tears is a tender, quivering thing, almost like an amputated bit of self that still aches with threads of life even over the mound of her dead ambitions which grave she had dug with the fingers of her heart hattie could walk now with unsensitive feet it had become dry clay with cracks in it like sardonic smiles smiles that was the dreadful part because the laugh where there have been tears is not a nice laugh and hattie could sit among the headstones of her dead dreams now and laugh but not horridly just drearily there was one grave, Heart's Desire, that was still a little moist, but it, too, of late years had begun to sink in, like an old mouth with receding gums, as if the very teeth of a smiling dream had rotted. They had. Hattie, whose Heart's Desire had once been to play Juliet, played maids now. 
buxom negro ones with pale palms white eyes and the beat of a kettle drum somewhere close to the cuticle of the balls of her feet she was irrevocably down on managers and agents lists as comedy black countless the premieres she had opened to the fleck of a duster hattie came high as maids go one hundred and fifty dollars a week and no road engagements she dressed alone her part in love me long had been especially written in for the sake of the peculiar kind of comedy relief she could bring to it a light roar of recognition swept the audience at her entrance once in a while a hand clap so hattie whose heart's desire had once been to play juliet played maids now buxomly and this same hattie whose heart's desire had once been to kiss love but whose lips were still a little twisted with the taste of clay could kiss only love's offspring now but not bitterly thanksgivingly love's offspring was marcia sixteen and the color and odor of an ivory fan that has lain in friend Japani. and hattie could sometimes poke her tongue into her cheek over this bit of whimsy it was her well-paid effort in the burnt cork that made possible for instance the frill of real lace that lay to the low little neck of marcia's first party dress as if blown there in sea spume out of the profits of hattie's justly famous brown cold cream guaranteed color fast mulatto medium chocolate had come marcia's ermine muff and tippet the enamel toilet set the steinway grand piano the yearly and by no means light tuition toll at miss harperley's select day school for girls you get the whimsy of it for everything fair that was marcia hattie had brownly paid for liltingly and with the rill of the song of thanksgiving in her heart that was how hattie moved through her time hugging this melody of marcia through the knife-edged nervous evenings in the theatre bawlings purple lips with loose muscles crawling under the rouge fetidness of scent on stale bodies brown faces that could hook into the look of vultures when the smell of success became the, as the smell of red meat all the petty soiled vanities like the disordered boudoir of a cocotte the perpetual stink of perfume powder on the air and caking the breathing open dressing-room doors that should have been closed the smelling geometry of the makeup box curls corsets cosmetics men in undershirts grease painting god almighty toddy them's my teddy bears you're putting on raw nerves raw emotions ego the actor's overtone abroad everywhere and full of strut overture the weight in the wings dizziness at the pit of the stomach audiences with lean jaws etched into darkness jaws that can smile or crack your bones and eat you faces swimming in the stage ozone and wolfish for cue the purple lips almost like a frieze stuck on to the border of each day was hattie's life in the theatre passementerie that was how hattie treated it especially during those placid years of the phenomenal new york run of love me long the outer edge of her reality the heart of her reality why the heart of it was the long morning hours in her own fragrant kitchen over doughnuts boiled in oil and snowed under in powdered sugar cookies that bit with a snap filet of sole boned with fingers deft at it and served with a merest fluff of tartar sauce marcia ate like that preciously pecksniffily an egg at breakfast a gag to the sensibilities so hattie ate hers in the kitchen standing tucked the shell out of sight wrapped in a lettuce leaf beefsteak for instance sickened marcia because there was blood in the ooze of its juices but hattie had a sly way of camouflage filet mignon so strengthening you see 
crushed under a little millinery of mushrooms and served under glass then when marcia's neat little row of neat little teeth bit in and the munch began behind clean and careful lips hattie's heart a regular old bandit for cunning beat hoppity skippity jump those were her realities home the new sandwich cutters heart shape diamond shape spade the strip of hall carpet newly discovered to scour like new with brush and soap and warm water epstein's meat market throws in free suet the lamp with the opal silk shade for marcia's piano white oilcloth is cleaner than shelf paper dotted swiss curtains the ones in marcia's room looped back with pink bows old sashes pressed out and fringed at the edges and if you think that hattie's six rooms and bath and sunny full-size kitchen on morningside heights were trumped-up ones of the press agent for the sunday supplement look in any afternoon tuesday say and marcia just home from school on tuesday afternoon of every other week hattie made her cream in a large copper pot that hung under the sink six dozen half-pint jars waiting to be filled with brown cold cream one hundred and forty-four jars a month guaranteed color fast mulatto medium chocolate labeled sealed sold and demand exceeding the supply an ingratiating expert cream known the black face world over it slid into the skin not suitably but illuminating it to winking african copper for instance hattie's makeup cream for linda in love me long was labeled chocolate but it worked in even a truer brown as it had come out of the pigment instead of gone into the pores four hours of stirring it took adding with exact minutiae the mysteriously proper proportions of spermaceti oil of sweet almonds white wax but never mind hattie's dark secret was her own fourteen years of her black art as broadway's maid deluxe had been her laboratory it was almost her boast now remember the sunken headstones that she had handled spotlessly every fair young star of the theatre's last ten years it was as mysterious as pigment her cream and as true and netted her with occasional extra batches an average of two hundred dollars a month she enjoyed making it singing as she stirred or rather stirring as she sang the plentitude of her figure enveloped in a blue and white bungalow apron with rick-rack trimming often marcia home from day school watched propped up in the window frame with her pet cat a persian with eyes like swimming pools with painted green bottoms seated in a perfect circle in her quiet lap for all the world in the attitude of a sardelle except for the toothpick through sometimes it almost seemed as if marcia did the purring she could sit like that motionless her very stare seeming to sleep to hattie that stare was beautiful and in a way it was as if two blue little suns were having their high noon sometimes marcia offered to help because toward the end hattie's back could ache at this process terribly the pain knotting itself into her face when the rotary movement of her stirring arm began to yank at her nerves mommy i'll stir for a while marcia's voice was day-schooled as clipped as boxed and as precise as a hedge neat too as neat as the way her clear lips met and her teeth which had a little mannerism of coming down after each word biting them off like threads they were appealing teeth that had never grown big or square very young corn to hattie there was something about them that reminded her of a tiny set of marcia's doll dishes that she had saved little innocences i don't mind stirring dear i'm not tired 
but your face is all twisted hattie's twisted face could induce in marcia the same gagged pallor that the egg in the morning or the red in the beefsteak juices brought there go in and play the piano a while marcy i'll be finished soon Shh, no pussy kitty is asleep as the cream grew heavier and its swirl in the pot slower hattie could keep the twist out of her face only by biting her tongue she did and a little arch of sweat came out in a mustache the brown mud of the cream began to fluff hattie rubbed a fluck of it into her freckled forearm yes hattie's arm was freckled and so was the bridge of her nose in a little saddle once there had been a prettiness to the freckles because they whitened the skin that they sprinkled and were little stars to the moon readiness of hattie's hair but the red of the moon had set coldly in hattie's hair now and the stars were just freckles and there was the dreaded ridge of flesh showing above the ridge of her corsets and when she leaned forward to stir her cheeks hung forward like a spaniel's not of fat but heaviness hattie's arms and thighs were granite to the touch and to the scales kindly freckled granite she weighed almost twice what she looked marcia whose hips were like lyres hated the ridge above the corset line and massaged it mab smacking the himalayas after a while there in the window frame marcia closed her eyes there was still the illusion of a purr about her probably because as her kitten warmed in its circle its coziness began to whir mountingly the september afternoon was full of drone the roofs of the city from hattie's kitchen window which overlooked morningside heights lay flat as slaps tranced indoor quiet presently hattie began to tiptoe the seventy-two jars were untopped now in a row on a board over the built-in wash tub seventy-two yawning for content squinch her enormous spoon into the copper kettle and flop gurgle goose softly into the jars one two three at the sixty-eighth marcia without stirring or lifting her lids spoke into the sucky silence mommy yes marcy you'll be glad hattie pausing at the sixty-eighth why dear i came home in nonnie grosbeck's automobile i'm invited to a dinner dance october the seventeenth at their house in gramercy park the words must have gone to hattie's knees because dropping a spat of mulatto cold cream on the linoleum she sat down weakly on the kitchen chair that she had painted blue and white to match the china cereal set on the shelf above it marcy and she likes me better than any girl in school mommy and i'm going to be her chum from day on and not another girl in school is invited except edwina nelson because her father's on nearly all the same boards of directors with mr grosbeck and marcia marcia and you came home from school just as if nothing had happened child sometimes i think you're made of ice why i'm glad mommy but that's what there were little ice glints of congealed satisfaction in marcia's eyes glad said hattie the word full of tears why honey you don't realize it but this is the beginning this is the meaning of my struggle to get you into miss harperley's school it wasn't easy i've never told you the strings i had to pull conservative people you see that's what the grosbecks are too home people the kind who can afford to wear dowdy hats and who have lived in the same house for thirty years nome's mother was born in the house they live in substantial people who half sold their shoes and endow colleges taxpayers policyholders church members oh marcia those are the safe people 
There's a Grosbeck memorial window in the rock church. I used to be so afraid for you, Marcy, afraid you would take to the make-believe folks, the play people, the theater. I used to fear for you, the Pullman car, the furnished room, that going to the hotel room, alone, nights after the show. You laugh at me sometimes for just throwing a veil over my face and coming home blackface. It's because I'm too tired, Marcy, too lonesome for home. On the road, I always used to think of all the families in the audience, the husbands and wives, brides and grooms, sweethearts. After the performance, they all went to homes, to brownstone fronts like the Grosbecks, to cottages, to flats, with a snack to eat in the refrigerator or laid out on the dining room table lamps burning and waiting nighties laid out and bed covers turned back and then me second-rate hotels that walk through the dark downtown streets passing men who address you through closed lips the dingy lobby there's no applause lasts long enough marcia to reach over that moment when you unlock your hotel room and the smell of disinfectant and unturned mattress comes out to you Ugh! Oh, keep to the safe people, Marcia, the unexciting people, maybe, but the safe home-building ones with old ideals and old hearthstones. Noni says they have one in their library that comes from Italy. Hitch your ideal to a hearthstone like that, Marcia. Noni goes to writing academy. So shall you. It's six dollars an hour. I don't care. Her father's retired except for being director in banks. And, Mommy, they don't mind, dear, about us. Noni knows that my father is, is separated and never lived at home with us. She's broad-minded. She says, just so there's no scandal, a divorce, or anything like that, she said it's vulgar to cultivate only rich friends. She says she'd go with me even if she's forbidden to. Why, Marcy, darling, why should she be forbidden? Oh, Nanny's broad-minded. She says if two people are unsuited, they should separate, quietly, like you and my father. She knows we're one of the first old southern families on my father's side. I, I'm not trying to make you talk about it, dear, but, but we are, aren't we? Yes, Marcy. He, he was just irresponsible that's not being not nice people is it no marcy nonny's not forbidden she just meant in case mommy you see with some old families like hers the stage but nonny says her father couldn't even say anything to that if he wanted to his own sister went on the stage once and they had to hush it up in the papers did you explain to her, Marcy, that stage life at its best can be full of fine ideals and truth? Did you make her see how regular your own little life has been? How little you know about my work? How away I've kept you? How I won't even play out of town engagements so we can always be together in our little home? You must explain all those things to your friends at Miss Harperley's. It helps with steady people i have mommy and she's going to bring me home every afternoon in their automobile after we've called for her brother archie at columbia law school marcy the grosbeck automobile bringing you home every day and it's going to call for me the night of the party noni's getting a lemon taffeta i'll get you ivory with a bit of real lace oh mommy Mommy, I can scarcely wait. What did she say, Marcy, when she asked, invited you? She? Noni. Why, she didn't invite me, Mommy. But you just said. It was her brother Archie invited me. We called for him at Columbia Law School, you see. It was he invited me. Of course, Noni wants me and said yes right after him. But it's he who wants Noni and me to be chums. 
I, he, I thought, I told you, Mommy. Suddenly, Marcia's eyes, almost with the perpendicular slits of her kittens in them, seemed to swish together like portieres, shutting Hattie behind them with her. Oh, my, Marcy, said Hattie, dimly, after a while, as if from their depths. Marcy, dearest. At, at Harperley's, Mommy, almost all the popular upper-class girls wear a, a boy's fraternity pin fraternity pin it's the the beginning of being engaged but marcy archie's a pie phi uh what a pie phi phi pie marcy dear on october seventeenth love me long celebrated its two hundredth performance souvenir programs a few appropriate words by the management, a flashlight of the cast, a round of wine passed in the after-the-performance gloom of the wings, aqueous figures fading off in their orderly backstage fashion of a well-established success. Hattie kissed the star. They liked each other with the unenvy of their divergent roles. Miss Robinson even humored some of Hattie's laughs. She liked to feel the flame of her own fairness as she stood there waiting for the audience to guffaw its fill of Hattie's drolleries, a narcissus swaying readily beside a black crocodile. She was a new star, and her beauty the color of gold, and Hattie, in her lowly comedian way, not an undistinguished veteran, so they could kiss in the key of a cat cannot unseat a king. But just the same, Miss Robinson's hand flew up automatically against the dark of Hattie's lips. I don't fade off, dearie. Your own natural skin is no more color fast. I handled Elaine Doremus in the snowdrop for three seasons, never so much as a speck or a spot on her. My cream don't fade. Of course not, dear. How silly of me. Kiss me again. That was kind enough of her. Oh, yes, they got on. But sometimes Hattie, seated among her sagging headstones, would ache with the dry sob of the black crocodile who yearned toward the Narcissus. Quite without precedent, there was a man waiting for her in the wings. The gloom of backstage was as high as trees, and Hattie had not seen him in sixteen years. But she knew, with the stunned consciousness of a stab person that glinting instant before the blood begins to flow. It was Morton Seabury, Marsh's father. Morton! Hattie! Come up to my dressing room, she said, as matter-of-factly as if her brain were a clock ticking off the words. They walked up an iron staircase of unreality. Fantastic stairs! wisps of gloom, singing pains in her climbing legs like a piano key hit very hard, and held down with a pressing forefinger. She could listen to her pain. That was her thought as she climbed, how the irrelevant little ideas would slide about in her sudden chaos. She must concentrate now. Terribly, Morton was back. His hand, a smooth, glabrous one, full of clutch, riding up the banister, it could have been picked off, finger by finger. It was that kind of a hand. But after each lift, another finger would have curled back again. Morton's hand, ascending the dark like a soul on a string in a burlesque show. Face to face, the electric bulb in her dressing room was encased in a wire like a baseball mask. A burning prison of light, fat sticks of grease paint with the grain of Hattie's flesh, printed on the daub end, furiously brown cheesecloth, an open jar of cream, chocolate, with the gesture of the gouge in it, a woolly black wig on a shelf, its kinks seeming to crawl. There was a rim of Hattie, au naturel, left around her lips. It made of her mouth a comedy blubber, her own rather firm lips sliding about somewhere in the lightish swamp. This was all of Hattie that looked out. 
except her eyes. They were good gray eyes with popping whites now, because of a trick of blackening the lids. But the irises were in their pools, in violet. Well, Hattie, I reckon I'd have known you even under black. I thought you were in Rio. Got the hankering after the States, Hattie. I read of a more Seabree dive in Brazil. Sometimes I used to think maybe it might have been a misprint, and that you were the one. No, no, live and kicking. Been up around here a good while. Where? Home, New Orleans. My mother died, Hattie. God rest her bones. Know it? No. Cancer. It was a peculiar silence. A terrible word like that was almost slowly soluble in it, gurgling down. Oh, sort of gives a fellow the chivers, Hattie, seeing you kind of hiding behind yourself like this. But I saw you come in the theater tonight. You looked right natural, a little heavier. What do you want? Why, I guess a good many things in general, and nothing in particular, as the saying goes. You don't seem right glad to see me, honey. Glad, said Hattie and laughed as if her mirth were a dice shaking in a box of echoes. Your hair's right red yet. Look mighty natural walking into the theater tonight. Take off those kinks, honey. She reached for her cleansing cream, then stopped, her eyes full of the foment of torture. What's my looks to you? You filled out? You haven't, she said, putting down the cold cream jar. You haven't aged an hour. Your kind lies on life like it was a wall in the sun, a wall that somebody else has built for you stone by stone. I reckon you're right in some ways, Hattie. There's been a meandering streak in me somewheres. You and my mother, God rest her bones, had a different way of scolding me for the same thing. Lot of Huck Finn and me. Don't use bad boy words for vicious bad man deeds. But you like me. Both of you like me, honey. Only two women I ever really cared for, too. You and my mother. Her face might have been burning paper, curling her scorn for him. Don't try that, Morton. It won't work any more. What used to infatuate me only disgusts me now. The things I thought I loved in you, I loathe now. The kind of cancer that killed your mother is the kind that eats out the heart. I never knew her, never even saw her, except from a distance. But I know, just as well as if I'd lived in that fine big house with her all those years in New Orleans, that you were the sickness that ailed her. Lying, squandering, gambling, no count son. If she and I are the only women you ever cared for, Thank God that there aren't any more of us to suffer from you. Martin, when I read that a Morris Seabury had died in Brazil, I hoped it was you. You're no good. You're no good. She was thumping now with the sob she kept under her voice. Why, Hattie, he said, his drawl not quickened. You don't mean that. I do. You're a ruiner of lives. Her life. Mine, you're a rotten apple that can speck every one it touches. That's hard, Hetty, but I reckon you're not all wrong. Oh, that softy southern talk won't get us anywhere, Morton. The very sound of it sickens me now. You're like a terrible sickness I once had. I'm cured now. I don't know what you want here, but whatever it is, you might as well go. I'm cured. He sat forward in his chair still twirling the soft brown hat. He was dressed like that, softly. Good quality, loosely woven stuffs. There was still a tan down of persistent youth on the back of his neck. But his hands were old, the veins twisted wiring, and his third finger yellowly stained like meerschaum darkening. Grantin' everything you say, Hattie, and I'm holding no brief for myself. I've been the sick one not you twenty years i've been down sick with hookworm with devilishness 
No, Hattie. It's the government's diagnosis. Hookworm. Been a sick man all my life with it. Funny thing, though, all those years in Rio knocked it out of me. Fuck! I'm a new man since I'm well of it. Hookworm! That's an easy word for ingrained no countenance deviltry and deceit. It wasn't hookworm came into the New Orleans Stock Company where I was understudying leads and getting my chance to play big things. It wasn't hookworm put me in a position where I had to take anything I could get. So that instead of finding me playing leads, you find me here, blackface. It was a devil a liar a spendthrift no count son out of a family that deserved better i've cried more tears over you than i ever thought any woman ever had it in her to cry those months in that boarding-house in peach tree street down in new orleans peach tree street i remember how beautiful even the name of it was when you took me there lying and how horrible it became to me those months when i used to see your mother's carriage drive by the house twice a day and me crying my eyes out behind the curtains that's what i've never forgiven myself for she was a woman who stood for fine things in new orleans a good woman whom the whole town pitied a no-count son squandering her fortune and dragging down the family name if only i had known all that then she would have helped me if i had appealed to her she wouldn't have let things turn out so secretly the way they did she would have helped me i you why have you come here to jerk knives out of my heart after it's got heated with the points sticking in you're nothing to me you're skulking for a reason you've been hanging round getting pointers about me my life is my own you get out the girl she wail it was a quiet question, spoken in the key of being casual, and Hattie, whose heart skipped a beat, tried to corral the fear in her eyes to take it casually, except that her eyelids seemed to grow old even as they drooped, squeezed grape skins. "'You get out, Morton,' she said. "'You've got to get out.' He made a cigarette in an old, indolent way. He had a wetting it with his smile. He was handsome enough after his fashion, for those who liked the rather tropical combination of dark ivory skin, and a hair a lighter shade of tan. It did a curious thing to his eyes. Behind their allotment of tan lashes, they became neutralized, straw-colored. She's about sixteen now, little over, I reckon. What's that to you? Blood, Hattie, thick. What thickened it, Morton, after sixteen years? Used to be an artist chap down in Rio, on his uppers. One night, according to my description of what I imagined she looked like, he drew her. Yellow hair, I reckon, and sure enough. You're not worthy of the resemblance. It wouldn't be there if I had the same. You have it, he said suddenly, his teeth snapping together as if biting off a thread. Nor you, something that was the whiteness of fear lightening behind her mask. She rose then, lifting her chair out of the path toward the door and flinging her arm out toward it, very much after the manner of Miss Robinson in Act Two. You get out, Morton, she said, before I have you put out. They're closing the theater now. Get out. Hattie, his calm enormous. Don't be hasty. A man that has come to his senses has come back to you humble and sincere. A man that's been sick. Take me back, Hattie, and see if... Back, she said, lifting her lips scornfully away from touching the word. You remember that night in that little room on Peachtree Street when I prayed on my knees and kissed your shoes and crawled for your mercy to stay for Marcia to be born? well if you were to lie on this floor and kiss my shoes and crawl for my mercy i'd walk out on you the way you walked out on me if you don't go i'll call a stage hand and make you go there's one coming down the corridor now 
and locking the house. You go, or I'll call. His eyes, with their peculiar trick of solubility in his color scheme, seemed all tan. I'll go, he said, looking slim and southern, his imperturbability ever so slightly unfrocked. I'll go, but you're making a mistake, Hattie. Fear kept clanging in her, fire bells of it. Oh, but that's like you, Morton. Threats? But thank God, nothing you can do can harm me any more. I reckon she's considerable over sixteen now. Let's see. Fire bells, fire bells. Come out with what you want, Morton, like a man. You're feeling for something. Money. Now that your mother is dead and her fortune squandered, you come to harass me? That's it. I know you, like a person who has been disfigured for life by Burns knows fire. Well, I won't pay. Pay? Why, Hattie, I want you back. She could have cried because, as she sat there blackly, she was sick with his lie. I'd save a dog from you, then save her from me. The terrible had happened so quietly. Morton had not raised his voice, scarcely his lips. She closed the door then and sat down once more, but that which had crouched out of their talk was unleashed now. That's just exactly what I intend to do. How? By saving her sight or sound of you. You can't, Hattie. Why? I've come back. There was a curve to his words that hooked into her heart like forceps about a block of ice. But she outstared him, holding her lips in the center of the comedy rim, so that he could see how firm their bite. Not to me. To her, then. Even you wouldn't be low enough to let her know. Know what? Facts. You mean she doesn't know? No. Know you for what you are and for what you made of me? I've kept it something decent for her, just the separation of husband and wife, who couldn't agree. Incompatibility. I have not told her, and suddenly could have rammed her teeth into the tongue that had betrayed her. Simultaneously with the leap of light into his eyes came the leap of her error into her consciousness. Oh, he said, and smiled, a slow smile that widened as leisurely as sorghum in the pouring. You made me tell you that. You came here for that, to find out. Nothing the sort, Hattie. You only verified what I kind of suspected. Naturally, you've kept it from her. Admire you for it. But I lied. See, I know your tricks. She does know you for what you are and what you made of me. She knows everything. Now what are you going to do? She knows. I lied. I... Then stopped at the curve his lips were taking and at consciousness of the pitiableness of her device. Morton, she said, her hands opening into her lap, into pads of great pink helplessness. You wouldn't tell her. On me? You're not that low. Wouldn't tell what? He was rattling her, and so she fought him with her gaze, trying to fasten and fathom under the flicker of his lids. But there were no eyes there, only the neutral, tricky tan. You see, Morton, she's just sixteen, the age when it's more important than anything else in the world to a young girl that's been reared like her, to, to have her life, regular. Like all her other little school friends, she's like that, Morton, sensitive. Don't touch her, Morton. For God's sake, don't. Some day when she's past having to care so terribly, when she's older, you can break it up if you must torture. I'll tell her then, but for God's sake, Morton, let us live. Now. 
Hattie, you meet me tomorrow morning and take a little journey to one of those little towns around here in Jersey or Connecticut, and your lie to her won't be a lie any more. Morton, I, I don't understand. Why? I'll marry you. You fool, she said, almost meditatively. So you've heard we've gotten on a bit. You must even have heard of this, placing her hand over the jar of the brown cold cream. You want to be in at the feast. You're so easy to read that I can tell you what you're after before you can get the coward words out. Marry you, you fool! It was as if she could not flip the word off scornfully enough, sucking back her lower lip, then hurling. Well, Hattie, he said, unbunching his soft hat, I reckon that's pretty plain. I reckon it is, Morton. All right, everybody to his own notion of carrying a grudge to the grave. But it's all right, honey. No hard feelings. It's something to know I was willing to do the right thing. There's a fruit steamer out of here for New Orleans in the morning. Reckon I'll catch it. I'd advise you to. No objection to me dropping around to see the girl first? Entitled to a little natural curiosity. Come, I'll take you up home this evening. The girl, no harm. You're not serious, Morton. You wouldn't upset things. You wouldn't tell that child. Why, not in a thousand years, honey, unless you forced me to it. Well, you forced me. Come, Hattie, I'm seeing you home this evening. You can't put your foot. Come now, you're too clever a woman to try to prevent me. Of course, there's a way to keep me from going up home with you this evening. I wouldn't use it if I were you. You know I'll get to see her. I even know where she goes to school. Mighty nice selection you made, Hattie, Miss Harperley's. You can't frighten me, she said, trying to moisten her lips with her tongue but it was as dry as a parrot's. It was hard to close her lips. They were oval and suddenly immobile as a picture frame. What if she could not swallow? There was nothing to swallow. Dry tongue. Oh, God, Marcia! That was the fleeting form her panic took, but almost immediately she could manage her lips again. Her lips, you see, they counted so. She must keep them firm in the slippery shine of the comedy black. Come, he said, get your makeup off. I'll take you up in a cab. How do you know it's up? Why, I don't know as I do know exactly. Just came kind of natural to put it that way. Morningside Heights is about right, I calculate. So you have been watching well i don't know as i put it that away naturally when i got to town first thing i did most natural thing in the world that's a mighty fine car with a mighty fine boy and girl brings your our girl home every afternoon about four we used to have a family of gross beats down home another branch i reckon oh god a malaprop of a tear, too heavy to wink in, came rolling suddenly down Hattie's cheek. Morton, let us live, for God's sake, please. He regarded the clean descent of the tear down Hattie's colorfast cheek, and its clear drop into the bosom of her black taffeta housemaid's dress. By Jove, the stuff is colorfast. You've a fortune in that cream, if you handle it right, honey. My way is the right way for me. But it's a woman's way. Incorporate. Manufacture it. Get a man on the job. Promote it. Ah, that sounds familiar. The way you promoted away every cent of your mother's fortune until the bed she died in was mortgaged. One of your wildcat schemes, again. 
Oh, I watched you before I lost track of you in South America, just the way you're watching us now. I know the way you squandered your mother's fortune, the rice plantation in Georgia, the alfalfa ranch, the solid rubber tire venture in Atlanta. You don't get your hands on my affairs. My way suits me. The tumult in her was so high, and her panic so like a squirrel in the circular frenzy of its cage, that she scarcely noted the bang on the door and the hairy voice that came through. All out. Yes, she said, without knowing it. You're losing a fortune, Hattie. Shame on a fine, strapping woman like you, black-facing herself up like this, when you've hit on something with a fortune in it, if you work it properly. You ought to have more regard for the girl, black-face. What has her father's regard done for her? It's my black face has kept her like a lily. Admitting all that you say about me is right. Well, I'm here, eating humble pie now. If that little girl doesn't know, bless my heart, I'm willing she shouldn't ever know. I'll take you out to Greenwich tomorrow and marry you. Then what you told her all these years is the truth. I've just come back, that's all. We've patched up. It's done every day, right promoting, and a few hundred dollars in that there cream well she laughed, November rain running off a broken spot, yellow leaves scuttling ahead of wind. The picture puzzle is now complete, Morton, your whole scheme, piece by piece. You're about as subtle as cornbread. Well, my answer to you again is get out. All right, all right, but we'll both get out, Hattie. Come, I'm a-going to call on you all up home a little while this evening. No, it's late. She's... Come, Hattie, you know I'm a-going to see that girl one way or another. If you want me to catch that fruit steamer tomorrow, if I were you, I'd let me see her my way. You know I'm not much on raising my voice, but if I were you, Hattie, I wouldn't fight me. Morton, Morton, listen. If you'll take that fruit steamer without trying to see her, would you? You're on your uppers, I understand. Would a hundred? Two hundred? I used to light my cigarette with that much down on my rice swamps. You see, Morton, She's such a little thing, a little thing with big eyes. All her life those eyes have looked right down into me, believing everything I ever told her. About you too, Morton. Good things. Not that I'm ashamed of anything I ever told her. My only wrong was ignorance and innocence. Innocence of the kind of lesson I was to learn from you. Nothing was ever righted by harping on it, Hattie. But I want you to understand. Oh, God, make him understand. She's such a sensitive little thing. And as things stand now, glad I'm her mother. Yes, glad, black face and all. Why, many's the time I've gone home from the theater, too tired to take off my makeup until I got into my own rocker with my ankles soaking in warm water. They swell so terribly sometimes. Rheumatism, I guess. Well, many a time, when I kissed her in her sleep, she's opened her eyes on me, black face and all, her arms up and around me. I was there underneath the black. She knows that. And that's what she'll always know about me, no matter what you tell her. I'm there. Her mother, underneath the black. You hear, Morton? That's why you must let us live. My proposition is the mighty decent one of a gentleman. She's only a little baby, Morton, and just at that age where being like all the other boys and girls is the whole of her little life. It's killing all her airiness and fads and fancies. Such a proper little young lady 
You know, the way they clip and trim them at finishing school? Sweet sixteen nonsense that she'll outgrow. Tonight, Morton, she's at a party. A boy's. Her first. That fine-looking yellow-haired young fellow. And his sister that bring her home every afternoon. At their house. Gramercy Park. A fine young fellow. Five. Pie. Looky here, Hattie, are you talking against time? She's home asleep by now. I told her she had to be in bed by eleven. She reminds me, Morton, I wouldn't, couldn't, mm, wake her. Morton, Morton, she's yours as much as mine. That's God's law, no matter how much man's law may have let you shirk your responsibility. Don't hurt your own flesh and blood by coming back to us now i remember once when you cut your hand it made you ill blood blood is warm red sacred stuff she's your blood morton you let us alone when we needed you leave us alone now that we don't but you do hattie girl that's just it you're running things a woman's way why a man with the right promoting ideas there was a fusillade of bangs on the door now and a shout as if the hair on the voice were rising in anger. All out, or the doors'll be locked on ya. Fine doings. She grasped her light wrap from its hook, and her hat with its whirl of dark veil, fitting it down with difficulty over the fizz of wig. Come, Mort, she said suddenly. I'm ready. You're right, now or never. I'm ready. You're right, now or never. Your face! No time now. Later, at home. She'll know that I'm there, under the black. So do I, Hattie. That's why I... I'm not one of the ready-made heroines you read about. That's not my idea of sacrifice. I'd let my child hang her head of my shame sooner than stand up and marry you to save her from it. Marcia wouldn't want me to. She's got your face, but my character. She'll fight. She'll glory that I had the courage to let you tell her the truth. Yes, she will, she cried, her voice pleading for the truth of what her words exclaimed. She'll glory in having saved me from you. You can come. Now, too, while I have the strength that loathing you can give me. I don't want you skulking about. I don't want you hanging over my head or hers. You can tell her tonight, but in my presence. Come. Yes, sir, he repeated, doggedly, and still more doggedly. Yes, sir, following her, trying to be grim, but his lips too soft to click. Yes, sir. They drove up silently through a lusterless midnight, with a threat of rain in it, hitting loosely against each other in a shiver-my-timbers taxicab. Her pallor, showing through the brown of her face, did something horrid to her. It was as if the skull of her, set in torment, were looking back through a transparent black mask, but, because they were not lips, forced to grin, and yet, do you know that while she rode with him, Hattie's heart was high? So high that when she left him, finally, seated in her little lamplit living room, it was he whose unease began to develop. I, if she's asleep, Hattie. Her head looked so sure, thrust back and sunk a little between the shoulders. If she's asleep, I'll wake her. It's better this way. I'm glad now. I want her to see me safe myself. She wouldn't want me to. You banked on mock heroics for me, Morton. You lost. Marcia was asleep, in her narrow, pretty bed, with little bow knots painted on the pale wood. About the room, all the tired and happy muss of after the party. A white taffeta dress with a whisper of real lace at the neck almost stiffishly seated, as if with Marcia's trimness, on a chair. A steam of white tulle on the dressing table, 
a buttonhole gardenia, and a tumbler of water. One long white kid glove on the table beside the night light. A naked cherub in a high hat holding a pink umbrella for the lampshade. Dear me, dear me, screamed Hattie to herself, fighting to keep her mind on the plane of casual things. She's lost the club again. Dear me, dear me. I hope it's a left one to match up with the right one she saved from the last pair. Dear me. She picked up a white film of stocking, turning and exploring with spread fingers in the foot part for holes. There was one. Marcia's big toe had danced right through. Dear me! Marcia, sleeping, very quietly and very deeply, she slept like that, whitely and straightly, and with the covers scarcely raised for the ridge of her slim body. Sometimes Marcia asleep could frighten Hattie. There was something about her white stillness. Lilies are too fair, and so must live briefly. That thought could clutch so that she would kiss Marcia awake, kiss her soundly, because Marcia's sleep could be so terrifyingly deep. Marcia, said Hattie, and stood over her bed. Then again, Marcia, on more voice than she thought her dry throat could yield her. There was the merest flip of black on the lacy bosom of Marcia's nightgown, and Hattie leaned down to fleck it. No, it was a pin, a small black enameled pin, edged in pearls. Automatically, Hattie knew. Pie, fie! Marcia, cried Hattie, and shook her a little. She hated so to waken her. Always had, especially for school on rainy days. Sometimes didn't. Couldn't. Marcia came up out of sleep so reluctantly. A little dazed, a little secretive, as if a white bull in a dream had galloped off with her like Persephone's. Only Hattie did not know of Persephone. She only knew that Marcia slept beautifully and almost breathlessly, sweet and low. It seemed silly, sleeping beautifully, but just the same, Marcia did. Then Hattie, not faltering, mind you, waited. It was better that Marcia should know. Now, too, while her heart was so high. Sometimes it took as many as three kisses to awaken Marcia. Hattie bent for the first one, a sound one on the tip of her lip. Marcia, she cried, Marcy, wake up, and drew back. Something had happened, darkly, a smudge the size of a quarter and the color of Hattie's guaranteed not to fade cheek, lay incredibly on Marcia's whiteness. Hattie had smudged Marcia. Hattie had smudged Marcia. There it lay on her beautiful, helpless whiteness, Hattie's smudge. It is doubtful, from the way he waited, with his soft hat dangling from soft fingers, if Morton had ever really expected anything else. Momentary unease gone, he was quiet, and southern, and even indolent, about it. We'll go to Greenwich first thing in the morning, and be married, he said. Shh, she whispered to his quietness. Don't wake Marcia. Hattie, he said, and started to touch her. Don't, she sort of cried under her whisper, but not without noting that his hand was ready enough to withdraw. Please, go now. Tomorrow at the station, then. Eleven. There's a train every hour for Greenwich. He was all tanned to her now, standing there like a blur. Yes, Morton, I'll be there. If, please, you'll go now. Of course, he said. Late. Only I, well, pay in the taxi. Strap me. Temporarily. A ten spot. Old hat would help. She gave him her purse, a tiny leather one with a patent clasp. Somehow her fingers were not flexible enough to open it. His were. There were a few hours of darkness left, and she sat them out, exactly as he had left her, 
on the piano stool, looking at the silence. Toward morning, quite an equinoctial storm swept the city, banging shutters and signs, and a steeple on 122nd Street was struck by lightning. And so it was that Hattie's wedding day came up like thunder. End of The Smudge by Fanny Hurst Fate and the Apothecary by George Gissing This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Farmilo, Chemist by Examination So did the good man proclaim himself to a suburb of a city in the west of England. It was one of those pretty, clean, fresh-coloured suburbs only to be found in the west. A few dainty little shops, everything about them bright or glistening, scattered among pleasant little houses with gardens eternally green and all but perennially in bloom every vista ending in foliage and in one direction a far glimpse of the cathedral towers sending forth their music to fall dreamily upon these quiet roads the neighbourhood seemed to breathe a tranquil prosperity red-cheeked emissaries of butcher baker and grocer order book in hand knocked cheerily at kitchen doors and went smiling away the ponies they drove were well fed and frisky their carts spick and span the church of the parish an imposing edifice dated only from a few years ago and had cost its noble founder a sum of money which any church-going parishioner would have named to you with proper awe the population was largely female and every shopkeeper who knew his business had become proficient in bowing, smiling, and suave servility. Mr. Farmelow, it is to be feared, had no very profound acquaintance with his business from any point of view. True, he was chemist by examination, but it had cost him repeated efforts to reach this unassailable ground, and more than one pharmacist with whom he abode as assistant had felt it a measure of prudence to dispense with his services give him time and he was generally equal to the demands of suburban customers hurry or interrupt him and he showed himself anything but the man for a crisis face and demeanour were against him he had exceedingly plain features and a persistently sour expression even his smile suggested sarcasm. He could not tune his voice to the tradesman note, and on the slightest provocation he became, quite unintentionally, offensive. Such a man had no chance whatever in this flowery and bowery little suburb. Yet he came hither with hopes. One circumstance seemed to him especially favourable. The shop was also a post office, and no one could fail to see. It was put most impressively by the predecessor who sold him the business. How advantageous was this blending of public service with commercial interest, especially as there was no telegraphic work to make a skilled assistant necessary. As a matter of course, people using the post office would patronise the chemist, and the provincial chemist can add to his legitimate business sundry pleasant little tradings which benefit himself without provoking the jealousy of neighbour shopmen it will be your own fault my dear sir if you do not make a very good thing of it indeed the sole and sufficient explanation of of the decline during this last year or two is my shocking health i really have not been able to do justice to the business necessarily mr farmelow entered into negotiation with the postal authorities and it was with some little disappointment that he learnt how very modest could be his direct remuneration for the responsibilities and labours he undertook the post office is a very shrewdly managed department of the public service it has brought to perfection the art of obtaining maximum results with a minimum expenditure 
but mr farmerlow remembered the other aspect of the matter he would benefit so largely by this ill-paid undertaking that grumbling was foolish moreover the thing carried dignity with it he served his majesty he served the nation and ha ha how very odd it would be to post one's letters in one's own post office one might really get a good deal of amusement out of the thought after business hours his age was eight and thirty for some years he had pondered matrimony though without fixing his affections on any particular person it was plain indeed that he ought to marry every tradesman is made more respectable by wedlock and a chemist who in some degree resembles a medical man seems especially to stand in need of the matrimonial guarantee had it been feasible mr farmerlow would have brought a wife with him from the town where he had lived for the past few years but he was in the difficult position of knowing not a single marriageable female to whom he could address himself with hope or with self-respect natural shyness had always held him aloof from reputable women he felt that he could not recommend himself to them he who had such an unlucky aptitude for saying the wrong word or keeping silence when speech was demanded with the men of his acquaintance he could relieve his sense of awkwardness and deficiency by becoming aggressive in fact he had a reputation for cantankerousness for pugnacity which kept most of his equals in some awe of him and to perceive this was one solace amid many discontents nicely dressed and well spoken and good-looking women above the class of domestic servants he worshipped from afar and only in vivacious moments pictured himself as the wooer of such a superior being it seemed as though fate could do nothing with mr farmerlow at six and thirty he suffered the shock of learning that a relative an old woman to whom he had occasionally written as a matter of kindness farmerlow could do such things had left him by will the sum of six hundred pounds it was strictly a shock it upset his health for several days and not for a week or two could he realize the legacy as a fact just when he was beginning to look about him with a new air of confidence the solicitors who were managing the little affair for him dryly acquainted him with the fact that his relative's will was contested by other kinsfolk whom the old woman had passed over on the ground that she was imbecile and incapable of conducting her affairs there followed a lawsuit which consumed many months and cost a good deal of money so that though he won his case mr farmerlow lost all satisfaction in his improved circumstances and was only more embittered against the world at large then no sooner had he purchased his business than he learnt from smiling neighbours that he had paid considerably too much for it his predecessor beyond a doubt would have taken very much less had indeed been on the point of doing so just when mr farmerlow appeared this kind of experience is a trial to any man it threw mr farmerlow into a silent rage with the result that two or three customers who chanced to enter his shop declared that they would never have anything more to do with such a surly creature and now began his torment a form of exasperation peculiar to his dual capacity of shopkeeper and manager of a post office all day long he stood on the watch for customers literally stood now behind the counter now in front of it his eager and angry eyes turning to the door whenever the steps of a passer-by sounded without if the door opened his nerves began to tingle and he straightened himself like a soldier at attention for a moment he suffered an agony of doubt would the person entering turn to the counter or to the post office and seldom was his hope fulfilled not one in four of the people who came in was a genuine customer the post office always the post office a stamp a card a newspaper wrapper a postal order a letter to be registered anything but an honest purchase across the counter or the blessed tendering of a prescription to make up from vexation he passed to annoyance to rage to fury 
he cursed the post office and committed to eternal perdition the man who had waxed eloquent upon its advantages of course he had hired an errand boy and never had errand boy so little legitimate occupation resolved not to pay him for nothing mr farmerlow kept him cleaning windows washing bottles and the like until the lad fairly broke into rebellion if this was the sort of work he was engaged for he must have higher wages he wasn't over strong and his mother said he must lead an open-air life that was why he had taken the place to be bearded thus in his own shop was too much for mr farmerlow he seized the opportunity of giving his wrath full swing and burst into a frenzy of vilification just as his passion reached its height he stood with his back to the door there entered a lady who wished to make a large purchase of disinfectants alarmed and scandalized at what was going on she had no sooner crossed the threshold than she turned again and hurried away her friends were not long in learning from her that the new chemist was a most violent man a most disagreeable person the very last man one could think of doing business with the home was but poorly furnished and mr farmerlow had engaged a very cheap general servant who involved him in dirt and discomfort it was a matter of talk among the neighbouring tradesmen that the chemist lived in a beggarly fashion when the dismissed errand boy spread the story of how he had been used people jumped to the conclusion that mr farmerlow drank before long there was a legend that he had been suffering from an acute attack of delirium tremens the post office always the post office if he sat down at a meal the shop bell clanged and hope springing eternal he hurried forth in readiness to make up a packet or concoct a mixture but it was an old lady who held him in talk for ten minutes about rates of postage to south america when by rare luck he had a prescription to dispense the hideous scrawl of that pestilent dr bunker in came somebody with letters and parcels which he was requested to weigh and his hand shook so with rage that he could not resume his dispensing for the next quarter of an hour people asked extraordinary questions and were surprised offended when he declared he could not answer them when could a letter be delivered at a village on the northwest coast of ireland was it true that the post office contemplated a reduction of rates to hong kong would he explain in detail the new system of express delivery invariably he betrayed impatience and occasionally he lost his temper people went away exclaiming what a horrid man he was mr what's your name said a shopkeeper one day after receiving a short answer i shall make it my business to complain of you to the postmaster general i don't come here to be insulted who insulted you returned farmerlow like a sullen schoolboy why you did and you are always doing it i'm not you are if i did terror stole upon the chemist's heart i didn't mean it and i i'm sure i apologize it's a way i have a damned bad way let me tell you I advise you to get out of it. I'm sorry. So you should be. And the tradesman walked off, only half appeased. Mr. Farmerlow could have shed tears in his mortification, and for some minutes he stood looking at a bottle of laudanum, wishing he had the courage to have done with life. Plainly, he could not live very long unless things improved his ready money was coming to an end rents and taxes loomed before him an awful thought of bankruptcy haunted him in the early morning hours the most frequent visitor to the post office was a well-dressed middle-aged man who spoke civilly and did his business in the fewest possible words mr farmerlow rather liked the look of him and once or twice made conversational overtures but with no encouraging result one day 
feeling bolder than usual the chemist ventured to speak what he had in mind after supplying the grave gentleman with stamps and postal orders he said in a tone meant to be conciliatory i don't know whether you ever have need of mineral waters sir why yes sometimes my ordinary tradesman supplies them i thought i'd just mention that i keep them in stock ah thank you i've noticed went on the luckless apothecary his bosom heaving with a sense of his wrongs that you're a pretty large customer of the post office and it seems to me he meant to speak jocosely that it would be only fair if you gave me a turn now and then i get next to nothing out of this you know i should be much obliged if you the man of few words was looking at him half in surprise half in indignation and when the chemist blundered into silence he spoke i really have nothing to do with that as a matter of fact i was on the point of making a little purchase in your shop but i decidedly object to this kind of behaviour and shall make my purchase elsewhere he strode solemnly into the street and mr farmerlow unconscious of all about him glared at vacancy whether from the angry tradesman or from some lady with whom mr farmerlow had been abrupt a complaint did presently reach the postal authorities with the result that an official called at the chemist's shop the interview was unpleasant it happened that mr farmerlow not for the first time had just then allowed himself to run out of certain things always in demand by the public halfpenny stamps for instance moreover his accounts were not in perfect order this he had to hear was emphatically unbusinesslike and in brief would not do it shall not occur again sir mumbled the unhappy man but if you consider my position mr farmerlow allow me to tell you that this is a matter for your own consideration and no one else's true sir quite true still when you come to think of it i assure you the only assurance i want is that the business of the post office will be properly attended to and that assurance i must have i shall probably call again before long good morning it was always with a savage satisfaction that mr farmerlow heard the clock strike eight on saturday evening his shop remained open till ten but at eight came the end of the post office business if as happened any one entered five minutes too late it delighted him to refuse their request these were the only moments in which he felt himself a free man after eating his poor supper he smoked a pipe or two of cheap tobacco brooding or he fingered the pages of his menacing account books or very rarely he walked about the dark country roads asking himself with many a tragicomic gesture and ejaculation why he could not get on like other men one afternoon it seemed that he at length had his chance there entered a maid-servant with a prescription to be made up and sent as soon as possible a glance at the name delighted mr farmerlow it was that of the richest family in the suburbs the medicine to be sure was only for a governess but his existence was recognised and the patronage of such people would do him good but for the never sufficiently to be condemned handwriting of dr bunker the prescription offered no difficulty rubbing his palms together and smiling as he seldom smiled he told the domestic that the medicine should be delivered in less than half an hour scarcely had he begun upon it when a lady came in a lady whom he knew well her business was at the post office side and she looked a peremptory demand for his attention inwardly furious he crossed the shop be so good as to tell me what this will cost by book post it seemed to be a pamphlet giving a glance at one of the open ends mr farmerlow saw handwriting within and his hostility to the woman found vent in a sharp remark there's a written communication in this it will be letter rate 
the lady eyed him with terrible scorn you will oblige me by minding your own business your remark is the merest impertinence that packet consists of manuscript and will therefore go at book rate be so good as to weigh it at once mr farmerlow lost all control of himself and well nigh screamed no madam i will not weigh it and let me inform you as you are so ignorant that to weigh packets is not part of my duty i do it merely to oblige civil persons and you madam are not one of them the lady instantly turned and withdrew damn the post office yelled mr farmerlow alone with his errand boy and shaking his fist in the air this very day i write to give it up i say damn the post office he returned to his dispensing completed it wrapped up the bottle in the customary manner and dispatched the boy to the house five minutes later a thought flashed through his mind which put him in a cold sweat he happened to glance along the shelf from which he had taken the bottle containing the last ingredient of the mixture and it struck him with all the force of a horrible doubt that he had made a mistake in the irate confusion of his thoughts he had done the dispensing almost mechanically the bottle he ought to have taken down was that but had he not actually poured from that other of poisoning there was no fear but if indeed he had made a slip the result would be a very extraordinary mixture so surprising in fact that the patient would be sure to speak to dr bunker about it good heavens he felt sure he had made the mistake any other man would have taken down the two bottles in question and have examined the mouths of them for traces of moisture mr farmerlow a victim of destiny could do nothing so reasonable heedless of the fact that his shop remained unguarded he seized his hat and rushed after the errand boy if he could only have a sniff at the mixture it would either confirm his fear or set his mind at rest he tore along the road and was too late the boy met him having just completed his errand with a wild curse he sped to the house he rushed to the tradesman's door the medicine just delivered he must examine it he feared there was a mistake an extraordinary oversight the bottle had not yet been upstairs mr farmerlow tore off the wrapper wrenched out the cork sniffed and smiled feebly thank you i'm glad to find there was no mistake i'll take it back and have it wrapped up again and send it immediately immediately and by the by he fumbled in his pocket for half a crown still smiling like a detected culprit i'm sure you won't mention this little affair a new assistant of mine stupid fellow i'm going to get rid of him at once thank you thank you notwithstanding that half-crown the incident was of course talked of through the house before a quarter of an hour had elapsed next day it was the gossip of the suburbs and the day after the city itself heard the story people were alarmed and scandalized why such a chemist was a public danger one lady declared that he ought at once to be struck off the roll and so in a sense he was another month and the flowery bowery little suburb knew him no more he hid himself in a great town living on the wreck of his fortune whilst he sought a place as an assistant a leaky pair of boots and a bad east wind found the vulnerable spot of his constitution after all there was just enough money left to bury him End of Fate and the Apothecary by George Gissing The Old Man of Visions by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
The Old Man of Visions by Algernon Blackwood The image of Habakkuk, sitting in his watchtower alone with the stars, leaped into my mind the moment I saw him, and the curious expression of his eyes proclaimed at once that here was a being who allowed the world of small effects to pass him by, while he himself dwelt among the eternal verities. It was only necessary to catch a glimpse of the bent grey figure, so slight yet so tremendous, to realize that he carried staff and wallet, and was travelling alone in a spiritual region, uncharted and full of wonder, difficulty, and fearful joy. The inner eye perceived this quite as clearly as the outer was aware of his Hebraic ancestry, but along what winding rivers, through what haunted wood, by the shores of what singing seas, he pressed forwards towards the mountains of his goal, no one could guess from a mere inspection of that wonderful old face. To have stumbled upon such a figure in the casual way I did seemed incredible to me even at that time, and yet I at once caught something of the uplifting airs that followed this inhabitant of a finer world, and I spent days, and considered them well spent, trying to get into conversation with him, so that I might know something more than the thin disguise of his holding a reader's ticket for the museum library. To reach the stage of intimacy, where actual speech is a hindrance to close understanding, one need not in some cases have spoken at all, and thus by merely setting my mind, and above all my imagination, into tune with his, and by steeping myself so much in his atmosphere, that I absorbed and then gave back to him with my own stamp the forces he exhaled. It was at length possible to persuade those vast seeing eyes to turn in my direction, and our glances having once met, I simply rose when he rose, and followed him out of the little smoky restaurant so closely up the street that our clothes brushed, and I thought I could even catch the sound of his breathing. Whether having already weighed me he accepted the office, or whether he was grateful for the arm to lean upon with his many years' burden, I did not know, but the sympathy between us was such that without a single word we walked up that foggy London street to the door of his lodging in Bloomsbury, while I noticed that at the touch of his arm the noise of the town seemed to turn into deep singing, and even the hurrying passers-by seemed bent upon noble purposes. And though he barely reached to my shoulder, and his grey beard almost touched my glove as I bent my arm to hold his own, there was something immense about his figure that sent him with towering stature above me and filled my thoughts with enchanting dreams of grandeur and high beauty but it was only when the door had closed on him with a little rush of wind and i was walking home alone that i fully realized the shock of my return to earth and on reaching my own rooms I shook with laughter to think I had walked a mile and a half with a complete stranger without uttering a single syllable. And then the laughter suddenly hushed, as I caught my face in the glass with the expression of the soul still lingering about the eyes and forehead. And for a brief moment my heart leaped to a sort of noble fever in the blood leaving me with the smart of the soul's wings stirring beneath the body's crushing weight. And when it passed, I found myself dwelling upon the only words he had spoken when I left him at the door. I am the old man of visions, and I am at your service. I think he never had a name, at least it never passed his lips and perhaps lay buried with so much else of the past that he clearly deemed unimportant. To me, at any rate, he became simply the old man of visions, and to the little waiting maid and the old landlady he was known simply as Mr. Mr. Neither more nor less, the impenetrable veil that hung over his past 
never lifted for any vital revelations of his personal history, though he evidently knew all countries of the world, and had absorbed into his heart and brain the experience of all possible types of human nature, and there was an air about him not so much of ask me no questions as do not ask me, for I cannot answer you in words. He could satisfy, but not in mere language. He would reveal, but by the wonderful words of silence only, for he was the old man of visions, and visions needed no words, being swift and of the spirit. Moreover, the landlady, poor, dusty, faded woman, the landlady stood in awe, and disliked being probed for information in a passageway down which he might at any moment tread, for she could only tell me, he just came in one night years ago, and he's been here ever since, and more than that I never knew, just came in one night years ago. This adequately explained him, for where he came from, or was journeying to, was something quite beyond the scope of ordinary limited language. I pictured him suddenly turning aside from the stream of unimportant events, quietly stepping out of the world of straining, fighting, and shouting, and moving to take his rightful place among the horses of the still spiritual region where he belonged, by virtue of long pain and difficult attainment. For he was unconnected with any conceivable network of relations, friends, or family, and his terrible aloofness could not be disturbed by any one unless with his permission and by his express wish. Nor could he be imagined as belonging to any definite set of souls. He was apart from the world and above it. But it was only when I began to creep a little nearer to him, and our strange, silent intimacy passed from mental to spiritual that I began really to understand more of this wonderful old man of visions. Steeped in the tragedy and convulsed with laughter at the comedy of life, he yet lived there in his high attic, wrapped in silence as in a golden cloud, and so seldom did he actually speak to me that each time the sound of his voice that had something elemental in it something of winds and waters, thrilled me with the power of the first time. He lived, like Habakkuk, alone with the stars, and it seemed impossible more and more to link him on anywhere into practical dealings with ordinary men and women. Life somehow seemed to pass below him, and yet the small, selfish spirit of the recluse was far from him, and he was tenderly and deeply responsive to pain and suffering, and more particularly to genuine yearning for the far things of beauty. The unsatisfied longings of others could move him at once to tears. "'My relations with men are perfect,' he said one night as we neared his dwelling. "'I give them all sympathy out of my stores of knowledge and experience, and they give to me what kindness I need. My outer shell lies within impenetrable solitude, for only so can my inner life move freely along the paths and terraces that are thronged with the beings to whom I belong. And when I asked him how he maintained such deep sympathy with humanity, and yet absolved himself apparently from action as from speech, he stopped against an area railing and turned his great eyes on to my face as though their fires could communicate his thought without the husk of words. I have peered too profoundly into life and beyond it, he murmured, to wish to express in language what I know. Action is not for all always, and I am in touch with the cisterns of thought that lie behind action. I ponder the mysteries. What I may solve is not lost for lack either of speech or action, for the true mystic is ever the true man of action, and my thought will reach others as soon as they are ready for it, in the same way that it reached you. 
all who strongly yearn must sooner or later find me and be comforted his eyes shifted from my face towards the stars softly shining above the dark museum roof and a moment later he had disappeared into the hallway of his house an old poet who has strayed afield and lost his way i mused but through the door where he had just vanished the words came back to me as from a great distance a priest rather who has begun to find his way for a space i stood pondering on his face and words that mercilessly intelligent look of the hebrew woven in with the expression of the sadness of a whole race and yet touched with the glory of the spirit and his utterance that he had passed through all the traditions and no longer needed a formal limited creed to hold to i forget how i reached my own door several miles away but it seemed to me that i flew in this way and by unregistered degrees we came to know each other better and he accepted me and took me into his life always wrapped in the great calm of his delightful silence he taught me more and told me more than could ever lie within the confines of mere words and in moments of need no matter where or when i always knew exactly how to find him reaching him in a few seconds by some swift way that disdained the means of ordinary locomotion then at last one day he gave me the key of his house and the first time i found my way into his eerie and realized that it was a haven i could always fly to when the yearnings of the heart and soul struggled vainly for recompense the full meaning and importance of the old man of vision became finally clear to me the room high up creaky darkened stairs in the ancient house was bare and fireless looking through a single patched window across a tumbled sea of roofs and chimneys and yet there was that in it which instantly proclaimed it a little holy place out of this world a temple in which someone with spiritual vitality had worshipped prayed wept and sung it was dusty and unswept and yet it was utterly unsoiled and the old man of visions who lived there for all his shabby and stained garments his uncombed beard and broken shoes stood within its door revealed in his real self moving in a sort of divine whiteness iridescent shining and here in this attic lampless and unswept high up under the old roofs of bloomsbury the windows scarred with rain and the corners dropping cobwebs i heard his silver whisper issue from the shadows here you may satisfy your soul's desire and may commune with the invisibles only to find the invisibles you must first be able to lose yourself as i through that stained window pane the sight leaping at a single bound from black roofs up to the stars what pictures dreams and visions the old man had summoned to my eyes distances measureless and impossible hitherto became easy and from the oppression of dead bricks and the market-place he transported me in a moment to the slopes of the mountains of dreams leading me to little places near the summits where the pines grew thinly and the stars were visible through their branches fading into the rose of dawn where the winds tasted of the desert and the voices of the wilderness fled upward with the sound of wings and falling streams at his word houses melted away and the green waves of all the seas flowed into their places forests waved themselves into the coastline of dull streets and the power of the old earth with all her smells and flowers and wild life thrilled down among the dead roofs and caught me away into freedom among the sunshine of meadows and the music of sweet pipings and with the divine deliverance came the crying of seagulls the glimmer of reedy tarns the whispering of wind among grasses and the healing scorch of a real sun upon the skin and poetry 
such as was never known or heard before, clothed all he uttered, yet even then took no form in actual words, for it was of the substance of aspiration and yearning, voicing adequately all the busy high-born dreams that haunt the soul, and yet never live in the uttered line. He breathed it about him in the air, so that it filled my being. It was part of him, beyond words, and it sang my own longings, and sang them perfectly, so that I was satisfied. For my own mood never failed to touch him instantly, and to waken the right response. In its essence, it was spiritual, the mystic poetry of heaven. Still the love of humanity informed it, for star-fire and heart's blood were about equally mingled there, while the mystery of the unattainable beauty moved through it like a white flame. With other dreams and longings, too, it was the same, and all the most beautiful ideas that ever haunted a soul, undowered with expression here, floated with satisfied eyes and smiling lips before one floated in silence, unencumbered, unlimited, unrestrained by words. In this dim room, never made ugly by artificial light, but always shadowy in a kind of gentle dusk, the old man of visions had only to lead me to the window to bring peace, music that rendered the soul fluid as it poured across the old roofs into the room was summoned by him at need, and when one's wings beat sometimes against the prison walls, and the yearning for escape oppressed the heart, I have heard the little room rush and fill with the sound of trees, wind among grasses, whispering branches, and lapping waters. The very odors of space and mountainside came too, and the looming of noble hills seemed visible overhead against the stars, as though the ceiling had suddenly become transparent. For the old man of visions had the power of instantly satisfying an ideal when once that ideal created a yearning that could tear and burn its way out with sufficient force to set the will a-moving. But as the time passed, and I came to depend more and more upon the intimacy with my strange old friend, new light fell upon the nature and possibilities of our connection. I discovered, for instance, that though I held the key to his dwelling and was familiar with the way, he was nevertheless not always available. Two things in different fashion rendered him inaccessible or mute, and for the first, I gradually learned that when life was prosperous and the body singing loud, I could not find my way to his house. No amount of wandering calculation or persevering effort enabled me even to find the street again. With any burst of worldly success, however fleeting, the old man of visions somehow slipped away into remote shadows and became unreal and misty, a merely passing desire to be with him to seek his inspiration by a glimpse through that magic window-pane resulted only in vain and tiresome pacing to and fro along ugly streets that produced weariness and depression and after these periods it became i noticed less and less easy to discover the house to fit the key in the door or having gained access to the temple to the visions i thought i craved for Often in this way have I searched in vain for days, but only succeeded in losing myself in the murky purlieus of a quite strange Bloomsbury, stopping outside numberless counterfeit doors, and struggling vainly with locks that knew nothing of my little shining key. But on the other hand, pain, loneliness, sorrow, the merest whisper of spiritual affliction, and lo! The difficult geography became plain, and without hesitation, when I was unhappy or distressed, I found the way to his house, as by a bird's instinctive flight, and the key slipped into the lock, as though it loved it, and was returning home. The other cause to render him inaccessible 
though not so determined since it never concealed the way to the house was even more distressing for it depended wholly on myself and i came to know how the least ugly action involving a deprecation of ideals so confused the mind that when i got into the house with difficulty and found him in the little room after much searching he was able to do or say scarcely anything at all for me the mirror facing the door then gave back i saw no proper reflection of his person but only a faded and wavering shadow with dim eyes and stooping indistinct outline and i even fancied i could see the pattern of the wall and shape of the furniture through his body as though he had grown semi-transparent you must not expect yearnings to weigh came his whisper like wind far overhead unless you lend to them your own substance and your own substance you cannot both keep and lend if you would know the invisibles forget yourself and later as the years slipped away one after another into the mists and the frontier between the real and the unreal began to shift amazingly with his teachings it became more and more clear to me that he belonged to a permanent region that with all the changes in the world's history has itself never altered in any essential particular this immemorial old man of visions as i grew to think of him had existed always he was old as the sea coeval with the stars and he dwelt beyond time and space reaching out a hand to all those who weary of the shadows and illusions of practical life really call to him with their heart of hearts to me indeed the touch of sorrow was always near enough to prevent his becoming often inaccessible and after a while even his voice became so living that i sometimes heard it calling to me in the street and in the fields oh wonderful old man of visions i happy the days of disaster since they taught me how to know you the unraveller of problems the destroyer of doubts who bore me ever away with soft flight down the long long vistas of the heart and soul and his loneliness in that temple attic under the stars his loneliness too had a meaning i did not fail to understand later and why he was always available for me and seemed to belong to no other to every one who finds me he said with a strange smile that wrapped his whole being and not his face alone to every one i am the same and yet different i am not really ever alone the whole world nay his voice rose to a singing cry the whole universe lies in this room or just beyond that window pane for here past and future meet and all real dreams find completeness but remember he added and there was a sound as of soft wind and rain in the room with his voice no true dream can ever be shared and should you seek to explain me to another you must lose me beyond recall you have never asked my name nor must you ever tell it each must find me in his own way yet one day for all my knowledge and his warnings i felt so sure of my intimacy with this immemorial being that i spoke of him to a friend who was i had thought so much a part of myself that it seemed no betrayal and my friend who went to search and found nothing returned with the fool's laughter on his face and swore that no street or number existed for he had looked in vain and had repeatedly asked the way and from that day to this the old man of visions has neither called to me nor let his place be found the streets are strange and empty and i have even lost the little shining key End of the Old Man of Visions by Algernon Blackwood The House of Sudhu by Rudyard Kipling This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A reading by Tony Addison of Hereford, England. The House of Sudu A stone's throw out on either hand from that well-ordered road we tread, and all the world is wild and strange, shrill and ghoul and gin and sprite, shall bear us company to-night. For we have reached the oldest land, wherein the powers of darkness range, from the dusk to the dawn. The house of Sudu, and near the Taksali gate, is two-storied, with four carved windows of old brown wood, and a flat roof. You may recognize it by five red handprints arranged like the five of diamonds on the whitewash between the upper windows. Bhagwan Das, the Bunia, and a man who says he gets his living by seal cutting, live in the lower story, or with a troop of wives, servants, friends, and retainers. The two upper rooms used to be occupied by Janou and Azizun and a little black and tan terrier that was stolen from an Englishman's house and given to Janou by a soldier. Today only Janou lives in the upper rooms. Sadou sleeps on the roof, generally, except when he sleeps in the street. He used to go to Peshawar in the cold weather to visit his son, who sells curiosities near the Edwardes gate, and then he slept under a real mud roof. Sadou is a great friend of mine, because his cousin had a son, who secured, thanks to my recommendation, the post of head messenger to a big firm in the station. Sadou says that God will make me a lieutenant governor one of these days. I dare say his prophecy will come true. He is very, very old, with white hair and no teeth worth showing, and he has outlived his wits, outlived nearly everything, except his fondness for his son at Peshawar. Janu and Azizun are Kashmiris, ladies of the city, and theirs was an ancient and more or less honourable profession, but Azizun has since married a medical student from the northwest, and has settled down to a most respectable life uh, somewhere near Barley. Bhagwandas is an extortionate and an adulterator. He is very rich. The man who is supposed to get his living by seal-cutting pretends to be very poor. Uh, this lets you know as much as is necessary of the four principal tenants in the house of Sadhu. Uh, then there is me, of course, but I am only the chorus that comes in at the end to explain things, so I don't count. Uh, Sadhu was not clever. The man who pretended to cut seals was the cleverest of them all. Bhagwan Das only knew how to lie, except Janu. Uh, she was also beautiful, but that was her own affair. Sudhu's son at Peshawar was attacked by pleurisy, and old Sudhu was troubled. The seal cutter man heard of Sudhu's anxiety and made capital out of it. He was abreast of the times. He got a friend in Peshawar to telegraph daily accounts of the son's health, and here the story begins. Sudhu's cousin's son told me one evening that Sadhu wanted to see me, that he was too old and feeble to come personally, and that I should be conferring an everlasting honour on the house of Sadhu if I went to him. I went, but I think, seeing how well off Sadhu was then, that he might have sent something better than an ekka, which jolted fearfully, to haul out a future lieutenant governor to the city on a muggy April evening. The ekka did not run quickly. It was full dark when we pulled up opposite the door of Aranjit Singh's tomb near the main gate of the fort. Here was a Sudhu, and he said that, by reason of my condescension, it was absolutely certain that I should become a lieutenant governor while my hair was yet black. Then we talked about the weather and the state of my health and the wheat crops for fifteen minutes in the Huzuri bag under the stars. Sadhu came to the point at last. He said that Janu had told him that there was an order of the Sirka against magic, because it was feared that magic might one day kill the Empress of India. Hmm. 
I didn't know anything about the state of the law, but I fancied that something interesting was going to happen. I said that so far from magic being discouraged by the government, it was highly commended. The greatest officials of the state practiced it themselves. If the financial statement isn't magic, I don't know what is. Then, to encourage him further, I said that if there was any jadoo afoot, I had not the least objection to giving it to my countenance and sanction, and to seeing that it was clean jadoo, white magic, as distinguished from the unclean jadoo, which kills folk. It took a long time before Sadu admitted that this was just what he had asked me to come for. Then he told me, in jerks and quavers, that the man who said he cut seals was a sorcerer of the cleanest kind, that every day he gave Sadu news of the sick son in Peshawar, more quickly than the lightning could fly, and that this news was always corroborated by the letters. Further, that he had told Sadu how a great danger was threatening his son, which could be removed by clean Jadu, and, of course, heavy payment. I began to see how the land lay, and told Sadu that I also understood a little Jadu in the western line, and would go to his house to see that everything was done decently and in order. We set off together, and on the way Sadu told me he had paid the steel cutter between one hundred and two hundred rupees already, and the Jadu of that night would cost two hundred more. Oh, it was cheap, he said, considering the greatness of his son's danger, but I do not think he meant it. The lights were all cloaked in the front of the house when we arrived. I could hear awful noises from behind the seal-cutter shop front, as if someone were groaning his soul out. Sodou shook all over, and while we groped our way upstairs, told me that the jadu had begun. Janu and Azizun met us at the stairhead and told us that the Jadu work was coming up in their rooms, because there was more space there. Janu is a lady of a free-thinking turn of mind. She whispered that the Jadu was an invention to get money out of Sudu, and that the seal cutter would go to a hot place when he died. Sudu was nearly crying with fear and old age. He kept walking up and down the room in the half-light, repeating his son's name over and over again, and asking Azizun if the seal-cutter ought not to make a reduction in the case of his own landlord. Janu pulled me over to the shadow in the recess of the carved bow-windows. The boards were up, and the rooms were only lit by one tiny lamp. There was no chance of my being seen if I stayed still. Presently the groans below ceased, and we heard steps on the staircase. And that was the seal-cutter. He stopped outside the door as the terrier barked, and Azizun fumbled at the chain, and he told Sudu to blow out the lamp. This left the place in jet darkness, except for the red glow from the two hookahs that belonged to Janu and Azizun. The seal-cutter came in, and I heard Sudu throw himself down on the floor and groan. Azizun caught her breath, and Janu backed to one of the beds with a shudder. There was a clink of something metallic and then shot up a pale blue-green flame near the ground. The light was just enough to show Azizun, pressed against one corner of the room with the terrier between her knees, Janu with her hands clasped leaning forward as she sat on the bed, Sudu face down, quivering, and the seal-cutter. I hope I may never see another man like that seal-cutter. He was stripped to the waist with a wreath of white jasmine as thick as my wrist round his forehead, a salmon-coloured loincloth round his middle, and a steel bangle on each ankle. This was not awe-inspiring. It was the face of the man that turned me cold. It was blue-gray in the first place, and the second the eyes were rolled back, till you could only see the whites of them, and in the third the face was the face of a demon, a ghoul, anything you please except of the sleek, oily old ruffian who sat in the daytime over his turning lathe downstairs. He was lying on his stomach, with his arms turned and crossed behind him as if he had been thrown down pinioned. His head and neck were the only parts of him off the floor. They were nearly at right angles to the body like the head of a cobra at spring. It was ghastly. In the centre of the room on the bare earth floor stood a big, deep brass basin with a pale blue-green light floating in the centre like a nightlight. 
Round that basin the man on the floor wriggled himself three times. How he did it, I do not know. I could see the muscles ripple along his spine and fall smooth again, but I could not see any other motion. The head seemed the only thing alive about him, except that slow curl and uncurl of the laboring back muscles. Janu from the bed was breathing seventy to the minute as his soon held her hands before her eyes, and old Sudu fingering at the dirt that had gotten into his white beard was crying to himself the horror of it was that the creeping crawly thing made no sound only crawled and remember this lasted but ten minutes while the terrier whined and azizun shuddered and shenu gasped and sudu cried i felt the hair lift at the back of my head and my heart thump like a thermantidote paddle luckily the seal cutter betrayed himself by his most impressive trick and made me calm again after he had finished that unspeakable triple crawl, he stretched his head away from the floor as high as he could and sent out a jet of fire from his nostrils. Now, I knew how fire sprouting was done. I can do it myself, so I felt at ease. The business was a fraud. If he had only kept to that crawl without trying to raise the effect, goodness knows what I might not have thought. Both the girls shrieked at the jet of fire and the head dropped chin down on the floor with a thud the whole body lying there like a corpse with its arms trussed there was a pause of five full minutes after this and the blue-green flame died down janu stooped to settle one of her anklets while azizun turned her face to the wall and took the terrier in her arms sudu put out an arm mechanically to janu's hookah and she slid it across the floor with her foot Directly above the body and on the wall were a couple of flaming portraits in stamped paper frames of the Queen and the Prince of Wales. They looked down on the performance and, to my thinking, seemed to heighten the grotesqueness of it all. Just when the silence was getting unendurable, the body turned over and rolled away from the basin to the side of the room where it lay stomach up. There was a faint plop from the basin exactly like the noise a fish makes when it takes a fly and the green light in the center revived. I looked at the basin and saw bobbing in the water the dry, shriveled black head of a native baby, open eyes, open mouth, and shaved scalp. It was worse, being so very sudden, than the crawling exhibition. We had no time to say anything before it began to speak. Read Poe's account of the voice that came from the mesmerized dying man, and you will realize less than one half of the horror of that head's voice. There was an interval of a second or two between each word, and a sort of ring, 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 in the note of the voice, like the timbre of a bell. It pealed slowly, as if talking to itself for several minutes, before I got rid of my cold sweat. Then the blessed solution struck me. I looked at the body lying near the doorway, and saw just where the hollow at the throat joins on the shoulders a muscle that had nothing to do with any man's regular breathing twitching away steadily ah the whole thing was a careful reproduction of the egyptian teraphin that one read about sometimes and the voice was as clever and as appalling a piece of ventriloquism as one could wish to hear all this time the head was lip lip lapping against the side of the basin and speaking it told Sudu, on his face again whining, of his son's illness, and of the state of the illness up to the evening of that very night. I always shall respect the seal-cutter for keeping so faithfully to the time of the Peshawar telegrams. It went on to say that skilled doctors were night and day watching over the man's life, and that he would eventually recover, if the fee to the potent sorcerer, whose servant was the head in the basin, were doubled. Here the mistake, from the artistic point of view, came in. To ask for twice your stipulated fee, in a voice that Lazarus might have used when he rose from the dead, is absurd. Janu, who is really a woman of masculine intellect, saw this as quickly as I did. I heard her say, Asli Nahin Farib, scornfully under her breath, and just as she said so, the light in the basin died out, the head stopped talking, and we heard the room door creak on its hinges. Then Janu struck a match, lit the lamp, and we saw that head, basin, and seal-cutter were gone. 
Sudo was wringing his hands and explaining to any one who cared to listen that if his chances of eternal salvation depended on it, he could not raise another two hundred rupees. Azizun was nearly in hysterics in the corner, while Janu sat down composedly on one of the beds to discuss the probabilities of the whole thing being a banal or make-up. I explained as much as I knew of the seal-cutter's way of Shadu, but her argument was much more simple. "'The magic that is always demanding gifts is no true magic,' said she. "'My mother told me that the only potent love-spells are those which are told you for love. "'Ah, oh, this seal-cutter man is a liar and a devil. "'I dare not tell, do anything, or get anything done, "'because I am in debt to Bhagwan Das, the bunia, for two gold rings and a heavy anklet. "'I must get my food from his shop. "'The seal-cutter is the friend of Bhagwan Das, and he would poison my food.' A fool Jadu has been going on for ten days, and has cost Sadu many rupees each night. The seal cutter used black hens and lemons and mantras before. He never showed us anything like this till tonight. Azizun is a fool, and will be a poor Danishin soon. Sudu has lost his strength and his wits. See now. I had hoped to get from Sudu many rupees while he lived and many more after his death, and behold, he is spending everything on that offspring of a devil and a she-ass, the seal-cutter. Here I said, but what induced Sadhu to drag me into the business? Well, of course, I can speak to the seal-cutter, and he shall refund. The whole thing is child's talk, shame, and senseless. Sadhu is an old child, said Janu. He has lived on the ropes these seventy years, and is as senseless as a milch goat. He brought you here to assure himself that he was not breaking any law of the Sirka, who sold it many years ago. He worships the dust of the feet of the seal-cutter, and that Kaudubara has forbidden him to go and see his son. What does Sadhu know of your laws or the lightning post? I have to watch his money going day by day to that lying bitch below. Janu stamped her foot on the floor and nearly cried with vexation while Sudo was whimpering under a blanket in the corner, and Azizun was trying to guide the pipe-stem to his foolish old mouth. Now the case stands thus. Unthinkingly, I have laid myself open to the charge of aiding and abetting the seal-cutter, in obtaining money under false pretenses, which is forbidden by section 420 of the Indian Penal Code. I am helpless in the matter for these reasons. I cannot inform the police— what witnesses would support my statements? Janu refuses flatly. Azizun is a veiled woman, somewhere near Barali, lost in this big India of ours. I cannot again take the law into my own hands and speak to the seal-cutter, for certain am I that not only would Sudu disbelieve me, but this step would end in the poisoning of Janu, who is bound hand and foot by her debt to the bunia. Sudu is an old dotard, and whenever we meet mumbles my idiotic joke that the Sukkar rather patronizes the black art than otherwise. His son is well now. But Sudu is completely under the influence of the seal-cutter, by whose advice he regulates the affairs of his life. Shanu watches daily the money that she hoped to wheedle out of Sudu, taken by the seal-cutter, and becomes daily more furious and sullen. She will never tell, because she dare not. But unless something happens to prevent her, I am afraid that the seal-cutter will die of cholera, the white, arsenic kind, about the middle of May. And thus, I shall have to be privy to a murder in the house of Sudu. The house of Sudu ends by Rajad. Kipling. The Song of the Morrow by Robert Louis Stevenson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Song of the of the Morrow by Robert Louis Stevenson The king of Duntreen had a daughter when he was old, and she was the fairest king's daughter between two seas. Her hair was like spun gold, and her eyes like pools in a river. And the king gave her a castle upon the sea-beach, with a terrace 
and a court of the hewn stone, and four towers at the four corners. Here she dwelt, and grew up, and had no care for the morrow, and no power upon the hour, after the manner of simple men. It befell that she walked one day by the beach of the sea, when it was autumn, and the wind blew from the place of rains, and upon the one hand of her the sea beat, and upon the other the dead leaves ran. This was the loneliest beach between two seas, and strange things have been done there in the ancient ages. Now the king's daughter was aware of a crone that sat upon the beach. The sea foam ran to her feet, and the dead leaves swarmed about her back, and the rags blew about her face in the blowing of the wind. Now, said the king's daughter, and she named a holy name, this is the most unhappy old crone between two seas. Daughter of a king, said the crone. You dwell in a stone house, and your hair is like the gold, but what is your profit? Life is not long, nor life strong, and you live after the way of simple men, and have no thought for the morrow, and no power upon the hour. Thought for the morrow that I have, said the king's daughter, but power upon the hour that have I not. And she mused with herself. Then the crone smote her lean hands one within the other, and laughed like a seagull. Home, cried she, O daughter of a king, home to your stone house, for the longing is come upon you now, nor can you live any more after the manner of simple men. Home, and toil, and suffer till the gift come that will make you bear, until the man come that will bring you care. The king's daughter made no more ado, but she turned about and went home to her house in silence. And when she was come into her chamber, she called for her nurse. Nurse, said the king's daughter, thought is come upon me for the morrow, so that I can live no more out of the manner of simple men. Tell me what I must do, that I may have power upon the hour. Then the nurse moaned like a snow-wind. Alas, said she, that this thing should be. But the thought is gone into your marrow, nor is there any cure against the thought. Be it so, then, even as you will, though power is less than weakness, power shall you have. And though the thought is colder than winter, yet shall you think it to an end. So the king's daughter sat in her vaulted chamber in the masoned house, and she thought upon the thought. Nine years she sat, and the sea beat upon the terrace, and the gulls cried about the turrets, and wind crooned in the chimneys of the house. Nine years she came not abroad, nor tasted the clean air, neither saw God's sky. Nine years she sat, and looked neither to the right, nor to the left, nor heard speech of any one, but thought upon the thought of the morrow. And her nurse fed her in silence, and she took of the food with her left hand, and ate it without grace. Now when the nine years were out, it fell dusk in the autumn, and there came a sound in the wind like a sound of piping. At that the nurse lifted up her finger in the vaulted house, I hear a sound in the wind, said she, that is like the sound of piping. It is but a little sound, said the king's daughter, but yet it is sound enough for me. So they went down in the dusk to the doors of the house and along the beach of the sea, and the waves beat upon the one hand, and upon the other the dead leaves ran, and the clouds raced in the sky, and the gulls flew widdershams, and when they came to that part of the beach where strange things had been done in the ancient ages, lo, there was the crone, and she was dancing widdershams. "'What makes you dance widdershams, old crone?' said the king's daughter. "'Here, upon the bleak beach, between the waves and the dead leaves.' I hear a sound in the wind that is like a sound of piping, quoth she, and it is for that that I dance a widdershins, for the gift comes that will make you bear, and the man comes that must bring you care, but for me the morrow is come that I have thought upon, and the hour of my power. How comes it, crone, said the king's daughter, that you waver like a rag and pale like a dead leaf before my eyes? because the morrow has come that I have thought upon, and the hour of my power, said the crone. And she fell on the beach, and lo, 
she was but stalks of the sea tangle and dust of the sea sand and the sand lice hopped upon the place of her this is the strangest thing that befell between two seas said the king's daughter of duntreen but the nurse broke out and moaned like an autumn gale i am weary of the wind quoth she and she bewailed her day the king's daughter was aware of a man upon the beach he went hooded so that none might perceive his face and a pipe was underneath his arm the sound of his pipe was like singing wasps and like the wind that sings in windle straw and they took hold upon men's ears like the crying of gulls are you the comer quoth the king's daughter of duntreen i am the comer said he and these are the pipes that a man may hear and i have power upon the hour and this is the song of the morrow and he piped the song of the morrow and it was as long as years and the nurse wept out aloud at the hearing of it this is true said the king's daughter that you piped the song of the morrow but that ye have power upon the hour how may i know that show me a marvel here upon the beach between the waves and the dead leaves and the man said upon whom here is my nurse quoth the king's daughter she is weary of the wind show me a good marvel upon her and lo the nurse fell upon the beach as it were two handfuls of dead leaves and the wind whirled them widdishins and the sand lies hopped between it is true said the king's daughter of duntreen you are the comer and you have power upon the hour come with me to my stone house so they went by the sea margin and the man piped the song of the morrow and the leaves followed behind them as they went then they sat down together and the sea beat on the terrace and the gulls cried about the towers and the wind crooned in the chimneys of the house nine years they sat and every year when it fell autumn the man said this is the hour and i have power in it and the daughter of the king said nay but pipe me the song of the morrow and he piped it and it was long like years now when the nine years were gone the king's daughter of duntreen got her to her feet like one that remembers and she looked about her in the masoned house and all her servants were gone only the man that piped sat upon the terrace with the hand upon his face and as he piped the leaves ran about the terrace and the sea beat along the wall then she cried to him with a great voice this is the hour and let me see the power in it and with that the wind blew off the hood from the man's face and lo there was no man there only the clothes and the hood and the pipes tumbled one upon another in a corner of the terrace and the dead leaves ran over them and the king's daughter of duntreen got her to that part of the beach where strange things have been done in the ancient ages and there she sat her down the sea foam ran to her feet and the dead leaves swarmed about her back and the veil blew about her face and the blowing of the wind and when she lifted up her eyes there was the daughter of a king come walking on the beach her hair was like the spun gold and her eyes like pools in a river and she had no thought for the morrow and no power upon the hour after the manner of simple men the end of the song of the morrow by Robert Louis Stevenson. The Miracle of Puran Bhagat by Roger Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Miracle of Purun Bhagat by Roger Kipling 
The night we felt the earth would move, we stole, and plucked him by the hand, because we loved him with the love that knows but cannot understand. And when the roaring hillside broke and all our world fell down in rain, we saved him, we the little folk, but lo, he does not come again. Mourn now. We saved him for the sake of such poor love as wild ones may. Mourn ye. Our brother will not wake, and his own kind drive us away. Dirge of the Langours There was once a man in India who was Prime Minister of one of the semi-independent native states in the northwestern part of the country. He was a Brahmin, so high caste that caste ceased to have any particular meaning for him, and his father had been an important official in the gay-coloured rag-tack and bobtail of an old-fashioned Hindu court. But as Puran Das grew up, he felt that the old order of things was changing, and that if anyone wished to get on in the world, he must stand well with the English, and imitate all that the English believed to be good. At the same time, a native official must keep his own master's favour. This was a difficult game, but the quiet, close-mouthed young Brahmin, helped by a good English education at a Bombay university, played it coolly, and rose, step by step, to be Prime Minister of the Kingdom. That is to say, he held more real power than his master, the Maharaja. When the old king, who was suspicious of the English, their railways, and telegraphs, died, Puran Das stood high with his young successor, who had been tutored by an Englishman, and between them, though he always took care that his master should have the credit, they established schools for little girls, made roads, and started state dispensaries, and shows of agricultural implements, and published a yearly blue book on the moral and material progress of the state, and the foreign office and the government of India, were delighted. Very few native states take up English progress altogether, for they will not believe, as Purandá showed he did, that what was good for the Englishman must be twice as good for the Asiatic. The Prime Minister became the honoured friend of viceroys and governors and lieutenant governors and medical missionaries and common missionaries, and hard-riding English officers who came to shoot in the state preserves, as well as of whole hosts of tourists who travelled up and down India in the cold weather, showing how things ought to be managed. In his spare time he would endow scholarships for the study of medicine, and manufactures on strictly English lines and write letters to the pioneer, the greatest Indian daily paper, explaining his master's aims and objects. At last he went to England on a visit, and had to pay enormous sums to the priests when he came back, for even so high caste a Brahmin as Puran Das lost caste by crossing the Black Sea. In London he met and talked with everyone worth knowing, men whose names go all over the world, and saw a great deal more than he said. He was given honorary degrees by learned universities, and he made speeches, and talked of Hindu social reform to English ladies in evening dress, till all London cried, This is the most fascinating man we have ever met at dinner, since clock were first laid. When he returned to India, there was a blaze of glory, for the Viceroy himself made a special visit to confer upon the Maharaja the Grand Cross of the Star of India, all diamonds and ribbons and enamel, and at the same ceremony, while the cannon boomed, Puran Das was made a knight commander of the Order of the Indian Empire. 
so that his name stood Sir Puran Das, K-C-I-E. That evening, at dinner, in the big viceregal tent, he stood up with the badge and the collar of the order on his breast, and replying to the toast of his master's health, made a speech few Englishmen could have bettered. Next month, when the city had returned to its sun-baked quiet, he did a thing no Englishman would have dreamed of doing. For so far as the world's affairs went, he died. The jewelled order of his knighthood went back to the Indian government, and a new Prime Minister was appointed to the charge of affairs, and a great game of general post began in all the subordinate appointments. The priests knew what had happened, and the people guessed. But India is the one place in the world where a man can do as he pleases, and nobody asks why. And the fact that Dewan Sir Purandas case he, i.e., had resigned position, palace, and power, and taken up the begging bowl and ochre coloured dress of a sunyasi or holy man, was considered nothing extraordinary. He had been, as the old law recommends, twenty years a youth, twenty years a fighter, though he had never carried a weapon in his life, and twenty years head of a household. He had used his wealth and his power for what he knew both to be worth. He had taken honour when it came his way. He had seen men and cities far and near, and men and cities had stood up and honoured him. Now he would let those things go, as a man drops the cloak he no longer needs. Behind him, as he walked through the city gates, an antelope skin and brass-handled crutch under his arm, and a begging bowl of polished brown cocoa de mer in his hand, barefoot, alone, with eyes cast on the ground. Behind him they were firing salutes from the bastions in honour of his happy successor. Poirin Das nodded. All that life was ended, and he bore it no more ill-will or good-will than a man bears to a colourless dream of the night. He was a sunyasi, a houseless, wandering mendicant, depending on his neighbours for his daily bread. And so long as there is a morsel to divide in India, neither priest nor beggar starves. He had never in his life tasted meat, and very seldom eaten even fish. A five-pound note would have covered his personal expenses for food through any one of the many years in which he had been absolute master of millions of money. Even when he was being lionized in London, he had held before him his dream of peace and quiet. The long, white, dusty Indian road, printed all over with bare feet, the incessant, slow-moving traffic, and the sharp, smelling wood smoke curling up under the big trees in the twilight, where the wayfarers sit at their evening meal. When the time came to make that dream true, the Prime Minister took the proper steps, and in three days you might more easily have found a bubble in the trough of the long Atlantic seas than pure and das among the roving, gathering, separating millions of India. At night his antelope skin was spread where the darkness overtook him, sometimes in a sannyasi monastery by the roadside, sometimes by a mud pillar shrine of Kalapir, where the yogis, who are another misty division of holy men, would receive him as they do those who know what castes and divisions are worth, sometimes on the outskirts of a little Hindu village, where the children would steal up with the food their parents had prepared, and sometimes on the pitch of the bare grazing grounds, where the flame of his stick fire waked the drowsy camels. It was all one to Purin Das, or Purin Bhagat, as he called himself now. Earth, people, and food were all one. But unconsciously his feet drew him away north and eastward, from the south to Rotak, from Rotak to Kanul, from Kanul to Ruin Samana, and then upstream along the dried bed of the Guga River, 
that fills only when the rain falls in the hills, till one day he saw the far line of the great Himalayas. Then Purin Bhagat smiled, for he remembered that his mother was of Rajput, Brahman birth, from Kulu way, a hill woman, always homesick for the snows, and that the least touch of hill blood draws a man in the end back to where he belongs. Yonder, said Purin Bhagat, breasting the lower slopes of the Sawaliks, where the cacti stand up like seven branched candlesticks. Yonder, I shall sit down and get knowledge. And the cool wind of the Himalayas whistled about his ears as he trod the road that led to Simla. The last time he had come that way, it had been in state, with a clattering cavalry escort, to visit the gentlest and most affable of viceroys, and the two had talked for an hour together about mutual friends in London, and what the Indian common folk really thought of things. This time Purin Bhagat paid no calls, but leaned on the rail of the mall, watching that glorious view of the plain spread out forty miles below, till the native Mohammedan policeman told him he was obstructing traffic, and Purin Bhagat salaamed irreverently to the law, because he knew the value of it, and was seeking for a law of his own. Then he moved on, and slept that night in an empty hut at Chota Simla, which looks like the very last end of the earth, but that was only the beginning of his journey. He followed the Himalaya-Tibet road, the little ten-foot track that is blasted out of solid rock, or strutted out on timbers over gulfs a thousand feet deep, that dips into warm, wet, shut-in valleys, and climbs out to cross bare, grassy hill-shoulders, where the sun strikes like a burning glass, or turns through dripping, dark forests, where the tree ferns dress the trunks from head to heel, and the pheasant calls to his mate. And he met Tibetan herdsmen, with their dogs and flocks of sheep, each sheep with a little bag of borax on his back, and wandering woodcutters, and cloaked and blanketed llamas from Tibet, coming into India on pilgrimage and envoys of little solitary hill-states, posting furiously on ring street and piebald ponies, or the cavalcade of a rajah paying a visit, or else for a long clear day he would see nothing more than a black bear grunting and rooting below in the valley. When he first started, the roar of the world he had left still rang in his ears, as the roar of a tunnel rings long after the train has passed through. But when he had put the Mutiani Pass behind him, that was all done, and Purin Bhagat was alone with himself, walking, wondering and thinking, his eyes on the ground, and his thoughts with the clouds. One evening, he crossed the highest pass he had met till then. It had been a two days' climb, and came out on a line of snow peaks that banded all the horizon, mountains from fifteen to twenty thousand feet high, looking almost near enough to hit with a stone, though they were fifty or sixty miles away. The pass was crowned with dense dark forest deodar, walnut, wild cherry, wild olive, and wild pear, but mostly deodar, which is the Himalayan cedar and under the shadow of the Deodar stood the deserted shrine to Kali, who is Durga, who is Sitala, who is sometimes worshipped against the smallpox. Poor and Das swept the stone floor clean, smiled at the grinning statue, made himself a little mud fireplace at the back of the shrine, spread his antelope skin on a bed of fresh pine needles, tucked his baragi, his brass-handled crutch, under his armpit, and sat down to rest. Immediately below him, the hillside fell away, clean and cleared for fifteen hundred feet, where a little village of stone-walled houses with roofs of beaten earth clung to the steep tilt. All round it 
the tiny terraced fields lay out like aprons of patchwork on the knees of the mountain, and cows no bigger than beetles graze between the smooth stone circles of the threshing floors. Looking across the valley, the eye was deceived by the size of things, and could not at first realize that what seemed to be low scrub on the opposite mountain flank was in truth a forest of hundred-foot pines. Purum bagats or an eagle swoop across the gigantic hollow, but the great bird dwindled to a dot ere it was halfway over. A few bands of scattered clouds strung up and down the valley, catching on a shoulder of the hills, or rising up and dying out when they were level with the head of the pass. And here I shall find peace, Purun Bhagat said. Now, a hill man makes nothing of a few hundred feet up or down, and as soon as the villagers saw the smoke in the deserted shrine, the village priest climbed up the terraced hillside to welcome the stranger. When he met Purun Bhagat's eyes, the eyes of a man used to control thousands, he bowed to the earth, took the begging bowl without a word, and returned to the village, saying, We have at last a holy man. Never have I seen such a man. He is of the plains, but pale-coloured a Brahmin of the Brahmins. Then all the housewives of the village said, Think you he will stay with us? And each did her best to cook the most savoury meal for the bagat. Hill food is very simple, but with buckwheat and Indian corn and rice and red pepper and little fish out of the stream in the valley and honey from the flu-like hives built in the stone walls and dried apricots and tamarack and wild ginger and bannocks of flour, a devout woman can make good things, and it was a full bowl that the priest carried to the bagat. Was he going to stay? asked the priest. Would he need a kela? A, a, a disciple to beg for him. Had he a blanket against the cold weather? Was the food good? Purun Bhagat ate and thanked the giver. It was in his mind to stay. That was sufficient, said the priest. Let the begging bowl be placed outside the shrine in the hollow made by those two twisted roots, and daily should the Bhagat be fed. For the village felt honoured that such a man, he looked timidly into the Bagat's face, should tarry among them. That day saw the end of poor Anne Bagat's wanderings. He had come to the place appointed for him, the silence and the space. After this time stopped, and he, sitting at the mouth of the shrine, could not tell whether he were alive or dead, a man with control of his limbs, or a part of the hills, and the clouds, and the shifting rain and sunlight. He would repeat a name softly to himself a hundred, hundred times, till at each repetition he seemed to move more and more out of his body, sweeping up to the doors of some tremendous discovery, but just as the door was opening his body would drag him back, and with grief he felt he was locked up again in the flesh and bones of Puron Bagat. Every morning the filled begging bowl was laid silently in the crutch of the roots outside the shrine. Sometimes the priest brought it, sometimes a Ladakhi trader lodging in the village and anxious to get merit trudged up the path, but more often it was the woman who would cook the meal overnight, and she would murmur hardly above her breath, Speak for me before the gods back at, speak for such a one, the wife of such a one. Now and then some bold child would be allowed the honour, and Purin Bagat would hear him drop the bowl and run as fast as his little legs could carry him, but the Bagat never came down to the village. It was laid out like a map at his feet. He could see the evening gatherings held on the circle of the threshing floors, because that was the only level ground. Could see the wonderful, unnamed green of the young rice, the indigo blues of the Indian corn, the dock-like patches of buckwheat, and, in its season, the red bloom of the amaranth, whose tiny seeds, being neither grain nor pulse, make a food that can be lawfully eaten by Hindus in time of fasts. 
when the year turned the roofs of the huts were all little squares of purest gold for it was on the roofs that they laid out their cobs of the corn to dry hiving and harvest rice sowing and husking passed before his eyes all embroidered down there on the many-sided plots of fields and he thought of them all and wondered what they all led to at the long glass even in populated india a man cannot today sit still before the wild things run over him as though he were a rock and in that wilderness very soon the wild things who knew kali's shrine well came back to look at the intruder the langurs the big grey-whiskered monkeys of the himalayas were naturally the first for they are alive with curiosity and when they had upset the begging bowl, and rolled it round the floor, and tried their teeth on the brass-handled crutch, and made faces at the antelope skin, they decided that the human being who sat so still was harmless. At evening they would leap down from the pines, and beg with their hands for things to eat, and then swing off in graceful curbs. They liked the warmth of the fire, too, and huddled round it till Puran Bhagat had to push them aside to throw on more fuel, and in the morning, as often as not, he would find a furry ape sharing his blanket. All day long, one or other of the tribe would sit by his side, staring out at the snows, crooning, and looking unspeakably wise and sorrowful. After the monkeys came the barasing, that big deer, which is like our red deer, but stronger. He wished to rub off the velvet of his horns against the cold stones of Kali's statue, and stamped his feet when he saw the man at the shrine. But Purim Bhagat never moved, and little by little the royal stag edged up and nuzzled his shoulder. Purim Bhagat slid one cool hand along the hot antlers, and the touch soothed the fretted beast, who bowed his head, and Purim Bhagat very softly rubbed and raveled off the velvet. Afterward the barasing brought his doe and fawn, gentle things that mumbled on the holy man's blanket, or would come alone at night, his eyes green in the fire flicker, to take his share of fresh walnuts. At last the musk deer, the shyest and almost the smallest of the deerlets, came too, her big rabbity ears erect, even brindle, silent, Mushik Naba must needs find out what the light in the shrine meant, and drop out her moose-like nose into Puran Bhagat's lap, coming and going with the shadows of the fire. Puran Bhagat called them all my brothers, and his low call of Bai, Bai, would draw them from the forest at noon if they were within earshot. The Himalayan black bear, moody and suspicious Sona, who has the V-shaped white mark under his chin, passed that way more than once, and since the Bhagat showed no fear, Sona showed no anger, but watched him, and came closer, and begged a share of the caresses, and the dole of bread or wild berries. Often, in the still dawns, when the Bagat would climb to the very crest of the pass to watch the red day walking along the peaks of the snows, he would find Sona shuffling and grunting at his heels, thrusting a curious forepaw under fallen trunks and bringing it away with a woof of impatience. Or his early steps would wake Sona, where he lay curled up and the great brute rising erect would think to fight till he heard the Bagat's voice, and knew his best friend. Nearly all hermits and holy men who live apart from the big cities have the reputation of being able to work miracles with the wild things, but all the miracle lies in keeping still, in never making a hasty movement, and for a long time at least in never looking directly at a visitor. The villagers saw the outline of the Barasing, stalking like a shadow through the dark forest behind the shrine, saw the Minol, the Himalayan pheasant, blazing in her best colours before Kali's statue, 
and the langurs on their haunches inside playing with the walnut shells. Some of the children, too, had heard Sonar singing to himself bear fashion behind the fallen rocks, and the Bhagat's reputation as miracle worker stood firm. Yet nothing was farther from his mind than miracles. He believed that all things were one big miracle, and when a man knows that much, he knows something to go upon. He knew for a certainty that there was nothing great and nothing little in this world, and day and night he strove to think out his way into the heart of things, back to the place whence his soul had come. So thinking, his untrimmed hair fell down about his shoulders. The stone slab at the side of the antelope skin was dented into a little hole by the foot of his brass-handled crutch, and the place between the tree trunks where the begging bowl rested day after day sunk and wore into a hollow almost as smooth as the brown shell itself and each beast knew his exact place at the fire the fields changed their colours with the seasons the threshing floors filled and emptied and filled again and again and again and again when winter came the languors frisked among the branches feathered with light snow till the mother monkeys brought their sad-eyed little babies up from the warmer valleys with the spring. There were few changes in the village. The priest was older, and many of the little children who used to come with the begging dish sent their own children now, and when you asked of the villagers how long their holy man had lived in Kali's shrine at the head of the pass, they answered, always. Then came such summer rains, as had not been known in the hills for many seasons. Through three good months the valley was wrapped in cloud and soaking mist, steady, unrelenting downfall, breaking off into thunder shower after thunder shower. Kali's shrine stood above the clouds for the most part, and there was a whole month in which the Bhagat never got a glimpse of his village. It was packed away under a white floor of cloud that swayed and shifted, and rolled on itself and bulged upwards, but never broke from its piers the streaming flanks of the valley all that time he heard nothing but the sound of a million little waters overhead from the trees and underfoot along the ground soaking through the pine needles dripping from the tongues of draggled fern and spouting in newly torn muddy channels down the slopes then the sun came out and drew forth the good incense of the deodars and the rhododendrons and that far-off clean smell which the hill people call the smell of the snows the hot sunshine lasted for a week and then the rains gathered together for their last downpour and the water fell in sheets that flayed off the skin of the ground and leapt back in mud pure and bagat heaped his fire high that night for he was sure his brothers would need warmth. But never a beast came to the shrine, though he called and called till he dropped asleep, wondering what had happened in the woods. It was in the black heart of the night, the rain drumming like a thousand drums, that he was roused by a plucking at his blanket, and stretching out felt the little hand of a langur. It is better here than in the trees, he said, sleepily loosening a folded blanket. Take it and be warm. The monkey caught his hand and pulled hard. Is it food, then? said Purim Bagat. Wait a while, and I will prepare some. As he kneeled to throw fuel on the fire, the langur ran to the door of the shrine, crooned, and ran back again, plucking at the man's knee. What is it? What is thy trouble, brother? said Purim Bagat, for the langur's eyes were full of things that he could not tell. Unless one of thy cast be in a trap, and none set traps here, I will not go into that weather. Look, brother, even the barasin comes for shelter. The deer's antlers clashed as he strode into the shrine, clashed against the grinning statue of Kali. He lowered them in pure and bagat's direction, and stamped uneasily, hissing through his half-shut nostrils. Hi, 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 said the bagat, snapping his fingers. Is this payment for a night's lodging? But the deer pushed him toward the door, and as he did so, Purim Bagat heard the sound of something opening with a sigh. 
and saw two slabs of the floor draw away from each other, while the sticky earth below smacked its lips. Now I see, said Puran Bagat. No blame to my brothers that they did not sit by the fire tonight. The mountain is falling, and yet, why should I go? His eye fell on the empty begging bowl, and his face changed. They have given me good food daily since, since I came. And if I am not swift tomorrow, there will not be one mouth in the valley. Indeed, I must go and warn them below. Back there, brother. Let me get to the fire. The barrassing backed unwillingly, as poor and back at drove a pine torch deep into the flame, twirling it till it was well lit. Ah, ye came to warn me, he said, rising. Better than that we shall do, better than that. Out now, and lend me thy neck, brother, for I have but two feet. He clutched the bristling withers of the barasing with his right hand, held the torch away with his left, and stepped out of the shrine into the desperate night. There was no breath of wind, but the rain nearly drowned the flare as the great deer hurried down the slope, sliding on his haunches. As soon as they were clear of the forest, more of the Bagat's brothers joined them. He heard, though he could not see, the langurs pressing about him, and behind them the hum. <sighs> oh, Sona. The rain matted his long white hair into ropes, the water splashed beneath his bare feet, and his yellow robe clung to his frail old body, but he stepped down steadily, leaning against the barasing. He was no longer a holy man, but Sir Purandas, K.C.I.E., Prime Minister of no small state, a man accustomed to command, going out to save life. Down the steep, plashy path they poured all together, the Bagat and his brothers, down and down, till the deer's feet clicked and stumbled on the wall of a threshing floor. And he snorted, because he smelt man. Now they were at the head of the one crooked village street, and the Bagat beat with his crutch on the barred windows of the blacksmith's house, as his torch blazed up in the shelter of the eaves, up and out. Cried Puran Bagat, and he did not know his own voice, for it was years since he had spoken aloud to a man. The hill fall, the hill is falling up and out, oh, you within. It is our Bagat, said the blacksmith's wife. He stands among his beasts. And gather the little ones and give the call. It ran from house to house while the beasts, cramped in the narrow way, surged and huddled round the bagat, and Sonar puffed impatiently. The people hurried into the street. They were no more than seventy souls, all told, and in the glare of the torches they saw their bagat holding back the terrified barasing, while the monkeys plucked piteously at his skirts and Sonar sat on his haunches and roared. Across the valley and up the next hill, shouted Puran Bagat, leave none behind, we follow. Then the people ran as only hillfolk can run, for they knew that in a landslip you must climb for the highest ground across the valley. They fled, splashing through the little river at the bottom, and panted at the terraced fields on the far side, while the Bagat and his brethren followed. Up and up the opposite mountain they climbed, calling to each other by name the roll-call of the village, and at their heels toiled the big barasing, weighted by the failing strength of Puran Bagat. At last the deer stopped in the shadow of a deep pine wood, five hundred feet up the hillside. His instinct, that had warned him of the coming slide, told him he would be safe here. Poor and Bagat dropped fainting by his side, for the chill of the rain and that fierce climb were killing him. But first he called to the scattered torches ahead, Stay and count your numbers. Then whispering to the deer as he saw the lights gather in a cluster, Stay with me, brother. Stay till I go. There was a sigh in the air that grew to a mutter, and a mutter that grew to a roar, and a roar that passed all sense of hearing, and the hillside on which the villagers stood was hit in the darkness and rocked to the blow. 
then a note as steady deep and true as the deep sea of the organ drowned everything for perhaps five minutes while the very roots of the pines quivered to it it died away and the sound of the rain falling on miles of hard ground and grass changed to the muffled drum of water on soft earth that told its own tale never a villager not even the priest was bold enough to speak to the bagat who had saved their lives they crouched under the pines and waited till the day when it came they looked across the valley and saw that what had been forest and terraced field and track threaded grazing ground was one raw red fan-shaped smear with a few trees flung head down on the scarp that red ran high up the hill of their refuge damming back the little river which had begun to spread into a brick-coloured lake of the village of the road to the shrine of the shrine itself and the forest behind there was no trace for one mile in width and two thousand feet in sheer depth the mountainside had come away bodily planed clean from head to heel and the villagers one by one crept through the wood to pray before their bagat they saw the barasing standing over him who fled when they came near and they heard the langurs wailing in the branches and Sonar moaning up the hill, but their bagat was dead, sitting cross-legged, his back against a tree, his crutch under his armpit, and his face turned to the northeast. The priest said, Behold a miracle after a miracle, for in this very attitude must all sannyasis be buried. Therefore where he now is we will build the temple to our holy man. They built the temple before a year was ended, a little stone and earth shrine, and they called the hill the Bagat's Hill, and they worship there with lights and flowers and offerings to this day. But they do not know that the saint of their worship, as the late Sir Puran Das, K-C-I-E, D-C-I, P-H-D, etc. Once Prime Minister of the Progressive and enlightened state of Mohiniwala, and honorary or corresponding member of more learned and scientific societies than ever will do any good in this world or the next. A Song of Kabir O oh, light was the world that he weighed in his hand O oh, heavy the tale of his fiefs and his land. He has gone from the goody, and put on the shroud, And departed in guise of Baragi avowed. Now the white road to Delhi is mat for his feet, The sal and the kika must guard him from heat. His home is the camp and the waste and the crowd, He is seeking the way. As Baragi avowed, he has looked upon man, and his eyeballs are clear. There was one, there is one, and but one, saith Kabir. The red mist of doing has thinned to a cloud. He has taken the path for Baragi avowed, to learn and discern of his brother the clod of his brother the brute and his brother the god he has gone from the council and put on the shroud can ye hear saith kabir abaragi avowed end of the miracle of puran bagat by rudyard kipling Mrs. Bathurst by Rudyard Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mrs. Bathurst by Rudyard Kipling From Leiden's Irenaeus Act 3, Scene 2 Gow had it been your prince, instead of a groom caught in this noose, there's not an astrologer of the city, prince. Sacked! Sacked! We were a city yesterday, girl. So be it, but I was not governor. Not an astrologer, but would have sworn he'd foreseen it at the last adversary of Venus, when Vulcan caught her with Mars in the house of stinking Capricorn. But since tis Jack of the straw that hangs, the forgetful stars had it not on their tablets. Prince, another life! Were there any left to die? How did the poor fool come by it? Go, simplicity thus. She that damned him to death knew not that she did it, or would have died as she had done it, for she loved him. He that hangs him does so in obedience to the duke, and asks no more than where is the robe. The duke, very exactly, he hath told us, works God's will, in which holy employ he is not to be questioned. We have then leapt upon this finger, only Jack, whose soul now plucks the left sleeve of destiny in hell, to overtake why she clipped him up like a fly on a sunny wall. Woof! So, Prince, your cloak, Ferdinand, I'll sleep now. Ferdinand, sleep then. He too loved his life. Gow, he was born of woman, but at the end threw life from him like your prince for a little sleep. Have I any look of a king, said he, clanking his chain, to be so baited on all sides by fortune that I must e'en die now to live with myself one day longer? I left him railing at fortune and woman's love ferdinand ah woman's love aside who knows not fortune glutted on easy thrones stealing from feasts as rare as coney catch probably in the hedgerows for a clown with that same cruel lustful hand and eye those nails and wedges that one hammer and lead and the very gib of long-stored lightnings loosed yesterday against some king. Mrs. Bathurst The day that I chose to visit HMS Peridot in Simon's Bay was the day that the Admiral had chosen to send her up the coast. She was just steaming out to sea as my train came in, and since the rest of the fleet were either coaling or busy at the rifle ranges a thousand feet up the hill, I found myself stranded, lunchless, on the seafront, with no hope of return to Cape Town before 5 p.m. At this crisis, I had the luck to come across my friend, Inspector Hooper, Cape Government Railways, in command of an engine, and a brake van chalked for repair. "'If you get something to eat,' he said, I'll run you down to Glengariff Sliding till the goods comes along. It's cooler there than here, you see. I got food and drink from the Greeks, who sell all things at a price, and the engine trotted us a couple of miles up the line to a bay of drifted sand and a plank platform half buried in sand, not a hundred yards from the edge of the surf, moulded dunes whiter than any snow, rolled far inland up a brown and purple valley of splintered rocks and dry scrub. A crowd of Malays hauled at a net beside two blue and green boats on the beach. A picnic party danced and shouted barefoot, where a tiny river trickled across the flat, and a circle of dry hills, whose feet were set in sands of silver, locked us in against a seven-coloured sea. At either horn of the bay the railway line, cut just above high-water mark, ran round a shoulder of piled rocks and disappeared. "'You see, there's always a breeze here,' said Hooper, opening the door as the engine leapt us in the siding on the sand, and the strong south-easter buffeting under Elsie's peak dusted sand into our ticky beer. Presently he sat down to a file full of spiked documents. He had returned from a long trip up-country, 
where he had been reporting on damaged rolling stock as far away as Rhodesia. The weight of the bland wind on my eyelids, the song of it under the car roof and high up among the rocks, the drift of fine grains chasing each other musically ashore, the tramp of the surf, the voices of the picnickers, the rustle of Hooper's file, and the presence of the assured sun, joined with the beer to cast me into magical slumber. The hills of False Bay were just dissolving into those of Fairyland, when I heard footsteps on the sand outside, and the clink of our couplings. Stop that! snapped Hooper, without raising his head from his work. It is those dirty little Malay boys, you see. They're always playing with the trucks. Don't be hard on them. The railway's a general refuge in Africa, I replied. It's up country at any rate. That reminds me, he felt in his waistcoat pocket. I've got a curiosity for you from Wankies, beyond Bulawayo. It's more of a souvenir, perhaps, than... The old hotel's inhabited, cried a voice. White men from the language, marines to the front. Come on, Pritch, here's your Belmont. What? The last word dragged like a rope, as Mr. Pycroft ran round to the open door and stood looking up into my face. Behind him, an enormous sergeant of marines trailed a stalk of dried seaweed and dusted the sand nervously from his fingers. What are you doing here? I asked. I thought the hierophant was down the coast. We came in last Tuesday from Tristan to Kuna for overhaul, and we shall be in dockyard hands for two months with boiler seatings. Come and sit down, Hooper put away the file. This is Mr. Hooper of the railway, I exclaimed, as Pycroft turned to haul up the black-moustached sergeant. This is Sergeant Pritchard of the Agoric, an old chipmate, said he. We were strolling on the beach. The monster blushed and nodded. He filled up one side of the van when he sat down. This is my friend, Mr. Pycroft, I added to Hooper, already busy with the extra beer which my prophetic soul had brought from the Greeks. Moi aussi, quoth Pycroft, and drew out beneath his coat a labelled court bottle. Why, it's bass, cried Hooper. It was Pritchard, said Pycroft. They can't resist him. That's not so said Pritchard mildly. Not verbatim, perhaps, but the look in the eye came to the same thing. Where was it? I demanded. Just on beyond here at Calc Bay. She was slapping a rug in a back veranda. Pritch hadn't more than brought his batteries to bear before she stopped indoors and sent it flying over the wall. Pycroft patted the warm bottle. It was all a mistake, said Pritchard. I shouldn't wonder if she mistook me for McLean. We're about of a size. I had heard householders of Muitzenbergs and Jameses and Kalk Bay complain of the difficulty of keeping beer or good servants at the seaside, and I began to see the reason. Nonetheless, it was excellent bass, and I too drank to the health of that large-minded maid. It's the uniform that fetches them, and they fetch it, said Pycroft. My simple navy blue is respectable, but not fascinating. Now Pritch, in his number one rig, is always poor Mary on the terrace. Ex officio, as you might say. She took me for McLean, I tell you, Pritchard insisted. Why, why, to listen to him, you wouldn't think that only yesterday. Pritch, said Pycroft, be warned in time. If we begin telling what we know about each other, we'll be turned out of the pub, not to mention aggravated desertion on several occasions. Never anything more than absence without leaf. I defy you to prove it, said the sergeant hotly. And if it comes to that, how about Vancouver in 87? How about it? Who pull bow in the gig going ashore? Who tell boy Nibbon? Surely you were court-martialed for that, I said. The story of boy Nibbon 
who lured seven or eight able-bodied seamen and marines into the woods of British Columbia, used to be a legend of the fleet. Yeah, we were court-martialed to right, said Pritchard, but we should have been tried for murder. <laughs> Boy Nevin hadn't been unusually tough. He told us he had an uncle who'd give us land to farm. He said he was born at the back of Vancouver Island, and all the time the beggar was a balmy Bernardo orphan. But we believed him, said Pycroft. I did. You did. Patterson did. And who was the marine that married the coconut woman afterwards? Him with the mouth. Oh, Jones, Spit Kid Jones. I haven't thought of him in years, said Pritchard. Yes, Spit Kid believed it, and George Anstey and Moon. Oh, we were very young and very curious, but loving and trustful to a degree, said Pycroft. Remember when he told us to walk in single file for fear of bears? Remember, Pye, when he hopped about in that bog full of ferns and sniffed? and said he could smell the smoke of his uncle's farm and all the time it was a dirty little outlying uninhabited island we walked round in it all day and come back to our boat lying on the beach a whole day boy niven kept us walking in circles looking for his uncle's farm he said his uncle was compelled by the law of the land to give us a farm don't go up pritch we believed said pycroft He'd been reading books. He only did it to get a run ashore and have himself talked of. A day and a night, eight of us, following Boy Niven round an uninhabited island in the Vancouver archipelago. Then the picket gun for us and a nice pack of idiots we looked. What did you get for it? Hooper asked. Heavy thunder with continuous lightning for two hours. Thereafter sleet squalls, a confused sea, and cold unfriendly weather till conclusion of cruise, said Pycroft. It was only what we expected, but what we felt, and I assure you, Mr. Hooper, even a sailor man has a heart to break, was being told that we able seamen and promising marines had misled Boy Niven. Yes, we poor back to the landers were supposed to have misled him. He rounded on us, of course, and got off easy. Set for what we gave him in the steering flat when we came out of cells. Heard anything of him lately, Pye? Signal boatswain in the Channel Fleet, I believe, Mr. L. L. Niven is. And Anstey died of fever in Benin, Pritchard mused. What come to Moon? Spit kid we know about. Moon? Moon, now where did I last? Oh, yes. When I was in the Palladium, I met Quigley. At Bunkrana station, he told me Moon had run when the asteroid sloop was cruising along the South Seas three years back. He always showed signs of being a more monastic beggar. Yeah, he slipped off quietly, and they hadn't time to chase him round the islands, even if the navigating officer had been equal to the job. Wasn't he? said Hooper. Not so. According to Quigley, the Astral spent half her commission romping up the beach like a she turtle, and the other half hatching turtle's eggs on the top of numerous reefs. When she was docked at Sydney, her copper looked like Aunt Maria's washing on the line, and her midship frames was sprung. The commander swore the dockyard had done it all in the poor thing on to the slips. They do do strange things at sea, Mr. Hooper. Ah, uh, I'm not a taxpayer, said Hooper, and opened a fresh bottle. The sergeant seemed to be the one who had a difficulty in dropping subjects. How it all comes back, don't it, he said. Why, Moon must have had sixteen years' service before he ran. Take some all ages, look at... Well, you know, said Pycroft. Who? I asked. A service man within eighteen months of his pension. Is the party you're thinking of, said Pritchard. A Warren Oost name begins with a B, in it. But, in a way of putting it, we can't say that he actually did desert, Pycroft suggested. Oh, no, said Pritchard. It was only permanent absence up country without leaf, that was all. Up country, said Hooper. Did they circulate his description? What for? said Pritchard, most impolitely. Because deserters are like columns in the war. 
They don't move away from the lines, you see. I've known a chap caught at Salisbury that way, trying to get to Nyasa. They tell me, but of course I don't know, that they don't ask questions on the Nyasa Lake Flotilla up there. I've heard of a P&O quartermaster in full command of an armed launch there. Do you think Click had a gone up that way? Pritchard asked. There's no saying. He was sent up to Blomfontein to take over some navy ammunition left in the fort. We know he took it over and saw it into the trucks. Then there was no more click. Then all oh, thereafter. Four months ago it transpired. And thus the Casus Belli stands at present, said Bycroft. What were his marks? said Hooper again. Does the railway get a reward for returning him then? said Pritchard. If I did, do you suppose I'd talk about it? Hooper retorted angrily. You seem so very interested, said Pritchard, with equal crispness. Why was he called Click, I asked, to tide over an uneasy little break in the conversation. The two men were staring at each other very fixedly. Because of an ammunition hoist carrying away, said Pycroft, and he carried away four of his teeth on the lower port side. Wasn't it, Pritch? The substitutes which he brought weren't screwed home in a manner of saying. When he talked fast, they used to lift a little on the bedplate. Hence, click. They called him a superior man, which is what we call a long, black-haired, genteelly speaking half-bred beggar on the lower deck. Four false teeth on the lower left jaw, said Hooper, his hand in his waistcoat pocket. What are two marks? Look here, began Pritchard, half rising. I am sure we are very grateful to you as a gentleman for your hospitality. But perhaps we may have made an error in... I looked at Pycroft for aid. Hooper was crimsoning rapidly. If the fat marine now occupying the forecastle will kindly bring his status quo to an anchor yet once more, we may be able to talk like gentlemen. Not to say friends, said Pycroft. He regards you, Mr. Hooper, as an emissary of the law. I only wish to observe that when a gentleman exhibits such a peculiar, or I should rather say such a blooming curiosity in identification marks as our friend here. Mr. Pritchard, I interposed, I'll take all the responsibility for Mr. Hooper. And you'll apologise all round, said Pycroft. You're a rude little man, Pritch. But how was I? He began wavering. I don't know. And I don't care. Apologise. The giant looked round bewildered and took our little hands into his vast grip one by one. I was wrong, he said meekly as a sheep. My suspicions was unfounded. Mr. Hooper, I apologise. You did quite right to look out for your own end of the line, said Hooper. I'd have done the same with a gentleman I didn't know, you see. If you don't mind, I'd like to hear a little more of your Mr. Vickery. It's safe with me, you see. Why did Vickery run, I began, but Pycroft's smile made me turn my question to who was she? She kept a little hotel at Haraki, near Auckland, said Pycroft. By God, roared Pritchard, slapping his hand on his legs. Not Mrs. Bathurst. Pycroft nodded slowly and the sergeant called all the powers of darkness to witness his bewilderment. So far as I could get at it, Mrs. B. was the lady in question. But Click was married, cried Pritchard. Anne had a fifteen-year-old daughter. He shown me her photograph, setting that aside, so to say. Have you ever found these little things make much difference? Because I am. Good Lord, alive and watching. Mrs. Bathurst. Then, with another roar, You can say what you please, Pye, but you don't make me believe it was any of her fault. She wasn't that. If I was going to say what I please, I begin by calling you a silly ox and work up to the higher pressures at leisure. I am trying to say solely what transpired. Moreover, 
For once, you're right. It wasn't her fault. You couldn't have made me believe it if it had been, was the answer. Such faith in a sergeant of marines interested me greatly. Never mind about that, I cried. Tell me what she was like. She was a widow said Pycroft, left so very young and never re-spliced. She kept a little hotel for warrants and non-coms close to Auckland, and she always wore black silk and a neck. You ask what she was like, Pritchard broke in. Let me give you an instant. I was at Auckland first in 97, at the end of the Marroquins Commission, and as I'd been promoted, I went up with the others. She used to look after us all, and she never lost by it. Not a penny. Pay me now, she'd say, or settle later. I know you won't let me supper. Send the money from home, if you like. Why, gentlemen all, I tell you, I've seen that lady take her own gold watch and chain off her neck in the bar and pass it to a boatswain who'd come ashore without his ticker and had to catch the last boat. Don't know your name, she said, but when you're done with it, you'll find plenty that know me on the front. Send it back by one of them, and it was worth thirty pounds if it was worth half a crown. The little gold watch pie with the blue monogram at the back. But as I was saying, in those days she kept a beer that agreed with me. Slits, it was called. One way and another, I must have punished a good few bottles of it while we was in the bay, coming ashore every night or so. Chapping across the bar light once when we were alone. Mrs. B., I said, when next I call, I want you to remember that this is my particular, just as you're my particular. She'd let you go that far. Just as you're my particular, I said. Oh, thank you, Sergeant Pritchard, she says, and put her hand up to the curl behind her ear. Remember that way she had pie? I think so, said the sailor. Yes. Thank you, Sergeant Pritchard, she says. The least I can do is to mark it for you in case you change your mind. There is no great demand for it in the fleet, she says, but to make sure, I'll put it at the back of the shelf. And she snipped off a piece of her air ribbon with the old dolphin cigar cutter on the bar, remember it, Pie? And she tied a bow round what was left, just four bottles. That was ninety-seven, no, ninety-six. In 98, I was in the Resilient, China Station, full commission. In 1901, mark you, I was in the Carthusian back in Auckland Bay again. Of course, I went up to Mrs. B's with the rest of us to see how things were going. They were the same as ever. Remember the big tree on the pavement by the sidebar pie? I never said anything in special. There was too many of us talking to her, but she saw me at once. That wasn't difficult, I ventured. Ah, but wait, I was coming up to the bar when Ada, she says to her niece, get me Sergeant Pritchard's particular. And gentlemen all, I tell you, before I could shake hands with the lady, there were those four bottles of slits with her air ribbon in a bow round each of their necks set down in front of me, and as she drew the cork, she looked at me under her eyebrows in that blindish way she had a look in, and, Sergeant Pritchard, she says, I do hope you haven't changed your mind about your particulars. That is the kind of woman she was, after five years. I don't see her yet, somehow, said Hooper, but with sympathy. She, she never scrupled to feed a a lame duck or, or set her foot on a scorpion at any time of her life, Pritchard added valiantly. That didn't help me either. My mother's like that, for one. The giant heaved inside his uniform and rolled his eyes at the car roof, said Pycroft suddenly. How many women have you been intimate with all over the world, Pritch? Pritchard blushed plum colour to the short hairs of his seventeen-inch neck. Hundreds, said Pycroft, so have I. How many of them can you remember in your own mind, setting aside the first and perhaps the last, and one more? Few, wonderful few, now I tax myself, said Sergeant Pritchard relievedly. And how many times might you have been at Auckland? One, two, he began. Well, I can't make it more than three times in ten years, but I can remember every time that I ever saw Mrs. B. So can I. 
and I've only been to Auckland twice. How she stood and what she was saying and what she looked like. That's the secret. Didn't beauty, so to speak, nor good talk necessarily. It's just it. Some women will stay in a man's memory if they once walk down a street. But most of them you can live with a month on end and next commission and you'd be put to it to certify whether they talked in their sleep or not, as one might say. Ah, said Hooper, that's more the idea. I've known just two women of that nature. And it was no fault of theirs, asked Pritchard. None whatever, I know that. And if a man gets struck with that kind of woman, Mr. Hooper, Pritchard went on, he goes crazy, or just saves himself, was the slow answer. You've hit it, said the sergeant. You've seen the known something in the course of your life, Mr. Hooper. I'm looking at you, he set down his bottle. And how often had Vickery seen her, I asked. That's the dark and bloody mystery, Pycroft answered. I'd never come across him till I came out in the Hierophant just now, and there wasn't anyone in the ship who knew much about him. You see, he was what you call a superior man. He spoke to me once or twice about Auckland and Mrs. B on the voyage out. I call that to mind subsequently. There must have been a good deal between them, to my way of thinking. Mind you, I'm only giving you my sum of it all, because all I know is second hand, so to speak. Or rather, I should say, more than second hand. How? said Hooper peremptorily. He must have seen it or heard it. Yes, yeah, said Pycroft. I used to think seeing and hearing was the only regulation aids to ascertaining facts, but as we get older, we get more accommodating. The cylinders work easier, I suppose. Were you in Cape Town last December when Phyllis's circus came? No, up country, said Hooper, a little nettled at the change of venue. I asked because they had a new turn of a scientific nature called Omen Friends for a ticky. Oh, you mean the cinematograph, the pictures of prize fights and steamers? I've seen them up country. Biograph or cinematograph was what I was alluding to. London Bridge with the omnibuses, the troop ship going to the war, marines on parade at Portsmouth and the Plymouth Express arriving at Paddington. Seen them all. Seen them all, said Hooper impatiently. We hierophants came in just before Christmas week and leaf was easy. I think a man gets fed up with Cape Town quicker than anywhere else on the station. Why, well, even Durban's more like nature. We was there for Christmas, Pritchard put him. Not being a devotee of Indian peeries, as our doctor said to the pusser, I can't exactly say. Phyllis's was good enough after musketry practice at Mozambique. I couldn't get off the first two or three nights on account of what you might call an imbroglio with our torpedo lieutenant in the submerged flat where some pride of the West Country had sugared up a gyroscope. But I remember Vickery went ashore with our carpenter Rigdon. Old Crocus, we called him. As a general rule, Crocus never left his ship unless and until he was oisted out with a winch. But when he went, he would return nodding like a lily gemmed with dew. We smothered him down below that night, but the things he said about Vickery as a fitting playmate for a warrant officer of his cubic capacity before we got him quiet was what I should call pointed. I've been with Crocus in the redoubtable, said the sergeant. He's a character if there is one. Next night, I went into Cape Town with Dawson and Pratt, but just at the door of the circus I come across Vickery. Oh, he says, you're the man I'm looking for. Come and sit next me, this way to the shilling places. I went astern at once, protesting because ticky seeds better suited my so-called finances. Come on, says Vickery, I'm paying. Naturally, I abandoned Pratt and Dawson in anticipation of drinks to match the seats. No, he says, when this was inted, not now, not now. As many as you please afterward, but I want you sober for the occasion. I caught his face under a lamp just then, and the appearance of it quite cured me of my thirsts. Don't mistake, didn't frighten me, made me anxious. I can't tell you what it was like, but that was the effect which it had on me. If you want to know, it reminded me of those things in bottles in those herbalistic shops at Plymouth, preserved in spirits of wine. White and crumply things, previous to birth, as you might say. You have a bestial mind, Pye, said the sergeant, relighting his pipe. Perhaps. We were in the front row, 
and home and friends come on early. Vickery touched me on the knee when the number went up. If you see anything that strikes you, he says, drop me a hint. Then he went on clicking. We saw London Bridge and so forth and so on, and it was most interesting. I'd never seen it before. You heard a little dynamo like a buzzing. But the pictures were the real thing, alive and moving. I've seen them, said Hooper. Of course, they are taken from the very thing itself, you see. Then the Western Mail came into Paddington on the big magic lantern sheet. First we saw the platform empty and the porter standing by. Then the engine come in, head on, and the woman in the front row jumped. She headed so straight. Then the doors opened and the passengers come out and the porters got the luggage just like life. Only... Only when anyone came down too far to orders that was watching, they walked right out of the picture, so to speak. I was highly interested, I can tell you. So were all of us. I watched an old man with a rug who dropped a book and was trying to pick it up, when quite slowly, from behind two porters, carrying a little reticule and looking from side to side, comes out Mrs. Bathurst. There was no mistake in the walk in a hundred thousand. She come forward, right forward, she looked out straight at us with that blindish look which Pritch alluded to. She walked on and on till she melted out of the picture like, like a shadow jumping over a candle. And as she went, I heard Dawson in the ticky seats behind sing out, Christ, there's Mrs. B. Hooper swallowed his spittle and leaned forward intently. Vickery touched me on the knee again. He was clicking his four false teeth with his jaw down like an enteric at the last kick. Are you sure? says he. Sure, I says. Didn't we Dawson give tongue? Why, it's the woman herself. I was sure before, he says, but I brought you to make sure. Will you come again with me tomorrow? Well, any, I says. It's like meeting old friends. Yes, he says, opening his watch very like. It'll be four and twenty hours, less four minutes before I see her again. Come and have a drink, he says. It may amuse you, but it's no sort of earthly use to me. He went out shaking his head and stumbling over people's feet as if we were drunk already. I anticipated a swift drink and a speedy return, because I wanted to see the performing elephants. Instead of which, Vickery began to navigate the town at the rate of knots, looking in at a bar every three minutes approximate Greenwich time. I'm not a drinking man, though there are those present, he cocked his unforgettable eye at me. You may have seen me more or less imbued with the flagrant spirit. None the less, when I drink... I like to do it at anchor, and not at an average speed of 18 knots on the measured mile. There's a tank, as you might say, at the back of that big hotel up the hill. What do they call it? The Maltino Reservoir, I suggested, and Hooper nodded. That was his limit adrift. We walked there, and we come down through the gardens. There was a southeaster blowing, and we finished up by the docks. Then we bore up the road to Salt River, and wherever there was a pub, Vickery put in sweating. He didn't look at what he drunk. He didn't look at the change. He walked, and he drunk, and he perspired in rivers. I understood why old Crocus had come back in the condition he did, because Pickery and I had two and a half hours of this gypsy manoeuvre, and when we got back to the station, there wasn't a dry atom on or in me. Did he say anything? Pritchard asked. Or well, the sum total of his conversation from 7.45pm to 11.15pm was, Let's have another. Thus the morning and the evening were the first day, as scripture says. To abbreviate a lengthy narrative, I went into Cape Town for five consecutive nights with Master Vickery, and in that time I must have logged about fifty knots over the ground and taken in two gallon of all the worst spirits south the equator. The evolution never varied. Two shilling seats for us two, five minutes of the pictures, and perhaps forty-five seconds of Mrs. B., walking down towards us with that blindish look in her eyes and the reticule in her hand. Then out, walk, and drink till train time. What did you think, said Hooper, his hand fingering his waistcoat pocket? Several things, said Pycroft. To tell you the truth, I am quite done thinking about it yet. Mad. The man was a dumb lunatic. Must have been for months, years perhaps. I know something of maniacs, as every man in the service must. I've been shipmates with a mad skipper and a lunatic number one, but never both together, I thank heaven. I could give you the names of three captains now, who ought to be in an asylum, but you don't find me interfering with the mentally afflicted till they begin to lay about them with rammers and winch handles. Only once I crept up a little into the wind toward Master Vickery. 
I wonder what she's doing in England, I says. Don't it seem to you she's looking for somebody? That was in the gardens again, with the southeaster blowing as we were making our desperate round. She's looking for me, he says, stopping dead under a lamp and clicking. When he wasn't drinking, in which case all his teeth clicked on the glass, he was clicking his four false teeth like a Marconi ticker. Yes. Looking for me, he said, and he went on very softly, and as you might say affectionately, but he went on in future, Mr. Pycroft, I should take it kindly of you if you would confine your remarks to the drink set before you, otherwise, he says, with the best will in the world towards you, I may find myself guilty of murder. Do you understand, he says, perfectly, I says, but would it at all soothe you to know that in such a case the chances of your being killed are precisely equivalent to the chances of me being outed? Why, no, he says. I'm almost afraid that would be a temptation. Then I said, we was right under the lamp by the arch at the end of the gardens where the trams come round. Assuming murder was done, or attempted murder, I put it to you that you'd still be left so badly crippled, as one might say, that your subsequent capture by the police, I mean, to whom you would have to explain, will be largely inevitable. That's better, he says, passing his hands over his forehead. That's much better, because, he says, do you know, as I am now, Pi, I'm not so sure if I could explain anything much. Those were the only particular words I had with him in our walks, as I remember. What walks, said he, but, oh, my soul, what walks. They were chronic said Pye gravely, but I didn't anticipate any danger till the circus left. Then I anticipated that, being deprived of his stimulant, he might react on me, so to say, with a hatchet. Consequently, after the final performance and the ensuing wet walk, I kept myself aloof from my superior officer on board in the execution of his duty, as you might put him. Consequently, I was interested when the sentry informs me, while I was passing on my lawful occasions, that Click had asked to see the captain. As a general rule, warrant officers don't dissipate much of the owner's time, but Click put in an hour and more behind that door. My duties kept me within eyeshot of it. Vickery came out first, and he actually nodded at me and smiled. This knocked me out of the boat, because, having seen his face for five consecutive nights, I didn't anticipate any change there, more than a condenser in hell, so to speak. The owner emerged later. His face didn't read off at all, so I fell back on his cocks. He'd been eight years with him, and knew him better than boat signals. Lampson, that was the cox's name, crossed his bows once or twice at low speeds and dropped down to me, visibly concerned. He's shit. He's caught Marshall face, says Lampson. Someone's going to be on. I've never seen that look but once before when they chucked the gun sights overboard in the fantastic throwing gun sights overboard, Mr. Hooper, is the equivalent for mutiny in these degenerate days. It's done to attract the notice of the authorities and the Western Morning News, generally by a stoker. Naturally, a word went round the lower deck, and we had a private overall of our little consciences, but barring a shirt which a second class stoker said had walked into his bag from the marine's flat by itself, nothing vital transpired. The owner went about flying the signal for attend public execution, so to say, but there was no corpse at the yard arm. He lunched on the beach, and he returned with his regulation arbor routine face about 3 p.m. Thus Lampson lost prestige for raising false alarms. The only person who might have connected the epicycloidal gears correctly was one Pycroft, when he was told that Mr. Vickery would go up country that same evening to take over certain naval ammunition left after the war in Blomfontein Fort. No details was ordered to accompany Master Vickery. He was told off first person singular as a unit by himself. The Marine whistled penetratingly. That's what I thought, said Pycroft. I went ashore with him in the cutter and he asked me to walk through the station. He was clicking audibly but otherwise seemed happy-ish. You might like to know, he says, 
stopping just outside the admiral's front gate, that Phyllis's circus will be performing at Worcester tomorrow night, so I shall see her yet once again. You've been very patient with me, he says. Look here, Vickery, I said. This thing's come to be just as much as I can stand. Consume your own smoke. I don't want to know any more. You, he said, what have you got to complain of? You've only had to watch. I'm it, he says. But that's neither here nor there, he says. I've one thing to say before shaking hands. Remember, he says, we were just by the Admiral's garden gate then. Remember that I'm not a murderer, because my lawful wife died in childbed six weeks after I come out. That much at least I am clear of, he says. Then what have you done that signifies, I said, what is the rest of it? The rest, he says, is silence. And he shook hands and went clicking into Simon's town station. Did he stop to see Mrs. Bathurst at Worcester, I asked. It's not known. He reported at Plompontain, saw the ammunition into the trucks, then he disappeared, went out, deserted, if you care to put it so, within eighteen months of his pension. And if what he said about his wife was true, he was a free man, as he then stood. How do you read it off? Poor devil, said Hooper, to see her that way every night. I wonder what it was. I've made my headache in that direction many a long night. But I swear Mrs. B had no hand in it, said the sergeant, unshaken. No. Whatever the wrong or deceit was, he did it, I am sure of that. I had to look at his face for five consecutive nights. I'm not so fond of navigating about Cape Town with a southeaster blowing these days. I can hear those teeth click, so to say. Ah, those teeth, said Hooper, and his hand went to his waistcoat pocket once more. Permanent things, false teeth are. You read about them in all the murder trials. What do you suppose the captain knew or did? I asked. I never turned my searchlight that way, Pycroft answered unblushingly. We all reflected together and drummed on empty beer bottles as the picnic party sunburned wet and sandy past our door singing the honeysuckle and the bee. Pretty girl under that cap, yeah, said Pycroft. They never circulated his description, said Pritchard. I was asking you before these gentlemen came, said Hooper to me, whether you knew Wankies on the way to the Zambezi, beyond Bulawayo? Would he pass there, trying to get to that late what's-his-name, said Pritchard. Hooper shook his head and went on. There's a curious bit of line there, you see. It runs through solid teak forest, a sort of mahogany, really. Seventy-two miles without a curve. I've had a train derailed there twenty-three times in forty miles. I was up there a month ago, relieving a sick inspector, you see. He told me to look out for a couple of tramps in the teak. Two, Bycroft said. I don't envy that other man. If we got heaps of tramps up there since the war. The inspector told me I'd find them at Mabindwe, waiting to go north. He'd given up some grub and quinine, you see. I went up on a construction train. I looked out for him. I saw them miles ahead along the straight, waiting in the teak. One of them was standing up by the dead end of the siding, and the other was squatting down, looking up at him, you see. What did you do for him? said Pritchard. There wasn't much I could do, except bury him. There'd been a bit of a thunderstorm in the teak, you see, and they were both stone dead and as black as charcoal. That's what they really were, you see, charcoal. They fell to bits when we tried to shift them. The man who was standing up had the false teeth. I saw him shining against the black. Fell to bits, he did too, like his mate squatting down and watching him. Both of them all wet in the rain. Both burnt to charcoal, you see. And that's what made me ask about the marks just now. The false toother was tattooed on the arms and chest. A crown and foul anchor with M.V. above I've seen that, said Pycroft quickly. It was so. But if he was all charcoal-like, said Pritchard, shuddering, you know how writing shows up white on a burned letter? Well, it was like that, you see. We buried him in the teak, and I kept, but he was a friend of you two gentlemen, I see. Mr. Hooper brought his hand away from his waistcoat pocket, empty. 
Pritchard covered his face with his hand for a moment like a child shutting out an ugliness. And to think of her at Uraki, he murmured, with an air ribbon on my beer. Ada, she said to her niece, oh my god! On a summer afternoon, when the honeysuckle blooms, and all nature seems at rest, underneath the bower mint, the perfume of the flower, sat a maiden with the one she loves the best, sang the picnic party, waiting for their train at Glengariff. Well, I don't know how you feel about it, said Pycroft. But having seen his face for five consecutive nights on end, I'm inclined to finish what's left of the beer, and thank God he's dead. End of Mrs. Bathurst by Rudyard Kipling The Fat of the Land by Anzia Yazirska. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Fat of the Land by Anzia Yazirska. In an air shaft so narrow that you could touch the next wall with your bare hands, Hannah Bryna leaned out and knocked on her neighbor's window. "'Can you loan me your wash-boiler for the clothes?' she called. Mrs. Peltz threw up the sash. "'The boiler! What's the matter with yours again? Didn't you tell me you had it fixed already last week?' "'A black ear on him, the rob of the way he fixed it. If you have no luck in this world, then it's better not to live. There I spent out fifteen cents to stop up one hole, and it runs out another.' How I ate out my gall bargaining with him he should let it down to fifteen cents. He wanted yet a quarter. The swindler. Got a new. My bitter heart on him. For every penny he took from me for nothing. You got to watch all those swindlers, or they'll steal the whites out of your eyes, admonished Mrs. Peltz. You should have tried out your boiler before you paid him. Wait a minute till I empty out my dirty clothes in a pillowcase. Then I'll hand it to you. Mrs. Peltz returned with the boiler and tried to hand it across to Hannah Bryna, but the soapbox refrigerator on the window sill was in the way. You got to come in for the boiler yourself, said Mrs. Peltz. Wait only till I tie up my Sammy on the high chair he shouldn't fall on me again. He's so wild that ropes won't hold him. Hannah Bryna tied the child in the chair, stuck a pacifier in his mouth, and went in to her neighbor. As she took the boiler, Mrs. Peltz said, do you know Mrs. Melker ordered fifty pounds of chicken for her daughter's wedding, and such grand chickens shining like gold? My heart melted in me just looking at the flowing fatness of those chickens. Hannah Bryna smacked her thin, dry lips, a hungry gleam in her sunken eyes. Fifty pounds, she gasped. It ain't possible. How do you know? I heard her with my own ears. I saw them with my own eyes, and she said she would chop up the chicken livers with onions and eggs for an appetizer, and then she will buy twenty-five pounds of fish and cook it sweet and sour with raisins, and she said she will bake all her strudels on pure chicken fat. Some people work themselves up in the world, sighed Hannah Bryna, for them is America flowing with milk and honey. In Savo, Mrs. Melker used to get shriveled up with hunger. She and her children used to live on potato peelings and crusts of dry bread picked out from barrels. And in America, she lives to eat chicken and apple strudel soaking in fat. The world is a wheel always turning, philosophized Mrs. Peltz. Those who are high go down low, and those who've been low go up higher. Who will believe me here in America that in Poland I was a cook in a banker's house? I handled ducks and geese every day. I used to bake coffee cake with cream so thick you could cut it with a knife. And do you think I was a nobody in Poland? broke in Hannah Bryna, tears welling in her eyes as the memories of her past rushed over her. But what's the use of talking? In America, money is everything. Who cares who my father or grandfather was in Poland? Without money, 
I'm a living dead one. My head dries out worrying how to get for the children the eating a penny cheaper. Mrs. Peltz wagged her head, a gnawing envy contracting her features. Mrs. Milker had it good from the day she came, she said begrudgingly. Right away she sent all her children to the factory, and she began to cook meat for dinner every day. She and her children have eggs and buttered rolls for breakfast each morning like millionaires. A sudden fall and a baby scream, and the boiler dropped from Hannah Bryna's hands as she rushed into her kitchen, Mrs. Peltz after her. They found the high chair turned on top of the baby. Cavalt save me! Run for a doctor! cried Hannah Bryna as she dragged the child from under the high chair. He's killed! He's killed! My only child! My precious lamb! she shrieked as she ran back and forth with the screaming infant. Mrs. Pelt snatched little Sammy from the mother's hand. Meshugana, what are you running around like a crazy frightening the child? Let me see. Let me tend to him. He ain't killed yet. She hastened to the sink to wash the child's face and discovered a swelling lump on his forehead. Have you a quarter in your house? she asked. Yes, I got one, replied Hannah Bryna, climbing on a chair. I got to keep it on a high shelf where the children can't get it. Mrs. Pelt seized the quarter Hannah Bryna handed down to her. Now pull your left eyelid three times while I'm pressing the quarter and you'll see the swelling go down. Hannah Bryna took the child again in her arms, shaking and cooing over it and caressing it. Ah, Sammy, ah, little lamb, ah, little bird, ah, precious heart. Oh, you saved my life. I thought he was killed, gasped Hannah Bryna, turning to Mrs. Pelt's. Oi, she sighed, a mother's heart, always in fear over her children. The minute anything happens to them, all life goes out of me. I lose my head and I don't know where I am any more. No wonder the child fell, admonished Mrs. Peltz. You should have a red ribbon or red beads on his neck to keep away the evil eye. Wait, I got something in my machine drawer. Mrs. Peltz returned, bringing the boiler and a red string, which she tied around the child's neck while the mother proceeded to fill the boiler. A little later, Hannah Bryna again came into Mrs. Pelt's kitchen, holding Sammy in one arm and in the other an apron full of potatoes. Putting the child down on the floor, she seated herself on the unmade kitchen bed and began to peel the potatoes in her apron. Woe to me, sobbed Hannah Bryna. To my bitter luck, there ain't no end. With all my other troubles, the stove got broke. I lighted the fire to boil the clothes, and it's to get choked with smoke. I paid rent only a week ago, and the agent don't want to fix it. A thunder should strike him. He only comes for the rent, and if anything has to be fixed, then he don't want to hear nothing. Why comes it to me so hard? went on Hannah Bryna, the tears streaming down her cheeks. I can't stand it no more. I came into you for a minute to run away from my troubles. It's only when I sit myself down to peel potatoes or nurse the baby that I take time to draw a breath and beg only for death. Mrs. Peltz, accustomed to Hannah Bryna's bitter outbursts, continued her scrubbing. Oof, exclaimed Hannah Bryna, irritated at her neighbor's silence. What are you tearing up the world with your cleaning? What's the use to clean up when everything gets dirty again? I got to shine up my house for the holidays. You got it so good nothing lays on your mind but to clean your house. Look on this little bloodsucker, said Hannah Bryna, pointing to the wizened child, made prematurely solemn from starvation and neglect. Could anybody keep that brat clean? I wash him one minute, and he's dirty the minute after. Little Sammy grew frightened and began to cry. Shut up, ordered the mother, picking up the child to nurse it again. Can't you see me take a rest for a minute? The hungry child began to cry at the top of its weakened lungs. Nah, nah, you glutton. Hannah Bryna took out a dirty pacifier from her pocket and stuffed it into the baby's mouth. The grave, pasty-faced infant shrank into a panic of fear and chewed the nipple nervously, clinging to it with both his thin little hands. "'For what did I need yet the sixth one?' groaned Hannah Bryna, turning to Mrs. Peltz. "'Wasn't it enough five miles to feed? If I didn't have this child on my neck, I could turn myself around and earn a few cents.' She wrung her hands in a passion of despair. "'Got the new. The earth should only take it before it grows up.' Shh, shh, reproved Mrs. Peltz. Pity yourself on that child. Let it grow up already, so long as it is here. See how frightened it looks on you? Mrs. Peltz took the child in her arms and petted it. What did it done you should hate it so? 
Hannah Bryna pushed Mrs. Peltz away from her. To whom can I open the wounds of my heart, she moaned. Nobody has pity on me. You don't believe me. Nobody believes me until I fall down like a horse in the middle of the street. Oy vey! My life is so black for my eyes. Some mothers get luck. A child gets run over by a car. Some fall from a window. Some burn themselves up with a match. Some get choked with diphtheria. But no death takes mine away. God from the world, stop cursing, admonished Mrs. Peltz. What do you want from the poor children? Is it their fault that their father makes small wages? Why do you let it all out on them? Mrs. Peltz sat down beside Hannah Bryna. Wait until your children get old enough to go to the shop and earn money, she consoled. Push only through those few years while they are yet small. Your sun will begin to shine. You will live on the fat of the land. Then they begin to bring you in the wages each week. Hannah Bryna refused to be comforted. Till they are old enough to go to the shop and earn money, they'll eat the head off my bones, she wailed. If you only knew the fights I got by each meal. Maybe I gave Abe a bigger piece of bread than Fanny. Maybe Fanny got a little more soup in her plate than Jake. Eating is dearer than diamonds. Potatoes went up a cent on a pound, and milk is only for millionaires. And once a week when I buy a little meat for the Sabbath, the butcher weighs it for me like gold, with all the bones in it. When I come to lay the meat out on the plate and divide it up, there ain't nothing to it but bones. Before he used to throw me a piece of fat extra or a piece of lung, but now you've got to pay for everything, even for a bone to the soup. Never mind, you'll yet come out from all your troubles. Just as soon as your children get old enough to get their working papers, the more children you got, the more money you'll have. Why should I fool myself with the false shine of hope? Don't I know it's already my black luck not to have it good in this world? Do you think American children will right away give everything they earn to their mother? I know what is with you the matter, said Mrs. Peltz. You didn't eat yet today. When it is empty in the stomach, the whole world looks black. Come, only let me give you something good to taste in the mouth. That will freshen you up. Mrs. Peltz went to the cupboard and brought out the saucepan of gefilte fish that she had cooked for dinner and placed it on the table in front of Hannah Bryna. Give a taste, my fish, she said, taking one slice on a spoon and handing it to Hannah Bryna with a piece of bread. I wouldn't give it to you on a plate because I just cleaned out my house and I don't want to dirty up my dishes. What am I, a stranger? You should have to serve me on a plate yet, cried Hannah Bryna, snatching the fish in her trembling fingers. Oy, vey, how it melts through all the bones, she exclaimed, brightening as she ate. May it be for good luck to us all, she exulted, waving aloft the last precious bite. Mrs. Peltz was so flattered that she even ladled up a spoonful of gravy. There's a bit of onion and carrot in it, she said, as she handed it to her neighbor. Hannah Bryna sipped the gravy drop by drop like a connoisseur sipping wine. Ah, a taste of that gravy lifts me up to heaven. As she disposed leisurely of the slice of onion and carrot, she relaxed and expanded and even grew jovial. Let us wish all our troubles on the Russian czar. Let him bust with our worries for rent. Let him get shriveled with our hunger for bread. Let his eyes dry out of his head looking for work. Whew! I'm forgetting for everything, she exclaimed, jumping up. It must be eleven or soon twelve, and my children will be right away out of school and fall on me like a pack of wild wolves. I'd better quick run to the market and see what cheaper I can get for a quarter. Because of the lateness of her coming, the stale bread at the nearest bake shop was sold out, and Hannah Bryna had to trudge from shop to shop in search of the usual bargain, and spent nearly an hour to save two cents. In the meantime, the children returned from school and, finding the door locked, climbed through the fire escape and entered the house through the window. Seeing nothing on the table, they rushed to the stove. Abe pulled a steaming potato out of the boiling pot, and so scalded his fingers that the potato fell to the floor, whereupon the three others pounced on it. "'It was my potato,' cried Abe, blowing his burned fingers. While with the other hand and his foot he cuffed and kicked the three who were struggling on the floor— a wild fight ensued, and the potato was smashed under Abe's foot amid shouts and screams. Hannah Bryna on the stairs heard the noise of her famished brood, 
and topped their cries with curses and invectives. They are here already, the savages. They are here already to shorten my life. They have heard you all over the hall in all the houses around. The children, disregarding her words, pounced on her market basket, shouting ravenously, Mama, I'm hungry. What do you got to eat? They tore the bread and herring out of Hannah Brina's basket and devoured it in starved savagery, clamoring for more. Murderers, screamed Hannah Brina, goaded beyond endurance. What are you tearing from me, my flesh? From where should I steal to give you more? Have I already a pot of potatoes and a whole loaf of bread and two herrings, and you swallowed it down in the wink of an eye? I have to have Rockefeller's millions to fill your stomachs. All at once, Hannah Brina became aware that Benny was missing. Hoy, fay, she burst out, wringing her hands in a new wave of woe. Where is Benny? Didn't he come home yet from school? She ran out into the hall, opened the grime-coated window, and looked up and down the street, but Benny was nowhere in sight. Abe, Jake, Fanny, quick, find Benny, entreated Hannah Brina as she rushed back into the kitchen. But the children, anxious to snatch a few minutes of play before the school call, dodged past her and hurried out. With the baby on her arm, Hannah Brina hastened to the kindergarten. Why are you keeping Benny here so long? She shouted at the teacher as she flung open the door. If you had my bitter heart, you would send him home long ago and not wait till I got to come for him. The teacher turned calmly and consulted her record cards. Benny Saffron? He wasn't present this morning. Not here, shrieked Hannah Brina. I pushed him out myself. He should go. The children didn't want to take him, and I had no time. Woe is me. Where is my child? She began pulling her hair and beating her breast as she ran into the street. Mrs. Peltz was busy at a push cart, picking over some spotted apples, when she heard the clamor of an approaching crowd. A block off, she recognized Hannah Brina, her hair disheveled, her clothes awry, running toward her with her yelling baby in her arms, the crowd following. "'Friend mine!' cried Hannah Brina, falling on Mrs. Peltz's neck. "'I lost my Benny, the best child of my children!' tears streaming down her red swollen eyes as she sobbed. Benny, mine heart, Benny, mine life. Oy! Mrs. Peltz took the frightened baby out of the mother's arms. Still yourself a little. See how you're frightening your child. Woe to me. Where is my Benny? Maybe he's killed already by a car. Maybe he fainted away from hunger. He didn't eat nothing all day. God, annoy. pity yourself on me. She lifted her hands full of tragic entreaty. People, my child, get me my child. I'll go crazy out of my head. Get me my child, or I'll take poison before your eyes. Still yourself a little, pleaded Mrs. Peltz. Talk not to me, cried Hannah Brina, wringing her hands. You are having all your children. I lost mine. Every good luck comes to other people. But I didn't live yet to see a good day in my life. Mine only joy, mine Benny, is lost away from me. The crowd followed Hannah Brina as she wailed through the streets, leaning on Mrs. Peltz. By the time she returned to her house, the children were back from school, but seeing that Benny was not there, she chased them out in the street, crying, Out of here, you robbers, gluttons, go find Benny. Hannah Brina crumpled up into a chair in utter prostration. Oy vey, he's lost. Mine life, my little bird, mine only joy. How many nights I spent nursing him when he had the measles, and all that I suffered for weeks and months when he had the whooping cough, how the eyes went out of my head till I learned him how to walk, till I learned him how to talk, and such a smart child, if I lost all the others, it wouldn't tear me so by the heart. She worked herself up into a hysteria, crying and tearing her hair, hitting her head with her knuckles, that at last she fell into a faint. It took some time before Mrs. Peltz, with the aid of neighbors, revived her. Benny, mine angel! she moaned as she opened her eyes. Just then, a policeman came in with the lost Benny. "'Na, na, here you got him already,' said Mrs. Peltz. "'Why did you carry on so for nothing? Why did you tear up the world like a crazy?' The child's face was streaked with tears as he cowered, frightened and forlorn. Hannah Brina sprang toward him, slapping his cheeks, boxing his ears before the neighbors could rescue him from her. "'Woe on your head!' cried the mother. "'Where did you lost yourself? "'Ain't I got enough worries on my head "'than to go around looking for you? "'I didn't have yet a minute's peace "'from that child since he was born.' "'See a crazy mother,' "'remonstrated Mrs. Peltz, "'rescuing Benny from another beating. 
such a mouth with one breath she blesses him when he is lost and with the other breath she curses him when he is found hannah brina took from the window-sill a piece of herring covered with swarming flies and putting it on a slice of dry bread she filled a cup of tea that had been stewing all day and dragged benny over to the table to eat but the child choking with tears was unable to touch the food go eat commanded hannah brina eat and choke yourself eating maybe she won't remember me no more maybe the servant won't let me in thought mrs peltz as she walked by the brownstone house on eighty-fourth street where she had been told hannah brina now lived at last she summoned up enough courage to climb the steps she was all out of breath as she rang the bell with trembling fingers oy vey even the outside smells riches and plenty such curtains and shades on all the windows like by millionaires twenty years ago she used to eat from the pot to the hand and now she lives in such a palace a whiff of steam heated warmth swept over mrs pelts as the door opened and she saw her old friend of the tenements dressed in silk and diamonds like a being from another world mrs pelts is it you cried hannah brina overjoyed at the sight of her former neighbor come right in since when are you back in new york we came last week mumbled mrs pelts as she was led into a richly carpeted reception room make yourself comfortable take off your shawl urged hannah brina but mrs pelts only drew her shawl more tightly around her a keen sense of her poverty gripping her as she gazed abashed by the luxurious wealth that shone from every corner this shawl covers up my rags she said trying to hide her shabby sweater i'll tell you what come right into the kitchen suggested hannah brina the servant is away for this afternoon and we can feel more comfortable there i can breathe like a free person in my kitchen when the girl has her day out mrs pelts glanced around her in an excited daze never in her life had she seen anything so wonderful as a white tiled kitchen with its glistening porcelain sink and the aluminum pots and pans that shone like silver where are you staying now asked hannah brina as she pinned an apron over her silk dress i moved back to delancey street where we used to live replied mrs pelts as she seated herself cautiously in a white enamelled chair oy vey what grand times we had in that old house when we were neighbors sighed hannah brina looking at her old friends with misty eyes you still think on delancey street haven't you more high-class neighbors uptown here a good neighbor's not to be found every day deplored hannah brina uptown here where each lives in his own house nobody cares if the person next door is dying or going crazy from loneliness it ain't anything like we used to have in delancey street when we could walk into one another's rooms without knocking and borrow a pinch of salt or a pot to cook in hannah brina went over to the pantry shelf we are going to have a bite right here on the kitchen table like on delancey street so long there's no servant to watch us we can eat what we please oy how it waters my mouth with appetite the smell of the herring and the onion chuckled mrs pelts sniffing the welcome odors with greedy pleasure hannah brina pulled a dish towel from the rack and threw one end of it to mrs pelts so long there's no servant around we can use it together for a napkin it's dirty anyhow how it freshens up my heart to see you she rejoiced as she poured out her tea into a saucer if you would only know how i used to beg my daughter to write for me a letter to you but these american children what is it to them a mother's feelings what are you talking cried mrs pelts the whole world rings with you and your children everybody is envying you tell me how began your luck you heard how my husband died with consumption replied hannah brina the five hundred dollars lodge money gave me the first lift in life and i opened a little grocery store then my son abe married himself to a girl with a thousand dollars that started him in business and now he has the biggest shirtwaist factory on west twenty-ninth street yes i heard your son had a factory mrs pelts hesitated and stammered i'll tell you the truth what i came to ask you i thought maybe you would beg your son abe if he would give my husband a job why not said hannah brina he keeps more than five hundred hands i'll ask him he should take in mr pelts long years on you hannah brina you'll save my life if you could only help my husband get work of course my son will help him all my children like to do good 
My daughter Fanny is a milliner on Fifth Avenue, and she takes in the poorest girls in her shop, and even pays them sometimes while they learn the trade. Hannah Brina's face lit up, and her chest filled with pride as she enumerated the successes of her children. And my son Benny, he wrote a play on Broadway, and he gave away more than a hundred free tickets for the first night. Benny, the one who used to get lost from home all the time. You always did love that child more than all the rest. And what is Sammy your baby doing? He ain't a baby no longer. He goes to college and quarterbacks the football team. They can't get along without him. And my son Jake, I nearly forgot him. He began collecting rent in Delancey Street, and now he is the boss of renting the swellest apartment houses on Riverside Drive. What did I tell you? In America, children are like money in the bank, purred Mrs. Peltz, as she pinched and patted Hannah Brina's silk sleeve. Ive, how it shines from you. You ought to kiss the air and dance for joy and happiness. It is such a bitter frost outside. A pail of coal is so dear, and you got it so warm with steam heat. I had to pawn my feather bed to have enough for the rent, and you're rolling in money. Yes, I got it good in some ways, but money ain't everything, sighed Hannah Brina. You ain't yet satisfied? But here I got no friends, complained Hannah Brina. Friends, queried Mrs. Peltz. What greater friend is here on earth than the dollar? Oy, Mrs. Peltz, if you could only look into my heart, I'm so choked up. You know they say a cow has a long tongue but can't talk? Hannah Brina shook her head wistfully, and her eyes filmed with inward brooding. My children give me everything from the best. When I was sick, they got me a nurse by day and one by night. They bought me the best wine. If I asked for dove's milk, they would buy it for me, but, but I can't talk myself out in their language. They want to make me over for an American lady, and I'm different. Tears cut their way under her eyelids with a pricking pain as she went on. When I was poor, I was free. I could holler and do what I like in my own house. Here I got to lie still like a mouse under a broom. Between living up to my Fifth Avenue daughter and keeping up with the servants, I'm like a sinner in the next world that is thrown from one hell to another. The doorbell rang, and Hannah Brina jumped up with a start. Oy vey, it must be the servant back already, she exclaimed as she tore off her apron. Oy, let's quickly put the dishes together in a dishpan. If she sees I eat on the kitchen table, she will look on me like the dirt under her feet. Mrs. Pelt seized her shawl in haste. I better run home quick in my rags before your servant sees me. I'll speak to Abe about the job, said Hannah Brina, as she pushed a bill into the hand of Mrs. Peltz, who edged out as the servant entered. I'm having fried potato latkes special for you, Benny, said Hannah Brina, as the children gathered about the table for the family dinner given in honor of Benny's success with his new play. Do you remember how you used to lick the fingers from them? Oh, mother, reproved Fanny. Anyone hearing you would think that we were still in the pushcart district. Stop your nagging, sis, and let Ma alone, commanded Benny, patting his mother's arm affectionately. I'm home only once a month. Let her feed me what she pleases. My stomach is bomb-proof. Do I hear that the president is coming to your place, said Abe, as he stuffed a napkin over his diamond-studded shirt front? Why shouldn't he come, returned Benny. The critics say it's the greatest antidote for the race hatred created by the war. If you want to know, he's coming tonight, and what's more, our box is next to the president's. New no, mama, Sally Jake, did you ever dream in Delancey Street that we should rub shoulders with the president? I always said that Benny had more head than the rest of you, replied the mother. As the laughter died away, Jake went on. Honor, you are getting plenty. But how much Mitsuman does this play bring you? Can I invest any of it in real estate for you? I'm getting 10% royalties of the gross receipts, replied the youthful playwright. How much is that? queried Hannah Brina. Enough to buy up all your fish markets in Delancey Street, laughed Abe in good-natured raillery at his mother. Her son's jest cut like a knife thrust in her heart. She felt her heart ache with the pain that she was shut out from their successes. Each added triumph only widened the gulf, and when she tried to bridge this gulf by asking questions, they only thrust her back upon herself. 
Your fame has even helped me get my hat trade solid with the 400, put in Fanny. You bet I let Mrs. Van Syden know that our box is next to the President's. She said she would drop in to meet you. Of course, she let on to me that she hadn't seen the play yet, though my designer said she saw her there on the opening night. Oh, gosh, the toadies, sneered Benny. Nothing so sickens you with success as the way people who once shoved you off the sidewalk come crawling to you on their stomachs begging you to dine with them. Say that leading man of yours is some class, cried Fanny. That's the man I'm looking for. Will you invite him to supper after the theater? The playwright turned to his mother. Say, Ma, he said, laughing. How would you like a real actor for a son-in-law? She should worry, mocked Sam. She'll be discussing with him the future of the Greek drama. Too bad it doesn't happen to be Warfield, or Mother would give him tips on the auctioneer. Jake turned to his mother with a covert grin. I guess you'd have no objection if Fanny got next to Benny's leading man. He makes at least fifteen hundred a week. That wouldn't be such a bad addition to the family, would it? Again the bantering tone stabbed Hannah Bryna. Everything in her began to tremble and break loose. Why do you ask me? she cried, throwing her napkin into her plate. Do I count for a person in this house? If I'll say something, would you even listen to me? What is it to me, the grandest man that my daughter could pick out? Another enemy in my house. Another person to shame himself from me. She swept in her children in one glance of despairing anguish as she rose from the table. What worth is an old mother to American children? The president is coming tonight to the theater, and none of you asked me to go. Unable to check the rising tears, she fled toward the kitchen and banged the door. They all looked at one another guiltily. Say, sis, Benny called out sharply. What sort of frame-up is this? Haven't you told mother that she was to go with us tonight? Yes, uh, Fanny bit her lips as she fumbled evasively for words. I asked her if she wouldn't mind my taking her some other time. Now you've made a mess of it, fumed Benny. Mother'll be too hurt to go now. Well, I don't care, snapped Fanny. I can't appear with mother in a box at the theater. Can I introduce her to Mrs. Van Syden? And suppose your leading man should ask to meet me. Take your time, sis. He hasn't asked yet, scoffed Benny. The more reason I shouldn't spoil my chances. You know, mother, she'll spill the beans that we come from Delancey Street the minute we introduce her anywhere. Must I always have the black shadow of my past trailing me now? But have you no feelings for mother, admonished Abe? I've tried harder than all of you to do my duty. I've lived with her. She turned angrily upon them. I've borne the shame of mother while you bought her off with a present and a treat here and there. God knows how hard I've tried to civilize her so as not to have to blush with shame when I take her anywhere. I dressed her in the most stylish Paris models, but the Lancy Street sticks out from every inch of her. Whenever she opens her mouth, I'm done for. You fellows had your chance to rise in the world because a man is free to go up as high as he can reach up to. But I, with all my style and pep, can't get a man my equal because a girl is always judged by her mother. They were silenced by her vehemence and unconsciously turned to Benny. I guess we all tried to do our best for mother, said Benny thoughtfully. But wherever there is growth, there is pain and heartbreak. The trouble with us is that the ghetto of the Middle Ages and the children of the 20th century have to live under one roof and a sound of crashing dishes came from the kitchen and the voice of Hannah Bryna resounded through the dining room as she wrecked her pent-up fury on the helpless servant. Oh, my nerves, I can't stand it any more. There will be no girl again for another week, cried Fanny. Oh, let up on the old lady, protested Abe. Since she can't take it out on us any more, what harm is it if she cusses the servants? If you fellows had to chase around employment agencies, you wouldn't see anything funny about it. Why can't we move into a hotel that will do away with the need of servants altogether? I got it better, said Jake, consulting a notebook from his pocket. I have on my list an apartment on Riverside Drive, where there's only a small kitchenette, but we can do away with the cooking, for there is a dining service in the building. The new Riverside apartment to which Hannah Bryna was removed by her socially ambitious children was, for the habitually active mother, an empty desert of enforced idleness. 
Deprived of her kitchen, Hannah Bryna felt robbed of the last reason for her existence. Cooking and marketing and puttering busily with pots and pans gave her an excuse for living and struggling and bearing up with her children. The lonely idleness of Riverside Drive stunned all her senses and arrested all her thoughts. It gave her that choked sense of being cut off from air, from life, from everything warm and human. The cold indifference, the each-for-himself look in the eyes of the people around her were like stinging slaps in the face. Even the children had nothing real or human in them. They were starched and stiffed miniatures of their elders. But the most unendurable part of the stifling life on Riverside Drive was being forced to eat in the public dining room. No matter how hard she tried to learn polite table manners, she always found people staring at her and her daughter rebuking her for eating with the wrong fork or guzzling the soup or staining the cloth. In a fit of rebellion, Hannah Bryna resolved never to go down to the public dining room again, but to make use of the gas stove in the kitchenette to cook her own meals. That very day, she rode down to Delancey Street and purchased a new market basket. For some time, she walked among the haggling pushcart vendors, relaxing and swimming in the warm waves of her old familiar past. A fish peddler held up a large carp in his black, hairy hand and waved it dramatically. Women, women, fourteen cents a pound. He ceased his raucous shouting as he saw Hannah Bryna in her rich attire approach his cart. How much? she asked, pointing to the fattest carp. Fifteen cents, lady, said the peddler, smirking as he raised his price. Swindler, didn't I hear you call fourteen cents? shrieked Hannah Bryna, exultingly, the spirit of the penny chase surging in her blood. Diplomatically, Hannah Bryna turned as if to go, and the fishman seized her basket in frantic fear. I should live. I'm losing money on the fish, lady, whined the peddler. I'll let it down to thirteen cents for you only. Two pounds for a quarter and not a penny more, said Hannah Bryna, thrilling again with the rare sport of bargaining, which had been her chief joy in the good old days of poverty. No, I want to make the first sale for good luck. The peddler threw the fish on the scale. As he wrapped up the fish, Hannah Bryna saw the driven look of worry in his haggard eyes, and when he counted out for her the change from her dollar, she waved it aside. Keep it for your luck, she said, and hurried off to strike a new bargain at a pushcart of onions. Hannah Bryna returned triumphantly with her purchases. The basket under her arm gave forth the old home-like odors of herring and garlic, while the scaly tail of a four-pound carp protruded from its newspaper wrapping. A gilded placard on the door of the apartment house proclaimed that all merchandise must be delivered through the trade entrance in the rear, but Hannah Bryna, with her basket, strode proudly through the marble-paneled hall and rang nonchalantly for the elevator. The uniformed hall man, erect, expressionless, frigid with dignity, stepped forward. "'Just a minute, madam. I'll call the boy to take up your basket for you.' Hannah Bryna, glaring at him, jerked the basket savagely from his hands. "'Mind your own business,' she retorted. "'I'll take it up myself. Do you think you're a Russian policeman to boss me in my own house?' Angry lines appeared on the countenance of the representative of social decorum. It is against the rules, madam, he said stiffly. You should sink into the earth with all your rules and brass buttons. Ain't this America? Ain't this a free country? Can't I take up in my own house what I buy with my own money? cried Hannah Bryna, reveling in the opportunity to shower forth the volley of invectives that had been suppressed in her for the weeks of deadly dignity of Riverside Drive. In the midst of this uproar, Fanny came in with Mrs. Van Syden. Hannah Bryna rushed over to her, crying, This bossy policeman won't let me take up my basket in the elevator. The daughter, unnerved with shame and confusion, took the basket in her white-gloved hand and ordered the hall boy to take it around to the regular delivery entrance. Hannah Bryna was so hurt by her daughter's apparent defense of the hallman's rules that she utterly ignored Mrs. Van Syden's greeting and walked up the seven flights of stairs out of sheer spite. You see the tragedy of my life, broke out Fanny, turning to Mrs. Van Syden. You poor child, you go right up to your dear old lady mother, and I'll come some other time. Instantly, Fanny regretted her words. Mrs. Van Syden's pity only roused her wrath the more against her mother. Breathless from climbing the stairs, 
Hannah Bryna entered the apartment just as Fanny tore the faultless millinery creation from her head and threw it on the floor in a rage. Mother, you are the ruination of my life. You have driven away Mrs. Van Syden as you have driven away all my best friends. What do you think we got this apartment for but to get rid of your fish smells and your brawls with the servants? And here you come with a basket on your arm as if you just landed from steerage. And this afternoon of all times, when Benny is bringing his leading man to tea, when will you ever stop disgracing us? When I'm dead, said Hannah Bryna grimly, when the earth shall cover me up, when you'll be free to go your American way, I'm not going to make myself over for a lady on Riverside Drive. I hate you and all your swell friends. I'll not let myself be choked up here by you or by that hall-boss policeman that is higher in your eyes than your own mother. So that's your thanks for all we've done for you, cried the daughter. All you've done for me, shouted Hannah Bryna. What have you done for me? You hold me like a dog on a chain. It stands in the Talmud. Some children give their mothers dry bread and water and go to heaven for it, and some give their mother roast duck and go to Gehenna because it's not given with love. You want me to love you yet, raged the daughter. You knocked every bit of love out of me when I was yet a kid. All the memories of childhood I have is your everlasting cursing and yelling that we were gluttons. The bell rang sharply, and Hannah Bryna flung open the door. Your groceries, ma'am, said the boy. Hannah Bryna seized the basket from him, and with a vicious fling sent it rolling across the room, strewing its contents over the Persian rugs and inlaid floor. Then, seizing her hat and coat, she stormed out of the apartment and down the stairs. Mr. and Mrs. Peltz sat crouched and shivering over their meager supper when the door opened and Hannah Bryna, in fur coat and plumed hat, charged into the room. "'I come to cry out to you, my bitter heart,' she sobbed. "'Woe is me! It is so black for my eyes!' "'What is the matter with you, Hannah Bryna?' cried Mrs. Peltz in bewildered alarm. I am turned out of my own house by the brass-buttoned policeman that bosses the elevator. Oy, vey, what have I from my life? The whole world rings with my son's play. Even the president came to see it, and I, his mother, have not seen it yet. My heart is dying in me like in a prison, she went on wailing. I am starved out for a piece of real eating. In that swell restaurant is nothing but napkins and forks and lettuce leaves. There are a dozen plates to every bite of food, and it looks so fancy on the plate, but it's nothing but straw in the mouth. I'm starving, but I can't swallow down their American eating. Hannah Bryna said Mrs. Peltz, you are sinning before God. Look on your fur coat. It alone would feed a whole family for a year. I never had yet a piece of fur trimming on a coat, and you are in fur from neck to the feet. I never had yet a piece of feather on a hat, and your hat is all feathers. "'What are you envying me?' protested Hannah Bryna. "'What have I from my fine furs and feathers when my children are strangers to me? "'All the fur coats in the world can't warm up the loneliness inside my heart. "'All the grandest feathers can't hide the bitter shame in my face that my children shame themselves from me?' "'Hannah Bryna suddenly loomed over them like some ancient heroic figure of the Bible condemning unrighteousness.' Why should my children shame themselves from me? From where did they get the stuff to work themselves up in the world? Did they get it from the air? How did they get all their smartness to rise over the people around them? Why don't the children of born American mothers write my Benny's plays? It is I who never had a chance to be a person who gave him the fire in his head. If I would have had a chance to go to school and learn the language, what couldn't I have been? It is I and my mother and my mother's mother and my father and my father's father who had such a black life in Poland. It is our choked thoughts and feelings that are flaming up in my children and making them great in America. And yet they shame themselves from me. For a moment, Mr. and Mrs. Peltz were hypnotized by the sweep of her words. Then Hannah Bryna sank into a chair in utter exhaustion. She began to weep bitterly, her body shaking with sobs. Woe is me! For what did I suffer and hope on my children at bitter old age? My end, I am so lonely. All the dramatic fire seemed to have left her. A spell was broken. They saw the Hannah Bryna of old, ever discontented, ever complaining, even in the midst of riches and plenty. 
Hannah Brynus said Mrs. Peltz. The only trouble with you is that you got it too good. People will tear the eyes out of your head because you're complaining yet. If only I had your fur coat. If only I had your diamonds. I have nothing. You have everything. You are living on the fat of the land. You go right back home and thank God that you don't have my bitter lot. You got to let me stay here with you, insisted Hannah Brina. I'll not go back to my children except when they bury me. When they will see my dead face, they will understand how they killed me. Mrs. Peltz glanced nervously at her husband. They barely had enough covering for their one bed. How could they possibly lodge a visitor? I don't want to take up your bed, said Hannah Brina. I don't care if I have to sleep on the floor or on the chairs, but I'll stay here for the night. Seeing that she was bent on staying, Mr. Peltz prepared to sleep by putting a few chairs next to the trunk, and Hannah Brina was invited to share the rickety bed with Mrs. Peltz. The mattress was full of lumps and hollows. Hannah Brina lay cramped and miserable, unable to stretch out her limbs. For years she had been accustomed to hair mattresses and ample woolen blankets, so that though she covered herself with her fur coat, she was too cold to sleep. But worse than the cold were the creeping things on the wall, and as the lights were turned low, the mice came through the broken plaster and raced across the floor, the foul odors of the kitchen added to the night of horrors. "'Are you going back home?' asked Mrs. Peltz, as Hannah Brina put on her hat and coat the next morning. "'I don't know where I'm going,' she replied as she put a bill into Mrs. Peltz's hand. For hours Hannah Brina walked through the crowded ghetto streets. She realized that she no longer could endure the sordid ugliness of her past, and yet she could not go home to her children. She only felt that she must go on and on. In the afternoon a cold, drizzling rain set in. She was worn out from the sleepless night and hours of tramping. With a piercing pain in her heart, she at last turned back and boarded the subway for Riverside Drive. She had fled from the marble sepulchre of the Riverside apartment to her old home in the ghetto, but now she knew that she could not live there again. She had outgrown her past by the habits of years of physical comforts, and these material comforts that she could no longer do without choked and crushed the life within her. A cold shudder went through Hannah Brina as she approached the apartment house. Peering through the plate glass of the door, she saw the face of the uniformed hall man. For a hesitating moment she remained standing in the drizzling rain, unable to enter, and yet knowing full well that she would have to enter. Then suddenly Hannah Brina began to laugh. She realized that it was the first time she had laughed since her children had become rich. But it was the hard laugh of bitter sorrow. Tears streamed down her furrowed cheeks as she walked slowly up the granite steps. The fat of the land, muttered Hannah Brina with a choking sob, as the hall man with a mobile face deferentially swung open the door, the fat of the land. End of The Fat of the Land by Ansia Yezirska A Defense of the Devil by Ludwig Holberg from the Epistles this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our last conversation was about apologetic or defensive writings, which I confessed I could not endure, partly because an honest man and a good book need no apology, partly because it is possible to write in defense of anything, even of the devil. You laughed at my words, and replied that the latter task might prove somewhat difficult. I retorted that it would be no more difficult than to frame the defense that is made for the ass, wherein this beast is credited with various heroic qualities. In order to show that the thing may be done, I will briefly set forth what an apologist willing to trouble himself in such a cause may find to say in defense of the devil. I will say nothing of his capacity and intelligence, for all, including his greatest enemies, are agreed that a person who bears six thousand years on his shoulders, and who has lived twice as long as the shoemaker of Jerusalem, must possess more learning and wisdom than the seven wise men of greece perhaps more than all the professors on earth if they were made into one 
nor will it be urged that he is falling into the childishness of age a thing that cannot be asserted without medisance since the most learned theologians who have made a thorough study of the man's character and know him to a nicety are quite sure that he is in full vigour so that age cannot have bitten him much if at all similarly the learned men of the last century who had the honour of talking with the shoemaker of jerusalem bore witness that this selfsame shoemaker was still in possession of his five senses so that neither understanding nor memory was at fault although he had wandered about the world for sixteen hundred years there can therefore be no dispute about the understanding and knowledge of the devil which cannot be other than vast when we take his great age into consideration and this is the reason why the norse peasants bestow on him the venerable title of old eric but let us examine the evil characteristics that are ascribed to him the devil is frequently said to go about plunging men into misfortune and leading souls astray but since he has plainly and by manifesto so to speak declared war upon the human race he is more excusable than many men who under the guise of friendship mislead their neighbors who make peaceful compacts only to break them and who call god to witness the uprightness of their hearts that are full of hatred enmity and predatory desire hence it is said that we can guard ourselves against the devil but not against men that he should seek to lead souls astray is nothing more than that he should be desirous of strengthening his power and showing that he is an alert politician statesman and economist in the matter of pacts and contracts his dealings are far more honourable than those of most men for although the latter make agreements straight away to break them and have thus brought themselves into so ill credit that none will contract with them save under the protection of a guarantee experience on the other hand teaches us that the devil fulfils his agreements to the letter performs exactly his promise to the contracting party and seizes upon no one before the stipulated time is out as we may see from the history of dr faustus and other worthy men whom by virtue of executed contracts he has instructed in arts learning and statesmanship or aided with great cash subsidies and demanded no payment for the work until the time of expiry the term and the hour come to hand among all the harsh things that are said of the devil we hear no one accuse him of failing to perform his contracts or even of cheating anybody with false coin or false wares as great numbers of our merchants and writers do the former by giving false names to their wares the latter by attaching false titles to their writings for which they ask payment in advance while the devil for his part carries out his agreements neither giving nor exacting any advance payment for that reason we never hear of any one who has contracted with the devil exacting any guarantee which is indisputable evidence that he keeps his agreements honestly it may be objected to this that the uprightness shown by the devil in his pacts and contracts do not proceed from honesty but from self-interest since therefore he supports himself and entices many to contract with him but do you suppose our so-called upright merchants in all their dealings are honest merely for the sake of being honest may not the rectitude of their conduct spring from the same source it is said that when two things are one they are yet not one for what we call a virtue in the merchant is depicted as a vice in the devil since then the devil has thus come into ill repute we ascribe to his influence adultery murder theft and all evil doings i do not go so far in this matter as wholly to acquit him but i venture to say that the charges ordinarily brought against him have a bad effect and are not well based their effect is bad because they persuade sinners to put their guilt off their own shoulders 
and use the devil as a shield for their misdoings they are ill-based because the corrupt flesh and blood of men are sufficient without any cooperation to drive them into sin further the devil is said to prowl about at night for the disturbance of mankind the conception one is bound to have of a cunning and evil spirit has prevented me from sharing the opinion of the learned in this matter partly because i find the thing improbable unless people admit as no one does that he is in his second childhood and partly because such spooking would oppose his own interests but since i have been blamed for this opinion i have renounced it and now confess with the orthodox that it really is the devil who spooks by night in churchyards houses and nurseries and in that case it follows that people are made god-fearing and that the devil by the practice of spooking shows himself a friend rather than an enemy of mankind so that he should be praised rather than blamed for the habit his function as the judge and executioner of the lost should not be a blot upon his name and good report for that is a necessity and just as no city can dispense with an executioner so mankind in general cannot get along without such a general officer to execute the judgments pronounced upon the guilty the office in itself is not only necessary but even honorable as we may see from the ancient greeks who made two men of importance, Minos and Rhadamanthus, the executioners of Pluto's realm. We see from all these considerations that the devil is not as black as he is painted, that on the contrary he has many good qualities, so that it is far less difficult to defend him than many men upon whose record there is no blot. It is quite to be believed as many unpartisan men have observed that we go too far in such judgments and that if the learned and unpartisan theologian gottfried arnold who was the advocate for many despised person had lived longer he would have undertaken the defence of this notorious spirit which we see is not a task so difficult but that with the help of a good rhetorica it may be given some colour of success that the devil tempts men cannot be disputed but since experience shows that these alleged temptations may often be driven off by means of powders and drops we see that even this accusation is often ill-founded unless one is willing to contend that the devil himself may be driven off by crab's eyes and purgative pills which would be to hold the enemy too cheap see here you have the devil's defense written in haste you may see from it what a skilful disputer might accomplish who should undertake to defend his case ex cathedra or an advocate who had won a reputation for turning evil to good logica and rhetorica are two of the chief sciences it was with the aid of logica that zeno elietes proved that nothing in the world had motion it was by the same aid that Erasmus Montanus distinctly showed Peter Dane to be a cock, and that to beat one's parents is a meritorious act. But to speak seriously, I beg that you will not show this letter to anybody, and particularly not to Herr Niels or Peter Dane, for they might take it all literally and find in it the text for a sermon and it might fare with me as with a certain man who was dubbed cardinal by the jovial papo collegio organized in this town a few years ago after his death a number of letters were found giving him the title of cardinal orsini and this the authorities took literally discussing with their colleagues whether the deceased might be permitted burial in christian earth i remain etc End of A Defense of the Devil from the Epistles by Ludwig Holberg sixteen eighty four to seventeen fifty four translated by William Morton Payne
The Griffin and the Minor Canon by Frank R. Stockton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Over the great door of an old, old church, which stood in a quiet town of a faraway land, there was carved in stone the figure of a large griffin. The old-time sculptor had done his work with great care, but the image he had made was not a pleasant one to look at. It had a large head with enormous open mouth and savage teeth. From its back arose great wings, armed with sharp hooks and prongs. It had stout legs in front, with projecting claws, but there were no legs behind, the body running out into a long and powerful tail, finished up at the end with a barbed point. This tail was coiled up under him, the end sticking up just back of his wings. The sculptor, or the people who had ordered this stone figure, had evidently been very much pleased with it, for little copies of it, also in stone, had been placed here and there along the sides of the church, not very far from the ground, so that people could easily look at them, and ponder on their curious forms. There were a great many other sculptures on the outside of this church, saints martyrs grotesque heads of men beasts and birds as well as those of other creatures which cannot be named because nobody knows exactly what they were but none were so curious and interesting as the great griffin over the door and the little griffins on the sides of the church a long, long distance from the town, in the midst of dreadful wilds scarcely known to man, there dwelt the griffin, whose image had been put up over the church door. In some way or other the old-time sculptor had seen him, and afterward, to the best of his memory, had copied his figure in stone. The griffin had never known this, until hundreds of years afterward, he heard from a bird, from a wild animal, or in some manner which it is not now easy to find out, that there was a likeness of him on the old church in the distant town. Now this griffin had no idea how he looked. He had never seen a mirror, and the streams where he lived were so turbulent and violent that a quiet piece of water which would reflect the image of anything looking into it, could not be found. Being, as far as could be ascertained, the very last of his race, he had never seen another griffin. Therefore it was that, when he heard of this stone image of himself, he became very anxious to know what he looked like, and at last he determined to go to the old church, and see for himself what manner of being he was. So he started off from the dreadful wilds, and flew on and on, until he came to the countries inhabited by men, where his appearance in the air created great consternation. But he alighted nowhere, keeping up a steady flight, until he reached the suburbs of the town, which had his image in its church. Here, Late in the afternoon, he alighted in a green meadow by the side of a brook, and stretched himself on the grass to rest. His great wings were tired, for he had not made such a long flight in a century or more. The news of his coming spread quickly over the town, and the people, frightened nearly out of their wits by the arrival of so extraordinary a visitor, fled into their houses, and shut themselves up. 
The griffin called loudly for someone to come to him, but the more he called, the more afraid the people were to show themselves. At length he saw two labourers hurrying to their home through the fields, and in a terrible voice he commanded them to stop. Not daring to disobey, the men stood trembling. "'What is the matter with you all?' cried the griffin. "'Is there not a man in your town who is brave enough to speak to me?' "'I think,' said one of the labourers, his voice shaking so that his words could hardly be understood, "'that perhaps the, the, the minor cannon would come?' "'Go call him, then,' said the griffin. "'I want to see him.' "'The minor canon, who filled a subordinate position in the old church, "'had just finished the afternoon services, "'and was coming out of a side door with three aged women "'who had formed the weekday congregation. "'He was a young man of a kind disposition, "'and very anxious to do good to the people of the town.' Apart from his duties in the church, where he conducted services every weekday, he visited the sick and the poor, counselled and assisted persons who were in trouble, and taught a school composed entirely of the bad children in the town, with whom nobody else would have anything to do. Whenever the people wanted something difficult done for them, they always went to the minor canon. Thus it was that the labourer thought of the young priest, when he found that someone must come and speak to the griffin. The minor canon had not heard of the strange event, which was known to the whole town except himself and the three old women, and when he was informed of it, and was told that the griffin had asked to see him, he was greatly amazed and frightened. Me, he exclaimed. He has never heard of me. What should he want with me? Oh, you must go instantly, cried the two men. He is very angry now, because she has been kept waiting so long, and nobody knows what may happen if you don't hurry to him. The poor minor canon would rather have had his hand cut off than go out to meet an angry griffin, but he felt that it was his duty to go, for it would be a woeful thing if injury should come to the people of the town because he was not brave enough to obey the summons of the griffin. So, pale and frightened, he started off. Well, said the griffin, as soon as the young man came near, I am glad to see that there is someone who has the courage to come to me. The minor canon did not feel very courageous, but he bowed his head. Is this the town? said the griffin. Where there is a church with a likeness of myself over one of the doors. The minor canon looked at the frightful creature before him, and saw that it was without doubt exactly like the stone image on the church. Yes, he said, you are right. Well then, said the griffin, will you take me to it? I wish very much to see it. The minor canon instantly thought that if the griffin entered the town without the people knowing what he came for some of them would probably be frightened to death and so he sought to gain time to prepare their minds it is growing dark now he said very much afraid as he spoke that his words might enrage the griffin and objects on the front of the church cannot be seen clearly it will be better to wait until morning, if you wish to get a good view of the stone image of yourself. That will suit me very well, said the griffin. I see you are a man of good sense. I am tired, and I will take a nap here, on this soft grass, while I cool my tail in the little stream that runs near me. The end of my tail gets red hot when I am angry or excited, and it is quite warm now. So you may go. 
but be sure and come early to-morrow morning and show me the way to the church the minor canon was glad enough to take his leave and hurried into the town in front of the church he found a great many people assembled to hear his report of his interview with the griffin when they found that he had not come to spread ruin and devastation but simply to see his stony likeness on the church they showed neither relief nor gratification but began to upbraid the minor canon for consenting to conduct the creature into the town what could i do cried the young man if i should not bring him he would come himself and perhaps end by setting fire to the town with his red-hot tail still the people were not satisfied and a great many plans were proposed to prevent the griffin from coming into the town some elderly persons urged that the young men should go out and kill him but the young men scoffed at such a ridiculous idea then some one said that it would be a good thing to destroy the stone image so that the griffin would have no excuse for entering the town and this proposal was received with such favour that many of the people ran for hammers chisels and crowbars with which to tear down and break up the stone griffin but the minor canon resisted this plan with all the strength of his mind and body he assured the people that this action would enrage the griffin beyond measure for it would be impossible to conceal from him that his image had been destroyed during the night but the people were so determined to break up the stone griffin that the minor canon saw that there was nothing for him to do but to stay there and protect it all night he walked up and down in front of the church door keeping away the men who brought ladders by which they might mount to the great stone griffin and knock it to pieces with their hammers and crowbars after many hours the people were obliged to give up their attempts and went home to sleep but the minor canon remained at his post till early morning and then he hurried away to the field where he had left the griffin the monster had just awakened and rising to his forelegs and shaking himself he said that he was ready to go into the town the minor canon therefore walked back the griffin flying slowly through the air at a short distance above the head of his guide not a person was to be seen in the streets and they proceeded directly to the front of the church where the minor canon pointed out the stone griffin the real griffin settled down in the little square before the church and gazed earnestly at his sculptured likeness for a long time he looked at it first he put his head on one side and then he put it on the other then he shut his right eye and gazed with his left after which he shut his left eye and gazed with his right then he moved a little to one side and looked at the image then he moved the other way after a while he said to the minor canon who had been standing by all this time it is it must be an excellent likeness that breadth between the eyes that expanse of forehead those massive jaws i feel that it must resemble me if there is any fault to find with it it is that the neck seems a little stiff but that is nothing it is an admirable likeness admirable the griffin sat looking at his image all the morning and all the afternoon the minor canon had been afraid to go away and leave him and had hoped all through the day that he would soon be satisfied with his inspection and fly away home but by evening the poor young man was utterly exhausted and felt that he must eat and sleep he frankly admitted this fact to the griffin and asked him if he would not like something to eat he said this because he felt obliged in politeness to do so but as soon as he had spoken the words he was seized with dread 
lest the monster should demand half a dozen babies, or some tempting repast of that kind. Oh, no, said the griffin. I never eat between the equinoxes. At the vernal and at the autumnal equinox, I take a good meal, and that lasts me for half a year. I am extremely regular in my habits, and do not think it healthful to eat at odd times. But if you need food, go and get it, and I will return to the soft grass where I slept last night, and take another nap. The next day, the griffin came again to the little square before the church, and remained there until evening, steadfastly regarding the stone griffin over the door. The minor canon came once or twice to look at him, and the griffin seemed very glad to see him, but the young clergyman could not stay, as he had done before, for he had many duties to perform. Nobody went to the church, but the people came to the minor canon's house, and anxiously asked him how long the griffin was going to stay. I do not know, he answered, but I think he will soon be satisfied with regarding his stone likeness, and then he will go away. But the griffin did not go away. Morning after morning he came to the church, but after a time he did not stay there all day. He seemed to have taken a great fancy to the minor canon, and followed him about as he pursued his various avocations. He would wait for him at the side door of the church, for the minor canon held services every day, morning and evening, though nobody came now. If anyone should come, he said to himself, I must be found at my post. When the young man came out, the griffin would accompany him in his visits to the sick and the poor, and would often look into the windows of the schoolhouse, where the minor canon was teaching his unruly scholars. All the other schools were closed, but the parents of the minor canon scholars forced them to go to school, because they were so bad they could not endure them all day at home, griffin or no griffin. But it must be said, they generally behaved very well, when that great monster sat up on his tail and looked in at the schoolroom window. When it was perceived that the griffin showed no sign of going away, all the people who were able to do so left the town. The canons and the higher officers of the church had fled away during the first day of the griffin's visit, leaving behind only the minor canon and some of the men who opened the doors and swept the church. All the citizens who could afford it shut up their houses and travelled to distant parts, and only the working people and the poor were left behind. After some days, these ventured to go about and attend to their business, for if they did not work, they would starve. They were getting a little used to seeing the griffin, and having been told that he did not eat between equinoxes, they did not feel so much afraid of him as before. Day by day, the griffin became more and more attached to the minor canon. He kept near him a great part of the time, and often spent the night in front of the little house, where the young clergyman lived alone. This strange companionship, was often burdensome to the minor canon, but on the other hand, he could not deny that he derived a great deal of benefit and instruction from it. The griffin had lived for hundreds of years, and had seen much, and he told the minor canon many wonderful things. It is like reading an old book, said the young clergyman to himself, but how many books I would have had to read! before I would have found out what the griffin has told me about the earth, the air, the water, about minerals and metals and growing things, and all the wonders of the world. 
Thus the summer went on, and drew towards its close. And now the people of the town began to be very much troubled again. It will not be long, they said, before the autumnal equinox is here, and then that monster will want to eat. He will be dreadfully hungry, for he has taken so much exercise since his last meal. He will devour our children. Without doubt he will eat them all. What is to be done? To this question no one could give an answer, but all agreed that the griffin must not be allowed to remain until the approaching equinox. After talking over the matter a great deal, a crowd of the people went to the minor cannon at the time when the griffin was not with him. It is all your fault, they said, that that monster is among us. You brought him here, and you ought to see that he goes away. It is only on your account that he stays here at all, for although he visits his image every day, he is with you the greater part of the time. If you were not here, he would not stay. It is your duty to go away, and then he will follow you, and we shall be free from the dreadful danger which hangs over us. Go away? cried the minor canon, greatly grieved at being spoken to in such a way. Where shall I go? If I go to some other town, shall I not take this trouble there? Have I a right to do that? No, said the people, you must not go to any other town. There is no town far enough away. You must go to the dreadful wilds where the griffin lives, and then he will follow you and stay there. They did not say whether or not they expected the minor cannon to stay there also, and he did not ask them anything about it. He bowed his head and went into his house to think. The more he thought, the more clear it became to his mind that it was his duty to go away, and thus free the town from the presence of the griffin. That evening he packed a leathern bag full of bread and meat, and early the next morning he set out on his journey to the dreadful wilds. It was a long, weary, and doleful journey, especially after he had gone beyond the habitations of men. But the minor cannon kept on bravely and never faltered. The way was longer than he had expected, and his provisions soon grew so scanty that he was obliged to eat but a little every day. But he kept up his courage and pressed on, and after many days of toilsome travel, he reached the dreadful wilds. When the griffin found that the minor cannon had left the town, he seemed sorry, but showed no disposition to go and look for him. After a few days had passed, he became much annoyed, and asked some of the people why the minor cannon had gone. But although the citizens had been so anxious that the young clergyman should go to the dreadful wilds, thinking that the griffin would immediately follow him, they were now afraid to mention the minor cannon's destination, for the monster seemed angry already, and if he should suspect their trick he would doubtless become very much enraged. So every one said he did not know, and the griffin wandered about disconsolate. One morning he looked into the minor cannon's schoolhouse, which was always empty now, and thought that it was a shame that everything should suffer on account of the young man's absence. It does not matter so much about the church, he said, for nobody went there. But it is a pity about the school. I think I will teach it myself until he returns. It was the hour for opening the school, and the griffin went inside and pulled the rope which rang the school bell. Some of the children who heard the bell ran in to see what was the matter, supposing it to be a joke of one of their companions. But when they saw the griffin, they stood astonished and scared. "'Go tell the other scholars,' said the monster, "'that school is about to open, 
and that if they are not all here in ten minutes, I shall come after them. In seven minutes, every scholar was in place. Never was seen such an orderly school. Not a boy or girl moved or uttered a whisper. The griffin climbed into the master's seat, his wide wings spread on each side of him, because he could not lean back in his chair while they stuck out behind, and his great tail coiled around in front of the desk the barbed end sticking up, ready to tap any boy or girl who might misbehave. The griffin now addressed the scholars, telling them that he intended to teach them while their master was away. In speaking, he endeavoured to imitate as far as possible the mild and gentle tones of the minor canon but it must be admitted that in this he was not very successful. He had paid a good deal of attention to the studies of the school, and he determined not to attempt to teach them anything new, but to review them in what they had been studying. So he called up the various classes, and questioned them upon their previous lessons. The children <laughs> racked their brains to remember what they had learned. They were so afraid of the griffin's displeasure that they recited as they had never recited before. One of the boys, far down in his class, answered so well that the griffin was astonished. "'I should think you would be at the head,' said he. I am sure you have never been in the habit of reciting so well. Why is this? Because I did not choose to take the trouble, said the boy trembling in his boots. He felt obliged to speak the truth, for all the children thought that the great eyes of the griffin could see right through them, and that he would know when they told a falsehood. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, said the griffin. Go down to the very tail of the class, and if you are not at the head in two days, I shall know the reason why. The next afternoon, this boy was number one. It was astonishing how much these children now learned of what they had been studying. It was as if they had been educated over again. The griffin used no severity toward them, but there was a look about him, which made them unwilling to go to bed, until they were sure they knew their lessons for the next day. The griffin now thought that he ought to visit the sick and the poor, and he began to go about the town for this purpose. The effect upon the sick was miraculous. All except those who were very ill indeed jumped from their beds when they heard he was coming, and declared themselves quite well. To those who could not get up, he gave herbs and roots, which none of them had ever before thought of as medicines, but which the griffin had seen used in various parts of the world, and most of them recovered. But for all that, they afterwards said that no matter what happened to them, they hoped that they should never again have such a doctor coming to their bedsides, feeling their pulses, and looking at their tongues. As for the poor, they seemed to have utterly disappeared. All those who had depended upon charity for their daily bread were now at work in some way or other, uh, many of them offering to do odd jobs for their neighbours just for the sake of their meals, a thing which before had been seldom heard of in the town. The griffin could find no one who needed his assistance. The summer had now passed, and the autumnal equinox was rapidly approaching. The citizens were in a state of great alarm and anxiety. The griffin showed no signs of going away, but seemed to have settled himself permanently among them. In a short time, the day for his semi-annual meal would arrive, and then what would happen? The monster would certainly be very hungry, and would devour all their children. Now they greatly regretted and lamented 
that they had sent away the minor canon. He was the only one on whom they could have depended in this trouble, for he could talk freely with the griffin, and so find out what could be done. But it would not do to be inactive. Some step must be taken immediately. A meeting of the citizens was called, and two old men were appointed to go and talk to the griffin. They were instructed to offer to prepare a splendid dinner for him on Equinox Day, one which would entirely satisfy his hunger. They would offer him the fattest mutton, the most tender beef, fish and game of various sorts, and anything of the kind that he might fancy. If none of these suited, they were to mention that there was an orphan asylum in the next town. Anything would be better, said the citizens, than to have our dear children devoured. The old men went to the griffin, but their propositions were not received with favour. From what I have seen of the people of this town, said the monster, I do not think I could relish anything which was prepared by them. They appear to be all cowards, and therefore mean and selfish. As for eating one of them, old or young, I could not think of it for a moment. In fact, there was only one creature in the whole place for whom I could have had any appetite, and that is the minor canon, who has gone away. He was brave and good and honest, and I think I should have relished him. Ah, said one of the old men very politely, in that case I wish we had not sent him to the dreadful wilds. <coughs> cried the griffin. What do you mean? Explain in instantly what you are talking about the old man terribly frightened at what he had said was obliged to tell how the minor cannon had been sent away by the people in the hope that the griffin might be induced to follow him when the monster heard this he became furiously angry he dashed away from the old man, and, spreading his wings, flew backward and forward over the town. He was so much excited that his tail became red-hot, and glowed like a meteor against the evening sky. When at last he settled down in the little field where he usually rested, and thrust his tail into the brook, the steam arose like a cloud, and the water of the stream ran hot through the town. The citizens were greatly frightened, and bitterly blamed the old man for telling about the minor cannon. It is plain, they said, that the griffin intended at last to go and look for him, and we should have been saved. Now who can tell what misery you have brought upon us? The griffin did not remain long in the little field. As soon as his tail was cool, he flew to the town hall and rang the bell. The citizens knew that they were expected to come there, and although they were afraid to go, they were still more afraid to stay away, and they crowded into the hall. The griffin was on the platform at one end, flapping his wings and walking up and down, and the end of his tail was still so warm that it slightly scorched the boards as he dragged it after him. When everybody who was able to come was there, the griffin stood still and addressed the meeting. 
I have had a contemptible opinion of you, he said, ever since I discovered what cowards you are, but I had no idea that you were so ungrateful, selfish, and cruel as I now find you to be. Here was your minor canon, who laboured day and night for your good, and thought of nothing else but how he might benefit you and make you happy. And as soon as you imagine yourselves threatened with a danger, for well I know you are dreadfully afraid of me. You send him off, caring not whether he returns or perishes, hoping thereby to save yourselves. Now, I had conceived a great liking for that young man, and had intended in a day or two to go and look him up. But I have changed my mind about him. I shall go and find him, but I shall send him back here to live among you, and I intend that he shall enjoy the reward of his labour and his sacrifices. Go, some of you, to the officers of the church, who so cowardly ran away when I first came here, and tell them never to return to this town under penalty of death. And if, when your minor canon comes back to you, you do not bow yourselves before him, put him in the highest place among you, and serve and honour him all his life, beware of my terrible vengeance! There were only two good things in this town, the minor canon and the stone image of myself, over your church door. One of these you have sent away, and the other I shall carry away myself. With these words he dismissed the meeting, and it was time, for the end of his tale had become so hot that there was danger of its setting fire to the building. The next morning the griffin came to the church, and tearing the stone image of himself from its fastings over the great door, he grasped it with his powerful forelegs, and flew up into the air. Then, after hovering over the town for a moment, he gave his tail an angry shake, and took up his flight to the dreadful wilds. When he reached this desolate region, he set the stone griffin upon a ledge of a rock, which rose in front of the dismal cave he called his home. There the image occupied a position as somewhat similar to that it had had over the church door, and the griffin, panting with the exertion of carrying such an enormous load to so great a distance, lay down upon the ground, and regarded it with much satisfaction. When he felt somewhat rested, he went to look for the minor cannon. He found the young man, weak and half-starved, lying under the shadow of a rock. After picking him up and carrying him to his cave, the griffin flew away to a distant marsh, where he procured some roots and herbs, which he well knew were strengthening and beneficial to man, though he had never tasted them himself. After eating these, the minor canon was greatly revived, and sat up and listened, while the griffin told him what had happened in the town. Do you know, 
said the monster, when he had finished, that I have had, and still have, a great liking for you. I am very glad to hear it, said the minor canon, with his usual politeness. I am not at all sure that you would be, said the griffin, if you thoroughly understood the state of the case. But we will not consider that now. If some things were different, other things would be otherwise. I have been so enraged by discovering the manner in which you have been treated, that I have determined that you shall at last enjoy the rewards and honours to which you are entitled. Lie down and have a good sleep, and then I will take you back to the town. As he heard these words, a look of trouble came over the young man's face. You need not give yourself any anxiety, said the griffin, about my return to the town. I shall not remain there. Now that I have that admirable likeness of myself in front of my cave, where I can sit at my leisure and gaze upon its noble features and magnificent proportions. I have no wish to see that abode of cowardly and selfish people. The minor canon relieved from his fears, lay back, and dropped into a doze, and when he was sound asleep, the griffin took him up and carried him back to the town. He arrived just before daybreak, and putting the young man gently on the grass in the little field, where he himself used to rest, the monster, without having been seen by any of the people, flew back to his home. When the minor canon made his appearance in the morning among the citizens, the enthusiasm and cordiality with which he was received were truly wonderful. He was taken to a house which had been occupied by one of the banished high officers of the place, and every one was anxious to do all that could be done for his health and comfort. The people crowded into the church when he held services, so that the three old women who used to be his weekday congregation could not get to the best seats, which they had always been in the habit of taking and the parents of the bad children determined to reform them at home, in order that he might be spared the trouble of keeping up his former school. The minor canon was appointed to the highest office of the old church, and before he died, he became a bishop. During the first years, after his return from the dreadful wilds, the people of the town looked up to him, as a man to whom they were bound to do honour and reverence. But they often, also, looked up to the sky, to see if there were any signs of the griffin coming back. However, in the course of time, they learned to honour and reverence their former minor canon, without the fear of being punished, if they did not do so. But they need never have been afraid of the griffin, the autumnal equinox day came round, and the monster ate nothing. If he could not have the minor cannon, he did not care for anything. So lying down, with his eyes fixed upon the great stone griffin, he gradually declined and died. It was a good thing for some of the people of the town that they did not know this. If you should ever visit the old town, you would still see the little griffins on the sides of the church. But the great stone griffin 
that was over the door is gone. End of the Griffin and the Minor Canon by Frank R. Stockton Lessing's Fables by Gotthold Ephraim Lessing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ape and the Fox. Name to me an animal, though never so skillful, that I cannot imitate. So bragged the ape to the fox. But the fox replied, and do thou name me an animal so humble as to think of imitating thee? Writers of my country, need I explain myself more fully? The Eagle and the Fox Be not so proud of thy flight, said the fox to the eagle. Thou mountest so high into the air for no other purpose but to look farther about thee for carrion so have i known men who became deep-thinking philosophers not from love of truth but for the sake of lucrative offices of instruction the swallow believe me my friends the great world is not for the philosopher is not for the poet their real value is not appreciated there and often alas they are weak enough to exchange it for a far inferior one in the earliest times the swallow was as tuneful and melodious a bird as the nightingale but she soon grew tired of living in the solitary bushes heard and admired by no one but the industrious countryman and the innocent shepherdess she forsook her humbler friend and moved into the city what followed because the people of the city had no time to listen to her diving song she gradually forgot it and learned instead thereof to build the peacocks and the crow a vain crow adorned herself with the feathers of the richly tinted peacocks which they had shed and when she thought herself sufficiently tricked out mixed boldly with these splendid birds of juno she was recognized and quickly the peacocks fell upon her with sharp bills to pluck from her the lying bravery cease now she cried at length you have your own again but the peacocks who had observed some of the crow's own shining wing feathers replied be still miserable fool these too cannot be yours and they continued to peck end of lessing's fables by gothold ephraim lessing Three Fables by Lessing by Gothold Ephraim Lessing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wasps. Corruption had befallen the noble structure of a war horse, which had been shot beneath his rider ever-working nature employs the runes of one being for the life of another and so a swarm of young wasps arose from the carrion oh cried the wasps how divine is our origin the magnificent horse the favorite of neptune is our progenitor the observant fabulist heard this strange boast and it reminded him of the modern italians whose conceit it is that they are nothing less than descendants of the old immortal romans because they were born among their graves the wolf on his deathbed the wolf lay at the last gasp and cast a searching look on his past life it is true i am a sinner he said but i trust not one of the worst I have been guilty of some wrong acts, but I have also done many good ones. I remember how once a bleeding lamb that had strayed from the flock came so near to me that I might have throttled it, but I did not harm it. At the same time I heard with the most astonishing indifference the mocking taunts of the sheep 
although I had nothing to fear from the protecting dogs. I can testify to all that, said his friend the fox, who was helping him prepare for death. I remember all the circumstances of the case. It was when you were choking so horribly on that bone which afterward the good-natured crane extracted from your throat. The Blind Hen A hen which had become blind, being accustomed to scratch for food, continued the operation after the loss of her sight. What did it avail, the industrious fool? Another hen, who had the use of her eyes, and wished to spare her tender feet, kept close to her side and had all the benefit of the scratching. As often as the blind hen turned up a corn, the seeing one devoured it. The industrious German collects the materials which the witty Frenchman uses. End of Three Fables by Lessing By Guthold Ephraim Lessing The Waif Woman a cue from a saga by robert louis stevenson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this is a tale of iceland the isle of stories and of a thing that befell in the year of the coming there of Christianity. In the spring of that year a ship sailed from the South Isles to traffic, and fell becalmed inside Snowfellness. The winds had speeded her, she was the first comer of the year, and the fishers drew alongside to hear the news of the South, and eager folk put out in boats to see the merchandise and make prices. From the doors of the hall on Frodus water the housefolk saw the ship becalmed, and the boats about her coming and going, and the merchants from the ship could see the smoke go up, and the men and women trooping to their meals in the hall. The good man of that house was called Finwood Keelfarer, and his wife, Aud, the light-minded. And they had a son, Eil, a likely boy, and a daughter, Asdis, a slip of a maid. Finwood was well-to-do in his affairs. He kept open house and had good friends. But Aud, his wife, was not so much considered. Her mind was set on trifles, on bright clothing, and the admiration of men and the envy of women, and it was thought she was not always so circumspect in her bearing as she might have been, but nothing to hurt. On the evening of the second day men came to the house from sea. They told of the merchandise in the ship, which was well enough and to be had at easy rates and of a waif-woman that sailed in her no one could tell why, and her chests of clothes beyond comparison, fine-coloured stuffs, finely woven, the best that ever came into that island, in gewgaws for a queen. At the hearing of that, Aud's eyes began to glisten. She went early to bed, and the day was not yet red, before she was on the beach, had a boat launched, and was pulling to the ship. By the way she looked closely at all boats, but there was no woman in any, and at that she was better pleased, for she had no fear of the men. When they came to the ship, boats were there already, and the merchants on the shore folk sat, and jested and chaffered in the stern. But in the forepart of the ship, the woman sat alone and looked before her sourly at the sea. They called her Thorgunna. She was as tall as a man and high in flesh, a buxom wife to look at. Her hair was of the dark red, time had not changed it. Her face was dark, the cheeks full, and the brow smooth. Some of the merchants told that she was sixty years of age, and others laughed and said she was but forty. But they spoke of her in whispers, for they seemed to think that she was ill to deal with, 
and not more than ordinary canny. Aud went to where she sat, and made her welcome to Iceland. Thorgunna did the honours of the ship. So for a while they carried it on, praising and watching each other in the way of women. But Aud was a little vessel to contain a great longing, and presently the cry of her heart came out of her. The folk say, says she, you have the finest women's things that ever came to Iceland. And as she spoke her eyes grew big. It would be strange if I had not, quoth Thorgunna. Queens have no finer. So Aud begged that she might see them. Thorgunna looked on her askance. Truly, said she, the things are for no use but to be shown. So she fetched a chest and opened it. Here was a cloak of the rare scarlet laid upon with silver beautiful beyond belief. Hard by was a silver brooch, a basket work that was wrought as fine as any shell, and was as broad as the face of the full moon. And Aud saw the clothes lying folded in the chest of all the colours of the day, and fire and precious gems, and her heart burned with envy. So, because she had so huge a mind to buy, she began to make light of the merchandise. They are good enough things, says she, though I have better in my chest at home. It is a good enough cloak, and I am in need of a new cloak. At that she fingered the scarlet, and the touch of the fine stuff went to her mind like singing. Come, says she, if it were only for your civility in showing it, what will you have for your cloak? Woman, said Thorgunna. I am no merchant. And she closed the chest and locked it like one angry. Then Aud fell to protesting and caressing her. That was Aud's practice, for she thought if she hugged and kissed a person, none could say her nay. Next she went to flattery, said she knew the things were too noble for the like of her. They were made for a stately, beautiful woman like Thorgunna. And at that she kissed her again, and Thorgunna seemed a little pleased. And now Aud pled poverty and begged for the cloak and a gift and now she vaunted the wealth of her good man and offered ounces and ounces of fine silver the price of three men's lives thorgunna smiled but it was a grim smile and still she shook her head at last aud wrought herself into extremity and wept i would give my soul for it she cried fool said thorgunna but there have been fools before you and a little after she said this let us be dumb with beseeching the things are mine i was a fool to show you them but where is their use unless we show them mine they are and mine they shall be till i die i have paid for them dear enough said she Aud saw it was of no avail, so she dried her tears, and asked Thorgunna about her voyage, and made believe to listen while she plotted in her little mind. Thorgunna, she asked presently, do you count kin with any folk in Iceland? I count kin with none, replied Thorgunna. My kin is of the greatest, but I have not been always lucky so I say the less. So that you have no house to pass the time in, till the ship return, cries our dear Thorgunna, you must come and live with us. My good man is rich, his hand and his house are open, and I will cherish you like a daughter. At that Thorgunna smiled on the one side but her soul laughed within her at the woman's shallowness. I will pay her for that word, daughter, she thought, and she smiled again. I will live with you gladly, says she, 
for your house has a good name, and I have seen the smoke of your kitchen from the ship. But one thing you shall understand, I make no presents, I give nothing where I go, not a rag and not an ounce. Where I stay I work for my upkeep, and as I am strong as a man and hardy as an ox, they that have had the keeping of me were the better pleased. It was a hard job for Aud to keep her countenance, for she was like to have wept and yet she felt it would be unseemly to eat her invitation, and like a shallow woman, and one that had always led her husband by the nose, she told herself she would find some means to cajole Thorgana, and come by her purpose after all. So she put a good face on the thing, had Thorgana into the house, her and her two great chests, and brought her home with her to the hall by the beach. All the way in she made much of the wife, and when they were arrived gave her a locked bed-place in the hall, where was a bed, a table, and a stool, and space for the two chests. "'This shall be yours while you stay here,' said Aud, and she attended on her guest. Now Thorgunna opened the second chest, and took out her bedding, sheets of english linen the like of it never seen a cover of quilted silk and curtains of purple wrought with silver at the sight of these aud was like one distracted greed blinded her mind the cry rose strong in her throat it must out what will you sell your bedding for she cried and her cheek were hot. Thorgunna looked upon her with a dusky countenance. Truly you are a courteous hostess, said she, but I will not sleep on straw for your amusement. At that Aud's two ears grew hot as her cheeks, and she took Thorgunna at her word, and left her from that time in peace. The woman was as good as her spoken word. Inside the house and out she wrought like three, and all that she put her hand to was well done. When she milked, the cows yielded beyond custom. When she made hay, it was always dry weather. When she took her turn at the cooking, the folk licked their spoons. Her manners, when she pleased, were outside imitation like one that had sat with kings in their high buildings. It seemed she was pious, too, and the day never passed, but she was in the church there praying. The rest was not so well. She was of few words, and never one about her kin and fortunes. Gloom sat on her brow, and she was ill to cross. Behind her back they gave her the name of the waif-woman, or the wind-wife, to her face it must always be Thorgunna, and if any of the young men called her mother, she would speak no more that day, but sit apart in the hall and mutter with her lips. "'This is a queer piece of goods that we have gotten,' says Finwood Keelfarer. "'I wish we get no harm by her, but the good wife's pleasure must be done,' said he which was his common word. When she was at work, Thorgana wore the rudest of plain clothes, though ever clean as a cat. But at night in the hall she was more dainty, for she loved to be admired. No doubt she made herself look well, and many thought she was a comely woman still and to those she was always favourable and full of pleasant speech. But the more that some pleased her, it was thought by good judges that they pleased out the less. When midsummer was past, a company of young men upon a journey came to the house by Frodis Water. That was always a great day for Aud when there were gallants at table. And what made this day the greater, Alf of the Fells was in the company, 
and she thought Alf fancied her. So, be sure, Oud wore her best. But when Thorgunna came from the bed-place, she was arrayed like any queen, and the broad brooch was in her bosom. All night in the hall these women strove with each other, and the little maid Asdis looked on and was ashamed, and knew not why. But Thorgunna pleased beyond all. She told of strange things that had befallen in the world. When she pleased, she had the cue to laughter. She sang, and her voice was full, and her songs knew in that island. And whenever she turned, the eyes shone in her face, and the brooch glittered at her bosom so that the young men forgot the word of the merchants as to the woman's age and their looks followed her all night oud was sick with envy sleep fled her her husband slept but she sat upright beside him in the bed and gnawed her fingers now she began to hate thorgunna and the glittering of the great brooch stood before her in the dark sure she thought it must be the glamour of that brooch she is not so fair as i she is as old as the dead in the hillside and as for her wit and her songs it is little i think of them up she got at that took a light from the embers and came to her guest's bed-place the door was locked but Oud had a master key and could go in. Inside the chests were open, and in the top of one the light of her taper shone upon the glittering of the brooch. As a dog snatches food, she snatched it, and turned to the bed. Thorgunna lay on her side. It was to be thought she slept, but she talked the while to herself, and her lips moved. It seemed her years returned to her in slumber, for her face was grey and her brow knotted, and the open eyes of her stared in the eyes of Aud. The heart of the foolish woman died in her bosom, but her greed was the stronger, and she fled with that which she had stolen. When she was back in bed, the word of Thorgunna came to her mind that these things were for no use but to be shown. Here she had the brooch and the shame of it, and might not wear it. So all night she quaked with the fear of discovery, and wept tears of rage, that she should have sinned in vain. Day came, and Aud must rise, but she went about the house like a crazy woman. She saw the eyes of Asdis rest on her strangely, and at that she beat the maid. She scolded the housefolk, and by her way of it nothing was done aright. First she was loving to her husband, and made much of him, thinking to be on his good side when trouble came. Then she took a better way, picked a feud with him, and railed on the poor man till his ears rang, so that he might be in the wrong beforehand. The brooch she hid without, in the side of a hayrick, all this while Thorgunna lay in the bed-place which was not her way, for by custom she was early astir. At last she came forth, and there was that in her face that made all the house look one at the other, and the heart of Oud to be straightened. Never a word the guest spoke, not a bite she swallowed, and they saw the strong shudderings take and shake her in her place. Yet a little and still without speech back she went into her bed-place and the door was shut that is a sick wife said finwood her weird has come on her and at that the heart of oud was lifted up with hope all day thorgunna lay on her bed and the next day sent for finwood Finwood Keelfarer, said she, 
My trouble is come upon me, and I am at the end of my days. He made the customary talk. I have had my good things. Now my hour is come, and let suffice, quoth she. I did not send for you to hear your prating. Finwood knew not what to answer, for he saw her soul was dark. I sent for you on needful matters, she began again. I die here, I, in this black house, in a bleak island, far from all decency and proper ways of man, and now my treasure must be left. Small pleasure have I had of it, and leave it with the less, cried she. Good woman, as the saying is, Needs must, says Finwood, for he was nettled with that speech. For that I called you, quoth Thorgunna. In these two chests are much wealth, and things greatly to be desired. I wish my body to be laid in Scalaholt in the new church, where I trust to hear the mass priest singing over my head, so long as time endures. To that church I will you to give what is sufficient, leaving your conscience judge of it. My scarlet cloak with the silver I will to that poor fool your wife. She longed for it so bitterly, I may not even now deny her. Give her the brooch as well. I warn you of her. I was such as she, only wiser. I warn you, the ground she stands upon is water, and whoso trusts her leans on rottenness. I hate her, and I pity her. When she comes to lie where I lie. There she broke off. The rest of my goods I leave to your black-eyed maid, young Asdis, for her slim body and clean mind. Only the things of my bed you shall see burned. It is well, said Finwood. It may be well, quoth she, if you obey. My life has been a wonder to all, and a fear to many. While I lived, none thwarted me and prospered. See to it that none thwart me after I am dead. It stands upon your safety. It stands upon my honour, quoth Finwood, and I have the name of an honourable man. You have the name of a weak one, says Thulgana. Look to it, look to it, Finwood. Your house shall rue it else. The roof-tree of my house is my word, said Finwood. And that is a true saying, says the woman. See to it, then. The speech of Thulguna is ended. With that she turned her face against the wall, and Finwood left her. The same night, in the small hours of the clock, Thorgunna passed. It was a wild night for summer, and the wind sang about the eaves, and clouds covered the moon when the dark woman wended. From that day to this no man has learned her story, or her people's name, but be sure the one was stormy, and the other great. She had come to that isle a waif-woman on a ship. Then she flitted, and no more remained of her but her heavy chests and her big body. In the morning the housewomen streaked and dressed the corpse. Then came Finwood, and carried the sheets and curtains from the house and caused Bill the fire upon the sands. But Oud had an eye on her man's doings. And what is this that you are at, said she? So he told her. 
burn the good sheet, she cried, and where would I be with my two hands? No troth, said Oud, not so long as your wife is above ground. Good wife, said Finwood, this is beyond your province. Here is my word pledged, and the woman dead I pledged it to. So much the more am I bound. Let me be doing as I must, good wife. Tilly Valley, says she, and a fiddlestick's end, good man. You may know well about fishing, and be good at shearing sheep for what I know, but you are little of a judge of damask sheets. And the best word I can say is just this, she says, laying hold of one end of the goods, that if you are made up to burn the plenishing, you must burn your wife along with it. I trust it will not go so hard, says Finwood, and I beg you not to speak so loud, and let the house folk hear you. Let them speak low that are ashamed, cries Oud. I speak only in reason. You are to consider that the woman died in my house, says Finwood, and this was her last behest. In truth, good wife, if I were to fail, it is a thing that would stick long in my throat, and would give us an ill name with the neighbours. And you are to consider, says she, that I am your true wife, and worth all the witches ever burnt, and loving her old husband. Here she put her arms about his neck, and you are to consider that what you wish to do is to destroy fine stuff, such as we have no means of replacing, and that she bade you do it singly to spite me, for I sought to buy this bedding from her while she was alive, at her own price, and that she hated me, because I was young and handsome. That is a true word that she hated you, for she said so herself before she wended, says Finwood so that here is an old faggot that hated me, and she dead as a bucket, says Oud, and here is a young wife that loves you dear, and is alive forby, and at that she kissed him, and the point is, which are you to do the will of? The man's weakness caught him hard, and he faltered. I fear some hurt will come of it, said he. There she cut in, and bade the lads tread out the fire, and the lasses roll the bed-stuff up and carry it within. My dear, says he, my honour, this is against my honour. But she took his arm under hers, and caressed his hand, and kissed his knuckles, and led him down the bay. Bobble, 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 says she, imitating him like a baby though she was none so young bubble bubble and a silly old man we must bury the troll wife and here is trouble enough and a vengeance horses will sweat for it before she comes to scalaholt tis my belief she was a man in a woman's habit and so now have done good man and let us get her waked and buried, which is more than she deserves, or her old duds are like to pay for, and when that is ended, we can consult upon the rest. So Finwood was but too well pleased to put it off. The next day they set forth early for Scalahalt across the heaths. It was heavy weather, and grey overhead, the horses sweated and neighed, and the men went silent, for it was nowhere in their minds that the dead wife was canny. Only Oud talked by the way like a silly seagull piping on a cliff, and the rest held their peace. The sun went down before they were across white water, and the black night fell on them this side of Netherness. At Netherness they beat upon the door, the good man was not a bed nor any of his folk, but sat in the hall talking, and to them Finwood made clear his business. "'I will never deny you a roof,' said the good man of Netherness, "'but I have no food ready, and if you cannot be doing without meat, you must e'en fare farther.' They laid the body in a shed, made fast their horses, and came into the house, and the door was closed again. So there they sat about the lights, and there was little said, 
for there were none so well pleased with their reception. Presently, in the place where the food was kept, began a clattering of dishes, and it fell to a bondman of the house to go and see what made the clatter. He was no sooner gone than he was back again, and told it was a big buxom woman, high in flesh and naked as she was born, setting meats upon a dresser. Finwood grew pale as the dawn. He got to his feet, and the rest rose with him, and all the party of the funeral came to the buttery door. And the dead Thorgana took no heed of their coming, but went on setting forth meats, and seemed to talk with herself as she did so, and she was naked to the buff. Great fear fell upon them, the marrow of their back grew cold. Not one word they spoke, neither good nor bad, but back into the hall and down upon their bended knees and to their prayers. Now in the name of God, what ails you? cried the good man of Netherness. And when they had told him, shame fell upon him for his churlishness. The dead wife reproves me, said the honest man. And he blessed himself and his house, and caused spread the tables, and they all ate of the meats that the dead wife laid out. This was the first walking of Thorgunna, and it is thought by good judges it would have been the last as well, if men had been more wise. The next day they came to Scalaholt, and there was the body buried, and the next after they set out for home. Finwood's heart was heavy and his mind divided. He feared the dead wife and the living. He feared dishonour and he feared dispeace. And his mind was like a seagull in the wind. Now he cleared his throat and made as if to speak. And at that hour cocked her eye and looked at the good man mocking. And his voice died unborn. At the last shame gave him courage. Oud, said he, yon was a most uncanny thing at Netherness. No doubt, said Oud. I have never had it in my mind, said he, that yon woman was the thing she should be. I dare say not, said Oud. I never thought so either. It stands beyond question she was more than canny, says Finwood, shaking his head. No manner of doubt but what she was ancient of mind. She was getting pretty old in body too, says Oud. Wife, says he, it comes in upon me strongly this is no kind of woman to disobey, above all being dead and her walking. I think, wife, we must even do as she commanded. Now what is ever your word, says she, riding up close and setting her hand upon his shoulder? The good wife's pleasure must be done. Is not that my Finwood? The good God knows I grudge you nothing, cried Finwood. But my blood runs cold upon this business. Worse will come of it, he cried. Worse will flow from it. What is this to do, cries Oud? Here is an old brimstone hag that should have been stoned with stones, and hated me besides. Vainly she tried to frighten me when she was living. Shall she frighten me now when she is dead and rotten? I trow not. Think shame to your beard, good man. Now these are man's shoes I see you shaking in, when your wife rides by your bridal hand as bold as nails. Ay, ay, quoth Finwood, but there goes a byword in the country, little wit, little fear. At this hour began to be concerned, for he was usually easier to lead. So now she tried the other method on the man. "'Is that your word?' cried she. "'I kiss the hands of ye. "'If I have not wit enough, I can rid you of my company. "'Wit is it, he seeks,' she cried. 
the old broomstick that we buried yesterday had wit for you. So she rode on ahead, and looked not the road that he was on. Poor Finwood followed on his horse, but the light of the day was gone out, for his wife was like his life to him. He went six miles and was true to his heart, but the seventh was not half through when he rode up to her. "'Is it to be the good wife's pleasure?' she asked. "'Oh, you shall have your way,' says he. "'God grant there come no ill of it.' So she made much of him, and his heart was comforted. When they came to the house, Aud had the two chests to her own bed-place, and gloated all night on what she found. Finwood looked on, and trouble darkened his mind. Wipe, says he at last, you will not forget these things belong to Asdis. At that she barked upon him like a dog. Am I a thief? she cried. The brat shall have them in her turn when she grows up. Would you have me give her them now to turn a minx's head with? So the weak man went his way out of the house in sorrow, and fell to his affairs. Those that wrought with him that day observed that now he would labour and toil like a man furious, and now would sit and stare like one stupid, for in truth he judged the business would end ill. For a while there was no more done, and no more said. Ow cherished her treasures by herself, and none was the wiser except Finwood. Only the cloak she sometimes wore, for that was hers by the will of the dead wife, but the others she let lie, because she knew she had them foully, and she feared Finwood somewhat, and Thorgunna much. At last husband and wife were bound to bed one night, and he was the first stripped and got in. What sheets are these? he screamed as his legs touched them, for these were smooth as water, but the sheets of Iceland were like sacking. Clean sheets, I suppose, says Aud, but her hand quavered as she wound her hair. Woman, cried Finwood, these are the bedsheets of Thorgunna. These are the sheets she died in. Do not lie to me. At that hour turned and looked at him. Well, says she, they have been washed. Finwood lay down again in the bed between Thorgunna's sheets and groaned. Never a word more, he said, for now he knew he was a coward and a man dishonoured. Presently his wife came beside him, and they lay still, but neither slept. It might be twelve in the night, when Aud felt Finwood shudder so strong that the bed shook. "'What ails you?' said she. "'I know not,' he said. "'It is a chill like the chill of death. My soul is sick with it.' His voice fell low. "'It was so Thorgunna sickened,' said he. And he rose and walked in the hall in the dark till it came morning. Early in the morning he went forth to the sea-fishing with four lads. Aud was troubled at heart and watched him from the door, and even as he went down the beach, she saw him shaken with the gunner's shudder. It was a rough day, the sea was wild, the boat laboured exceedingly, and it may be that Finwood's mind was troubled with his sickness. Certain it is that they struck, and their boat was burst upon a scurry under Snowfellness. The four lads were spilled into the sea, and the sea broke and buried them. But Finwood was cast upon the skerry, and clambered up, and sat there all day long, God knows his thoughts. The sun was halfway down, when a shepherd went by on the cliffs about his business, and spied a man in the midst of the breach of the loud seas, upon a pinnacle of reef. He hailed him, and the man turned and hailed again. There was in that cove so great a clashing of the seas, and so shrill a cry of sea-fowl, that the herd might hear the voice and not the words. But the name Thorgunna came to him, and he saw the face of Finwood Keelfarer, like the face of an old man. Lively ran the herd to Finwood's house, 
and when his tale was told there, I hope the boy was lively to out a boat and hasten to his father's aid. By the strength of hands they drove the keel against the seas, and with skill and courage Eyolf won upon the skerry and climbed up. There sat his father dead, and this was the first vengeance of Thorgunna against broken faith. It was a sore job to get the corpse on board, and a sorer yet to bring it home before the rolling seas. But the lad Eyolf was a lad of promise, and the lads that pulled for him were sturdy men. So the Breakfaith's body was got home, and waked, and buried on the hill. Oud was a good widow, and wept much, for she liked Finwood well enough. Yet a bird sang in her ears that now she might marry a young man. Little fear that she might have her choice of them, she thought, with all Thorgunna's fine things, and her heart was cheered. Now, when the corpse was laid in the hill, Asdis came where Oud sat solitary in hall, and stood by her a while without speech. Well, child, says Oud, and again well, and then keep us holy if you have anything to say, out with it. So the maid came so much nearer. Mother, says she, I wish you would not wear these things that were Thorgunna's. Ah, cries Oud, this is what it is. You begin early, brat, and who has been poisoning your mind? Your fool of a father, I suppose. And then she stopped and went all scarlet. Who told you they were yours? she asked again, taking it all the higher for her stumble. When you are grown, then you shall have your share, and not a day before. These things are not for babies. The child looked up at her and was amazed. I do not wish them, she said. I wish they might be burned. Upon my word, what next? cried Oud. And why should they be burned? I know my father tried to burn these things, said Asdis, and he named Thorgunna's name upon the skerry ere he died. And, oh, mother, I doubt they have brought ill luck. But the more Oud was terrified, the more she would make light of it. Then the girl put her hand upon her mother's. I fear they are ill come by, said she. The blood sprang in Oud's face. And who made you a judge upon your mother that bore you, cried she. Kinswoman, said Asdis, looking down, I saw you with the brooch. What do you mean? When? Where did you see me, cried the mother. Here in the hall, said Asdis, looking on the floor the night you stole it. At that Oud let out a cry, then she heaved up her hand to strike the child. You little spy, she cried. Then she covered her face and wept and rocked herself. What can you know, she cried, how can you understand that are a baby not so long weaned? He could, your father could, the dear good man dead and gone. He could understand and pity he was good to me. Now he has left me alone with heartless children. Asda, she cried, have you no nature in your blood? You do not know what I have done and suffered for them. I have done, oh, and I could have done anything. And there is your father dead, and after all you ask me not to use them? No woman in Iceland has the like, and you wish me to destroy them? Not if the dead should rise, she cried. No, no, and she stopped her ears. Not if the dead should rise, and let that end it. So she ran into her bed-place, and clapped at the door, and left the child amazed. But for all Oud spoke with so much passion, it was noticed that for long she left the things unused. Only she would be locked some while daily in her bed-place, where she pored on them, and secretly wore them for her pleasure. Now winter was at hand, the days grew short, and the nights long, and under the golden face of morning the isle would stand silver with frost. Word came from Hodifell to Frodis Water of a company of young men upon a journey, 
That night they supped at Holy Fell, the next it would be at Frodis Water, and Alf of the Fells was there, and Thong Brand Kettleson, and Hall the Fair. Oud went early to her bed-place, and there she poured upon these fineries till her heart was melted with self-love. There was a kirtle of a mingled colour, and the blue shot into the green, and the green lightened from the blue, as the colours play in the ocean between deeps and shallows. She thought she could endure to live no longer and not wear it. There was a bracelet of an L long, wrought like a serpent, and with fiery jewels for the eyes. She saw it shine on her white arm, and her head grew dizzy with desire. Ah, she thought, never were fine lendings better met with a fair wearer. And she closed her eyelids, and she thought she saw herself among the company, and the men's eyes go after her admiring. With that she considered that she must soon marry one of them, and wondered which, and she thought Alf was perhaps the best or all the fair, but was not certain. And then she remembered Finwood Keelfarer in his can upon the hill, and was concerned. Well, he was a good husband to me, she thought, and I was a good wife to him, but that is an old song now. So she turned again to handling the stuffs and jewels. At last she got to bed in the smooth sheets and lay, and fancied how she would look, and admired herself, and saw others admire her, and told herself stories, till her heart grew warm, and she chuckled to herself between the sheets. So she shook a while with laughter, and then the mirth abated, but not the shaking, and a grew to cold upon her flesh, and the cold of the grave upon her belly, and the terror of death upon her soul. With that a voice was in her ears, it was so Thorgunna sickened. Thrice in the night the chill and the terror took her, and thrice it passed away, and when she rose on the morrow, death had breathed upon her countenance. She saw the housefolk, and her children gaze upon her well she knew why she knew her day was come and the last of her days and her last hour was at her back and it was so in her soul that she scarce minded all was lost all was past mending she would carry on until she fell so she went as usual and hurried the feast for the young man and railed upon her housefolk but her feet stumbled and her voice was strange in her own ears, and the eyes of the folk fled before her. At times, too, the chill took her, and the fear along with it, and she must sit down, and the teeth beat together in her head, and the stool tottered on the floor. At these times she thought she was passing, and the voice of Thorgunna sounded in her ear. The things are for no use but to be shown, it said. Oud, Oud, have you shown them once? No, not once. And at the sting of the thought, her courage and strength would revive, and she would rise again and move about her business. Now the hour drew near, and Oud went to her bed-place, and did on the bravest of her finery, and came forth to greet her guests. Was never woman in Iceland robed as she was? The words of greeting were yet between her lips, when the shuddering fell upon her strongest labour, and a horror as deep as hell. Her face was changed amidst her finery, and the faces of her guests were changed, as they beheld her. Fear puckered their brows, fear drew back their feet, and she took her doom from the looks of them, and fled to her bed-place. There she flung herself on the wife's coverlet, and turned her face against the wall. That was the end of all the words of Oud, 
and in the small hours on the clock her spirit wended. Astis had come to and fro, seeing if she might help where was no help possible of man or woman. It was light in the bed-place when the maid returned, for a taper stood upon a chest. There lay Oud in her fine clothes, and there by her side on the bed the big dead wife Thorgunna squatted on her hams. No sound was heard, but it seemed by the movement of her mouth as if Thorgunna sang, and she waved her arms as if to singing. "'God be good to us!' cried Astor. "'She is dead!' "'Dead!' said the dead wife. "'Is the weird past?' cried Asdis. "'When the sin is done, the weird is dreed,' said Thorgunna, and with that she was not. But the next day Eyolf and Asdis caused build a fire on the shore betwixt tide marks. There they burned the bedclothes and the clothes and the jewels and the very boards of the waif woman's chests, and when the tide returned it washed away their ashes. So the weird of Thorgunna was lifted from the house on Frodish water. End of the Waif Woman by Robert Louis Stevenson The Bishop by Anton Chekhov This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The evening service was being celebrated on the eve of Palm Sunday in the old Petrushevsky convent. When they began distributing the palm it was close upon ten o'clock. The candles were burning dimly, the wicks wanted snuffing. It was all in a sort of mist. In the twilight of the church the crowd seemed heaving like the sea, and to Bishop Pyotr, who had been unwell for the last three days, it seemed that all the faces, old and young, men's and women's, were alike, and that everyone who came up to the palm had the same expression in his eyes. In the mist he could not see the doors. The crowd kept moving and looked as though there were no end to it. The female choir was singing. A nun was reading the prayer for the day. How stifling, how hot it was, how long the service went on. Bishop Pyotr was tired. His breath was labored and rapid. His throat was parched. His shoulders ached with weariness. His legs were trembling. And it disturbed him unpleasantly when a religious maniac uttered occasional shrieks in the gallery. And then all of a sudden, as though in a dream or a delirium, it seemed to the bishop as though his own mother, Marcia Timofeyevna, whom he had not seen for nine years, or some old woman just like his mother, came to him out of the crowd, and after taking a palm branch from him, walked away looking at him all the while good-humouredly with a kind, joyful smile until she was lost in the crowd. And for some reason tears flowed down his face. There was peace in his heart, everything was well, yet he kept gazing fixedly toward the left choir, where the prayers were being read where in the dusk of evening you could not recognize anyone, and wept. Tears glistened on his face and on his beard. Here someone close at hand was weeping, and then someone else far away, then others and still others, and little by little the church was filled with soft weeping. And a little later, within five minutes, the nun's choir was singing. No one was weeping, and everything was as before. Soon the service was over. When the bishop got into his carriage to drive home, the gay melodious chime of the heavy, costly bells was filling the whole garden in the moonlight. The white walls, the white crosses on the tombs, the white birch trees and the black shadows, and the faraway moon in the sky exactly over the convent, seemed now living their own life, apart and incomprehensible, yet very near to man. It was the beginning of April, and after the warm spring day it turned cool. There was a faint touch of frost, and the breath of spring could be felt in the soft, chilly air. The road from the convent to the town was sandy, the horses had to go at a walking pace, and on both sides of the carriage, in the brilliant peaceful moonlight, there were people trudging along home from the church through the sand. And all was silent, sunk in thought, everything seemed kindly, youthful, akin, everything, tree and skies and even the moon, and one longed to think that so it would be always. 
At last the carriage drove into the town and rumbled along the principal street. The shops were already shut, but at Arakin's, the millionaire shopkeepers, they were trying the new electric lights, which flickered brightly, and a crowd of people were gathered round. Then came dark deserted streets, one after another, then the high road, the open country, the fragrance of pines. And suddenly there rose up before the bishop's eyes a white turreted wall, and behind that a tall belfry in the full moonlight, and beside it five shining golden cupolas. This was the Pankratevsky Monastery in which Bishop Pyotr lived. And here too, high above the monastery, was the silent dreamy moon. The carriage drove in at the gate, crunching over the sand. Here and there in the moonlight there were glimpses of dark monastic figures, and there was a sound of footsteps in the flagstones. You know, Your Holiness, your mamma arrived while you were away, the lay brother informed the bishop as he walked into his cell. My mother? When did she come? Before the evening services. She asked first where you were, and then she went to the convent. Then it was her I saw in the church just now. Oh, Lord! And the bishop laughed with joy. She bade me tell Your Holiness, the lay brother went on, that she would come tomorrow. She had a little girl with her, her grandchild, I suppose. They are staying at Osyanikov's inn. What time is it now? A little after eleven. Oh, how vexing. The bishop sat a little while in the parlor, hesitating and as it were refusing to believe that it was so late. His arms and legs were stiff, his head ached, he was hot and uncomfortable. After resting a little he went into his bedroom, and there too he sat a little, still thinking about his mother. He could hear the lay brother going away, and Father Sisoy coughing on the other side of the wall. The monastery clock struck a quarter. The bishop changed his clothes and began reading the prayers before sleep. He read attentively those old, long familiar prayers, and at the same time thought about his mother. She had nine children and about forty grandchildren. At one time she had lived with her husband, the deacon, in a poor village. She had lived there a very long time, from the age of seventeen to sixty. The bishop remembered her from early childhood, almost from the age of three, and how he had loved her. Sweet, precious childhood, always fondly remembered. Why did it, that long past time, that could never return, why did it seem brighter, fuller, and more festive than it really had been? When in his childhood or youth he had been ill, how tender and sympathetic his mother had been! And now his prayers mingled with the memories, which gleamed more and more brightly like a flame, and the prayers did not hinder his thinking of his mother. When he had finished his prayers, he undressed and laid down, and at once, as soon as it was dark, there rose before his mind his dead father, his mother, his native village, Le Sompoli, the creak of wheels, the bleat of sheep, the church bells on bright summer mornings, the gypsies under the window. Oh, how sweet to think of it! He remembered the priest of Lesopoli, Father Simeon, mild, gentle, kindly. He was a lean little man, while his son, a divinity student, was a huge fellow and talked in a roaring bass voice. The priest's son had flown into a rage with the cook and abused her. Ah, you Jehud's ass! And Father Simeon, overhearing it, said not a word, and was only ashamed because he could not remember where such an ass was mentioned in the Bible. After him, the priest at Lesopoli had been Father Demyan, who used to drink heavily, and at times drank until he saw green snakes, and was even nicknamed Demyan Snakeseer. The schoolmaster at Lesopoli was Matvey Nikolaevich, who had been a divinity student, a kind and intelligent man, but he too was a drunkard. He never beat the school children, but for some reason he always had hanging on his wall a bunch of birch twigs, and below it an utterly meaningless inscription in Latin. Betula Kinterbalsamica Sekuta. He had a shaggy black dog whom he called Syntax. And His Holiness laughed. Six miles from Lesopoli was the village up Nino, with a wonder-working icon. In the summer they used to carry the icon in procession about the neighborhood villages, and ring the bells the whole day long, first in one village, then in another, and it used to seem to the bishop that joy was quivering in the air, and that he, in those days his name was Pavlusha, used to follow the icon, bareheaded and barefooted, with naive faith and with a naive smile, infinitely happy. In Omnino, he remembered now, there were always a lot of people, and the priest there, Father Alexei, to save time during Mass, used to make his deaf nephew Alarion read the name of those for whose health or for whose souls is peace prayers were asked. Alarion used to read them, now and then getting a five or ten kopeck piece for the service, and only when he was gray and bald, when life was nearly over, he suddenly saw written on one of the pieces of paper, What a fool you are, Alarion. Up to fifteen at least, Pavlusha was undeveloped and idle at his lessons, so much so that they thought of taking him away from the clerical school and putting him into a shop. One day, going to the post at Obina for letters, 
He had stared a long time at the post office clerks and asked, Allow me to ask, how do you get your salary, every month or every day? His holiness crossed himself and turned over to the other side, trying to stop thinking and go to sleep. My mother has come, he remembered, and laughed. The moon peeped in at the window, the floor was lighted up, and there were shadows on it. A cricket was chirping. Through the wall, Father Sisoy was snoring in the next room, and his aged snore had, had a sound that suggested loneliness, forlornness, and even vagrancy. Sisoy had once been the housekeeper to the bishop of the diocese, and was now called the former father housekeeper. He was seventy years old. He lived in the monastery twelve miles from the town and stayed sometimes in the town too. He had come from the Pankrachevsky monastery three days before, and the bishop had kept him that he might talk to him at his leisure about matters of business, about the arrangements here. At half past one they began ringing for matins. Father Sisoy could be heard coughing, muttering something in a discontented voice. Then he got up and walked barefoot about the rooms. Father Sisoy, the bishop called. Sisoy went back to his room and a little later made his appearance in his boots with a candle. He had on his cassock over his underclothes, and on his head was an old faded skull cap. I can't sleep, said the bishop, sitting up. I must be unwell. And what it is, I don't know. Fever. You must have caught a cold, your holiness. You must be rubbed with tallow. Sisoy stood a little and yawned. Oh, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. They had the electric lights on at Erikin's today, he said. I don't like it. Father Sisoy was old, lean, bent, always dissatisfied with something, and his eyes were angry-looking and prominent as a crab's. I don't like it, he said, going away. I don't like it. Bother it. Next day, Palm Sunday, the bishop took the service in the cathedral in town, and then he visited the bishop of the diocese, then visited a very sick old lady, the widow of a general, and at last drove home. Between one and two o'clock he had welcomed visitors dining with him, his mother and his niece Katya, a child of eight years old. At dinner time the spring sunshine was streaming in at, at the windows, throwing bright lights over the white tablecloth and on Katya's red hair. Through the double windows they could hear the noise of the rooks and the notes of the starlings in the garden. It is nine years since we have met, said the old lady, and when I looked at you in the monastery yesterday, good Lord, you've not changed a bit except maybe you are thinner and your beard is a little longer. Holy Mother, Queen of Heaven, yesterday at the evening service no one could help crying. I too, as I looked at you, suddenly began crying, though I couldn't say why. His holy will. And in spite of the affectionate tone in which she had said this, he could see that she was constrained as though she was uncertain whether to address him formally or familiarly, to laugh or not, and then she felt herself more a deacon's widow than his mother. And Katya gazed without blinking at her uncle, his holiness, as though trying to discover what sort of person he was. Her hair sprang up from under the comb and the velvet ribbon and stood out like a halo. She had a turned-up nose and sly eyes. The child had broken a glass before sitting down to dinner, and now her grandmother, as she talked, moved away from Katya, first a wine glass and then a tumbler. The bishop listened to his mother and remembered how many, many years ago she used to take him and his brothers and sisters to relations whom she considered rich. In those days she was taken up with the case of her children, now with her grandchildren, and she had brought Katya. Your sister Varenka has four children, she told him. Katya here is the eldest, and your brother-in-law, Father Ivan, felt sick, God knows of what, and died three days before the Assumption, and my poor Varenka is left a beggar. And how is Nikanor getting on? the bishop asked about his eldest brother. He is all right, thank God. Though he has nothing much, yet he can live. Only there is one thing. His son, my grandson Nikolashka, did not want to go to church. He has gone to university to be a doctor. He thinks that is better, but who knows? His holy will. Nikolashka cuts up dead people, said Katya, spilling water over her knees. Sit still, child, her mother observed calmly and took the glass out of her hand. Say a prayer and go on eating. How long it is since we have seen each other, said the bishop, and he tenderly stroked his mother's hand and shoulder. And I missed you abroad, mother. I miss you dreadfully. Thank you. I used to sit in the evenings at the open window, lonely and alone. Often there was music playing, and all at once I used to become overcome with homesickness and felt as though I would give everything only to be home and see you. His mother smiled, beamed, but at once she made a grave face and said, Thank you. His mood suddenly changed. He looked at his mother and could not understand how she could come by that respectfulness, that timid expression of face. What was it for? And he did not recognize her. He felt sad and vexed and then his head ached just as it had the day before. His legs felt fearfully tired, 
The fish seemed to him stale and tasteless. He felt thirsty all the time. After dinner, two rich ladies, landowners, arrived and sat for an hour and a half in silence with rigid countenances. The archimandrite, a silent, rather deaf man, came to see him about business. Then they began ringing for vespers. The sun was setting behind the wood, and the day was over. When he returned from church, he hurriedly said his prayers, got into bed, and wrapped himself up as warmly as possible. It was disagreeable to remember the fish he had eaten at dinner. The moonlight worried him, and then he heard talking. In the adjourning room, probably in the parlor, Father Sisoy was talking politics. There's a war among the Japanese now. They're fighting. The Japanese, my good soul, are the same as the Montenegrins. They are the same race. They were under the Turkish yoke together. And then he heard the voice of Marcia Timofievna. So having said our prayers and drunk tea, we went, you know, to Father Yeager at Novoknoi, so. And she kept on saying, having had tea, or having drunk tea, and it seemed as though the only thing she had done in her life was to drink tea. The bishop slowly, languidly recalled the seminary, the academy. For three years he had been Greek teacher in the seminary. By that time he could not read without spectacles. Then he had become a monk. He had been made a school inspector. Then he had defended his thesis for his degree. When he was thirty-two he had made rector of the seminary, and consecrated Archimandrite. And then his life had been so easy, so pleasant. It seemed so long, so long, no end was in sight. Then he had begun to be ill, had grown very thin and almost blind, and by advice of the doctors had to give up everything and go abroad. And what then? asked the soy in the next room. Then we drank tea, answered Marcia Timofievna. Good gracious, you've got a green beard, said Katya suddenly in surprise, and she laughed. The bishop remembered that the gray-haired Father Sisoy's beard really had a shade of green in it, and he laughed. God have mercy upon us, what we have to put up with with this girl, said Sisoy aloud, getting angry. Spoiled child, sit quiet. The bishop remembered the perfectly new white church in which he had conducted the services while living abroad. He remembered the sound of the warm sea. In his flat he had five lofty light rooms. In his study he had a new writing table, lots of books. He had read a great deal and often written, and he had remembered how he pined for his native land, how a blind beggar woman had played the guitar under his window every day and had sung of love, and how, as he listened, he had always for some reason thought of the past. But eight years had passed and he had been called back to Russia, and now he was a suffragan bishop, and all the past had retreated far away into the mist as though it were a dream. Father Sisoy came into the bedroom with a candle. I say, he said, wondering, are you asleep already, your holiness? What is it? Why, it's still early, ten o'clock or less. I bought a candle today. I wanted to rub you with tallow. I am in a fever, said the bishop, and he sat up. I really ought to have something. My head is bad. Sisoy took off the bishop's shirt and began rubbing his chest and back with tallow. That's the way, that's the way, he said. Lord Jesus Christ, that's the way. I walked to the town today. I was at what's-his-name's, the chief priest Sidonsky's. I had tea with him. I don't like him. Lord Jesus Christ, that's the way. I don't like him. The bishop of the diocese, a very fat old man, was ill with rheumatism or gout and had been in bed for over a month. Bishop Pyotr went to see him almost every day and saw all who came to ask his help. And now that he was unwell, he was struck by the emptiness, the triviality of everything which they asked and for which they wept. He was vexed at their ignorance, their timidity, and all this useless petty business oppressed him by the mass of it, and it seemed to him that now he understood the diocesan bishop, who had once in his young days written on the doctrines of the freedom of the will, and now seemed to be all lost in trivialities, to have forgotten everything, and to have no thoughts of religion. The bishop must have lost touch with Russian life while he was abroad. He did not find it easy. The peasants seemed to him coarse, the women who sought his help dull and stupid, the seminarists and their teachers uncultivated and at times savage and the documents coming in and going out were reckoned by tens of thousands, and what documents they were. The higher clergy in the whole diocese gave the priests, young and old, and even their wives and children, marks for their behavior, a five, a four, and sometimes even a three. And about this he had to talk and to read and to write serious reports. And there was positively not one minute to spare. His soul was troubled all day long, and the bishop was only at peace when he was at church. He could not get used, either, to the awe which, through no wish of his own, he inspired in people in spite of his quiet, modest disposition. All the people in the province seemed to him little, scared, and guilty when he looked at them. Everyone was timid in his presence, even the old chief priests, everyone flopped at his feet. 
and not long previously an old lady, a village priest's wife, who had come to consult him, was so overcome by awe that she could not utter a single word, and went empty away. And he, who could never in his sermons bring himself to speak ill of people, never reproached any one because he was sorry for them, was moved to fury by the people who came to consult him, lost his temper, and flung their petitions on the floor. The whole time he had been here, not one person had spoken to him genuinely, simply, as to a human being. Even his old mother seemed now not the same. And why, he wondered, did she chatter away to Sisoy and laugh so much, while with him, her son, she was grave and usually silent and constrained, which did not suit her at all. The only person who behaved freely with him and said what he meant was old Sisoy, who had spent his whole life in the presence of bishops and had outlived eleven of them. And so the bishop was at ease with him, although, of course, he was a tedious and nonsensical man. After the service on Tuesday, His Holiness Piotr was in the diocesan bishop's house receiving petitions there. He got excited and angry and then drove home. He was as unwell as before. He longed to be in bed, but he had hardly reached home when he was informed that a young merchant called Erikin, who had subscribed liberally to charities, had come to see him about a very important matter. The bishop had to see him. Erikin stayed about an hour, talked very loud, almost shouted, and it was difficult to understand what he said. God grant it may, he said as he went out, most essential, according to circumstances, your holiness, I trust it may. After him came the mother superior from a distant convent, and when she had gone they began ringing for vespers. He had to go to church. In the evening the monks sang harmoniously with inspiration. A young priest with a black beard conducted the service, and the bishop, hearing of the bridegroom who comes at midnight and of the heavenly mansion adorned for the festival, felt no repentance for his sins, no tribulation, but peace at heart and tranquility. And he was carried back in thought to the distant past, to his childhood and youth, when too they used to sing of the bridegroom of the heavenly mansion. And now that past rose up before him, living fair and joyful as in all likelihood it had never been. And perhaps in the other world, in the life to come, we shall think of the distant past, of our life here, with the same feeling. Who knows? The bishop was sitting near the altar. It was dark. Tears flowed down his face. He thought that here he had attained everything a man in his position could attain. He had faith, and yet everything was not clear. Something was lacking still. He did not want to die, and he felt that he had missed what was most important, something of which he had dimly dreamed in the past. And he was troubled by the same hopes for the future as he had felt in childhood at the academy and abroad. How well they sing today, he thought, listening to the singing. How nice it is. On Thursday he celebrated Mass in the cathedral. It was the washing of feet. When the service was over and the people were going home, it was sunny, warm. The water gurgled in the gutters, and the unceasing trilling of the larks, tender, telling of peace, rose from the fields outside the town. The trees were already awakening and smiling a welcome, while above them the infinite, fathomless blue sky stretched into the distance, God knows whither. On reaching home, His Holiness drank some tea, then changed his clothes, lay down in his bed, and told the lay brother to close the shutters on the window. The bed was darkened. But what weariness, what pain in his legs and his back, a chill, heavy pain, what a noise in his ears. He had not slept for a long time, for a very long time, as it seemed to him now, and some trifling detail which haunted his brain as soon as his eyes were closed prevented him from sleeping. As on the day before, sounds reached him from the adjourning rooms through the walls, voices, the jingle of glasses and teaspoons. Marcia Timofeyevna was gaily telling Father Sosoy some story with quaint turns of speech, while the latter answered in a grumpy, ill-humored voice, Bother them! Not likely! What next? And the bishop again felt vexed, and then hurt that with other people his own mother behaved in a simple, ordinary way, while with him, her son, she was shy, spoke little, and did not say what she meant, and even, as he fancied, had during all the three days kept trying in his presence to find an excuse for standing up because she was embarrassed at sitting before him. And his father? He too probably, if he had been living, would not have been able to utter a word in the bishop's presence. Something fell down on the floor in the adjourning room and was broken. Katya must have dropped a cup or a saucer, for Father Sosoy suddenly spat and said angrily, What a regular nuisance that child is! Lord, forgive my transgressions. One can't provide enough for her. Then all was quiet. The only sounds came from outside. And when the bishop opened his eyes, he saw Katya in his room, standing motionless, staring at him. Her red hair, as usual, stood up from under the comb like a halo. "'Is that you, Katya?' he asked. "'Who is it downstairs who keeps opening and shutting a door?' 
I don't hear it, answered Katya, and she listened. There, someone has just passed by. But that was a noise in your stomach, uncle. He laughed and stroked her on the head. So you say Cousin Nikolishka cuts up dead people, he said after a pause. Yes, he's studying. And is he kind? Oh, yes, he's kind. But he drinks vodka awfully. And what was it your father died of? Papa was weak and very, very thin, and all at once his throat was bad. I was ill then, too, and Brother Fedya. We all had bad throats. Papa died, uncle, and we got well. Her chin began quivering, and tears gleamed in her eyes and trickled down her cheeks. Your Holiness, she said in a shrill voice, by now weeping bitterly, Uncle, mother, and all of us are left very wretched. Give us a little money. Do be kind, uncle darling. He too was moved to tears, and for a long time was too much touched to speak. Then he stroked her on the head, patted her on the shoulder, and said, Very good, very good, my child. When the holy Easter comes, we will talk it over. I will help you. I will help you. His mother came in quietly, timidly, and prayed before the icon. Noticing that he was not sleeping, she said, Won't you have a drop of soup? No, thank you, he answered. I am not hungry. You seem to be unwell now that I look at you. I should think so. You may well be ill. The whole day on your legs, the whole day. And my goodness, it makes one's heart ache even to look at you. Well, Easter's not far off. You will rest then, please, God. Then we will have a talk, too. But now I'm not going to disturb you with my chatter. Come along, Katya. Let his holiness sleep a little. And he remembered how once, very long ago, when he was a boy, she had spoken exactly like that in the same jestingly respectful tone, with a church dignitary. Only from her extraordinary kind eyes and the timid, anxious glance she stole at him as she went out of the room, one could have guessed that this was his mother. He shut his eyes and seemed to sleep, but twice heard the clock strike and Father Sisoy coughing the other side of the wall. And once more his mother came in and looked timidly at him for a minute. Someone drove up to the steps, as he could hear, in a coach or in a chassis. Suddenly a knock. The door slammed, the lay brother came into the bedroom. Your Holiness, he called. Well? The horses are here, it's time for the evening service. What o'clock is it? A quarter past seven. He dressed and drove to the cathedral. During all the twelve gospels he had to stand in the middle of the church without moving, and the first gospel, the longest and the most beautiful, he read himself. A mood of confidence and courage came over him. That first gospel, now as the Son of Man glorified, he knew by heart and as he read he raised his eyes from time to time, and saw on both sides a perfect sea of lights and heard the sputter of candles. But as in past years he could not see the people, and it seemed as though these were all the same people as had been round him in those days, in his childhood and in his youth, that they would always be the same every year till such a time as God only knew. His father had been a deacon, his grandfather a priest, his great-grandfather a deacon, and his whole family, perhaps from the days when Christianity had been accepted in Russia, had belonged to the priesthood, and his love for the church services, for the priesthood, for the peal of bells, was deep in him, ineradicable, innate. In church, particularly when he took part in the service, he felt vigorous, of good cheer, happy. So it was now. Only when the eighth gospel had been read, he felt that his voice had grown weak, even his cough was inaudible. His head had begun to ache intensely, and he was troubled by a fear that he might fall down. And his legs were indeed quite numb, so by degrees he ceased to feel them, and could not understand how or on what he was standing, and why he did not fall. It was quarter to twelve when the service was over. When he reached home, the bishop undressed and went to bed at once without even saying his prayers. He could not speak, and felt that he could not have stood up. When he had covered his head with the quilt, he felt a sudden longing to be abroad, an insufferable longing. He felt that he would give his life not to see those pitiful cheap shutters, those low ceilings, not to smell that heavy monastery smell. If only there was one person to whom he could have talked, have opened his heart. For a long while he heard footsteps in the next room, and could not tell whose they were. At last the door opened, and Sisoy came in with a candle and the teacup in his hand. "'You're in bed already, Your Holiness,' he asked. "'Here I have come to rub you with spirit and vinegar. A thorough rubbing does a great deal of good. Lord Jesus Christ, that's the way, that's the way. I've just been in our monastery. I don't like it. I'm going away from here tomorrow, Your Holiness. I don't want to stay longer. Lord Jesus Christ, that's the way. Sisoy could not stay long in the same place, and he felt as though he had been a whole year in the Petrachevsky Monastery. Above all, listening to him, it was difficult to understand where his home was, whether he cared for anyone or anything, whether he believed in God. 
He did not know himself why he was a monk, and indeed he did not think about it. And the time when he had become a monk had long passed out of his memory. It seemed as though he had been born a monk. I'm going away tomorrow. God be with them all. I should like to talk to you. I can't find the time, said the bishop softly with an effort. I don't know anything or anyone here. I'll stay till Sunday if you like, so be it, but I don't want to stay longer. I am sick of them. I ought not to be a bishop, said the bishop softly. I ought to have been a village priest, a deacon, or simply a monk. All this oppresses me, oppresses me. What? Lord Jesus Christ, that's the way. Come, sleep well, your holiness. What's the good of talking? It's no use. Good night. The bishop did not sleep all night. At eight o'clock in the morning he began to have a hemorrhage from the bowels. The lay brother was alarmed and ran first to the archimandrake, then to the monastery doctor, Ivan Andreich, who lived in the town. The doctor, a stout old man with a long gray beard, made a prolonged examination of the bishop and kept shaking his head and frowning, then said, Do you know, your holiness, you have got typhoid? After an hour or so of hemorrhage, the bishop looked much thinner, paler, and wasted. His face looked wrinkled, his eyes looked bigger, and he seemed older, shorter, and it seemed to him that he was thinner, weaker, more insignificant than anyone. That anything that had been had retreated far, far away and would never go on again or be repeated. How good, he thought. How good. His old mother came. Seeing his wrinkled face and his big eyes, she was frightened. She fell on her knees by the bed and began kissing his face, his shoulders, his hands. And to her, too, it seemed that he was thinner, weaker, and more insignificant than anyone, and now she forgot that he was a bishop, and kissed him as though he were a child, very near and very dear to her. Pavlusha, darling, she said, my own darling son, why are you like this? Pavlusha, answer me. Katya, pale and severe, stood beside her, unable to understand what was the matter with her uncle, why there was such a look of suffering on her grandmother's face, why she was saying such sad and touching things. By now he could not utter a word. He could understand nothing, and he imagined that he was a simple, ordinary man, that he was walking quickly, cheerfully through the fields, tapping with his stick, while above him was an open sky bathed in sunlight, and he was free now as a bird, and could go where he liked. Pavlusha, my darling son, answer me, the old woman was saying. What is it? My own. Do not disturb his holiness, Sisoy said angrily, walking about the room. Let him sleep. What's the use? It's no good. Three doctors arrived, consulted together, and went away again. The day was long, incredibly long, and then night came on and passed slowly, slowly, and towards the morning on Saturday, the lay brother went into the old mother who was lying on the sofa in the parlor and asked her to go into the bedroom. The bishop had just breathed his last. Next day was Easter Sunday. There were forty-two churches and six monasteries in the town. The sonorous, joyful clang of the bells hung over the town from the morning till the night unceasingly, setting the spring air a-quiver. The birds were singing and the sun was shining brightly. The big market square was noisy, swings were going, barrel organs were playing, accordions were squeaking, drunk voices were shouting. After midday, people began driving up and down the principal street. In short, all was merriment, and everything was satisfactory, just as it had been the year before, and as it will be in all likelihood next year. A month later, a new suffragan bishop was appointed, and no one thought any more of Bishop Pyotr, and afterwards he was completely forgotten. And only the dead man's old mother who is living today with her son-in-law the deacon in a remote little district town, when she goes out at night to bring her cow in, and meets other women at the pasture, begins talking of her children and her grandchildren, and says that she had a son a bishop, and this she says timidly, afraid that she might not be believed. And indeed, there are some who do not believe her. End of The Bishop by Anton Chekhov